gotta catch them all, and subsequently, you gotta watch them all. It's time for some Pokemon videos, don't you think? And what better way to get in the Pokemon mood than the legendary Pokemon rap? Electro, Diglett, Nidoran, Mankey, Venusaur, Rattata, Fearow, Pidgey, Sea King, Jolteon, Dragonite, Ghastly, Ponyta, Vaporeon, Poliwrath, Butterfree! Welcome back to Channel Frederator. I'm Keegan and I've got a big PC box full of Pokemon and Pokemon themed videos for you today. Quick, before Team Rocket notices, let's get started. First things first, let's talk about evolution. No, not like Pokemon evolution. Well, actually, sort of like Pokemon evolution. Gosh, this is confusing. I want to talk about the evolution of Pokemon, like as a series, not as like from stage to stage. Okay, time for the evolution of Pokemon. Cue that evolution music. If you haven't heard of Pokemon, welcome to the year 2017. We hope your last 20 in the underground bunker were pleasant. If you're one of the nearly 300 million people who have played a Pokemon game, chances are you've watched the show. Although if you stopped watching after Generation 1, things might look a little bit different these days. But it's okay, because you're in good hands. To find the differences between Pokemon then and Pokemon now is my real test, and to educate you is my cause. So let's get started. <laughs> Reboot Criticisms Essentially, every new series is somewhat of a soft reboot. Ash tends to leave the friends and Pokemon of the prior region behind, except Pikachu of course, and start all over in the new region. That's why you don't see him traveling with Brock and Misty anymore. Every now and then, old friends show up and hang with Ash for a little, but just as soon as the nostalgia kicks in, they're on their merry way. With each soft reboot of the show over the years, fan criticism seemed to rise. Thematically, it makes sense since Ash is in a new region and doesn't know the Pokemon of said region, but it was still frustrating for fans to see someone who qualified and competed in the Pokemon League struggle with his first gym battle in the new region. Especially when you consider that Pikachu is probably level 9000 by now. The overall episode quality reached an all-time low in season 13, but ever since then, the quality has been trending upward. The average episode review for the newest season is almost back on par with the first season. The latest season of the anime, the Sun and Moon series, is serving as a much bigger reboot of the show, and for good reason. The Sun and Moon games reinvented the Pokemon franchise with big changes, so the anime followed suit. The new style has been fairly polarizing, but we'll get into that later. Fanbase. With the quality of the show on the rise again, the size of the fanbase is also increasing. Network data shows that nearly double the amount of households in Japan are watching the show in Season 20 than in Season 19. The obvious answer here is the same answer for all the great tunes of the 90s. Kids who grew up watching and playing Pokemon are now at the age where many of them are having kids of their own, and if they aren't already, those kids will be watching the Pokemon anime. Older fans of the show have expressed frustration with Ash's constant losing, which is fair. For a kid who wants to be the very best, he surely is taking his time. It reached a peak in the summer of 2016 when it felt like Ash was finally going to win his first ever Pokemon League Championship title, only to lose a favorable matchup. But older fans have to remember that Pokemon is a show for kids, and realistically speaking, whenever Ash finally does win a league, that'll probably be the end of the show. And I don't know about you, but I can suffer the defeatist journey if it means more Pokemon. Character Designs and Style Fundamentally, the designs of the characters haven't strayed too far from the early days. With each passing region, Ash gets a new outfit, but they were always relatively the same. A slight varied jacket and hoodie, jeans, and gloves. In the current season, Ash wears a t-shirt and shorts with no gloves. Which makes sense, you probably wouldn't wear a jacket, gloves, and jeans in Hawaii, unless you were looking to sweat every day. The most notable design difference is that Pikachu has lost a ton of weight. Okay, realistically, he's a mouse, so it's probably like 3 to 4 pounds, but dang, he's looking fit these days. That's what 20 years of battling will do for you. Style-wise, the show has moved in a drastically different direction, with a complete style overhaul. Gone are the rigid, sharp, and angular lines of the olden days, as Ash and the gang now have softer and more more fluid features. The Switch has been polarizing among fans, with some claiming that Ash looks far too young, while others think it has a Studio Ghibli feel to it. One thing that's for sure is that the new style has led to much more expressive faces from Ash and company. Although the style has changed quite a bit, the design really hasn't. What I mean to say here is that when you look at Ash Ketchum, he still has all the things that make him Ash. A baseball cap, that pointy black hair, and Pikachu by his side. Ready? Let's play a game. Who's that Pokemon trainer? It's Ash! You see here that even though his clothes are different and the style has changed, you still knew it was Ash. Voice actors. Just make a note that this is only going to cover the English voice actors, so I'm sorry sub fans. Even though Ash still hasn't gone through puberty, his voice might sound a little different if you haven't heard him in 20 years. Don't worry though, you're not going crazy. Ash sounds different because Ash's voice is different. In the early days of the anime, Ash was voiced by Veronica Taylor. Taylor's voice acting work includes roles in One Piece, Yu-Gi-Oh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Tekken, and many 
many more. Taylor voiced Ash in the English dub of the show from the very first episode way back in 1997 up until 2005's episode 419, Pasta La Vista. Technically speaking, in the US, I believe this was only 414 since various episodes had been cut or unaired here, so I'm not so sure what number we should go with. The very next episode, Fear Factory Phony, marked the start of Sarah Natasheni's career as Ash Ketchum. Since then, for the past 12 plus years, Natasheni has been the voice of Ash with no signs of slowing down. For some of the older fans, it may be hard to believe, but Natasheni has been Ash's voice for longer than Taylor was. If you want to feel even older, think about it this way. A whole generation of kids have now grown up exclusively hearing Natasheni as Ash's voice. I feel old. Like, really old. Tone. The Kanto series of Pokemon had a pretty straightforward premise. Ash was going to be the very best like no one ever was. He was going to catch a whole bunch of Pokemon and win the Kanto Pokemon League. There was very little time for dilly-dallying, and each episode was used to propel his journey forward. Sure, there were some episodes that gave us character building moments, but these side plots almost always happened while Ash and the gang were on their way to another city. There were plenty of jokes peppered in throughout the episodes, but the show felt like it was built around catching and battling Pokemon. I mean, it was the tagline of the show, gotta catch them all, and Ash's last name is even a play on Ketchum. On top of that, the show also used to have a somewhat educational feel to it. In the States, the show originally came out before the games did, so the show was our introduction to Pokemon. Whenever Ash saw a new Mon, he whipped out his Pokedex and we learned about a new creature with him. It worked early on, but as the seasons progressed and the games started to come out before the anime, taking time out to explain Pokemon that you already knew about but Ash didn't started to feel kind of silly and redundant, and the show stayed like that pretty much up until season 20 actually. Regardless of the region, every series followed Ash and friends as he earned gym badges and ended with Ash challenging the Pokemon League. It may seem repetitive, but that's how the games have worked. Nowadays, after 20 years, the writers assume you know what's going on. Early on in the first episode of Sun and Moon, Alola to New Adventure, Ash stumbles upon a Grubbin in the middle of the street market. Rather than pull out a Pokedex and try to figure out what a Grubbin is, Ash and Pikachu sprint after the Pokemon in hopes of catching it. It feels so much more natural and like a truer adaptation of the games. Side note, in the games, you don't get Pokedex info on the Pokemon until after you catch it. So I guess that's kind of truer to the games? Humor. It's a little tough to compare to season 1 since there weren't many dedicated comedy episodes. One of the funniest episodes though was episode 20, Ghost of Maiden's Peak. In case you didn't remember, let me give you a quick recap. While traveling to Saffron City, both James and Brock fall in love with a ghost. The ghost turns out to be a Ghastly, everyone tries and fails to defeat the Ghastly with her Pokemon. Misty ultimately attempts to defeat it with garlic and a wooden stake, but then the sun comes up and Ghastly goes away. It's complete and utter ridiculousness, but never feels too over the top because the comedy plays into the established tropes of the show. Brock always falls in love. This time it just happens to be with a ghost. Ash loses a battle, but it's not because of his incompetence. It's because Ghastly scared his Pokemon. So while in the moment it feels very silly, the comedy wasn't too far off Pokemon's general sense of humor. Since Ash isn't conquering gyms anymore, the current season of the anime has plenty of time to be chock full of laugh out loud moments. The 20th episode is a perfect example. In this episode, Ash and the Alola school crew are visited by a baseball master, which leads to some fun Pokemon meets baseball bits like Pitcher Pikachu. Pichachu? We see Ash and Kiawe using Z moves out on the baseball diamond. Yes, the battle moves that are so ridiculously strong you can only use them once per paddle. They use those during a friendly schoolyard game of baseball. But it doesn't stop there. The episode also serves as a hilarious parody of baseball, action, overly dramatic anime. Without a doubt, the writers had a field day, pun intended, with this one. And it perfectly encapsulates a new tone of the show. Fun and funny. It's been called the most ridiculous episode on the show's 1000 plus episode history, and it's meant in a good way. The one thing that hasn't changed though is even after 20 years on air, Pokemon can still make us cry. In the 90s, we all cried, and you are totally lying to me if you pretend you didn't. When we watched Bye Bye Butterfree and saw Ash release the first Pokemon he caught, and now it's Waterworks again while watching Litten deal with the death of his best friend and mentor, in one journey ends, another begins. Death is a subject the anime really hasn't tackled before. It's been implied in a couple episodes here and there, but in one journey ends, another begins, it's about as direct as it gets. Fans absolutely loved how well the show depicted losing a loved one, and we love that even even though the show is trying to be funnier, it hasn't left out the heart. Animation and editing. Like most cartoons back in the day, Pokemon was animated via cells. In case you don't know what cell animation is, I'll do my best to sum up an incredibly complicated process as quickly as possible. Basically, the characters were hand-drawn, then painted onto a transparent sheet, which was then layered on top of a drawn or painted background, and then all of that was put into a machine which took a picture of it. The picture is called a frame, and there are 24 frames in a second of animation. 60 seconds in a minute, so a 22-minute episode of Pokemon could have over 20,000 
and drawings. Since August of 2002, Pokemon's gone digital, and I mean digital drawings. However, cell purists should feel at ease. The animation company behind Pokemon's anime, OLM, is committed to making sure the digital versions of the show doesn't lose any of the life associated with hand-drawn animation. In 2015, OLM started using Toon Boom Harmony to animate the show, which is also the same software that's used on shows like SpongeBob SquarePants, The Loud House, Family Guy, and many, many more. The team at OLM is so committed to making sure Pokemon still feels like Pokemon that they spent weeks testing out line width. They would draw the same scene over and over again with various width modifiers on until they found one that felt right. Perfection at its best. Format change. In the recent days of the show, Ash no longer has every starter in his party. Back in the 90s, Ash had Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur, but more recently he hasn't had every starter. He always travels with every starter Pokemon, but it's nice to see other trainers with them instead of Ash having all three. It also adds a nice touch of continuity to the show, since theoretically, every beginning trainer is given the choice of one starter when they begin their Pokemon journey. Back then, it would have felt redundant for Ash to run into a bunch of other trainers with the same Pokemon as him, but by cutting back the number of starters that Ash traveled with, it opened up the possibility to see other trainers with their first Pokemon. On top of that, the starters are generally some of the most powerful Pokemon, and it always seemed a bit unfair that Ash would get them all. Now, Ash keeps two starters in his party, Linton and Rowlet. His friend Lana has a Poplio, so we get to see plenty of cute seal action. Characters, relationships. With each passing region and series of the show, Ash gets some new companions. It's been a mainstay of the show. It's always a bit sad to say bye to the companions you grow to love over the series, but at this point it's become standard procedure. Back then, Ash traveled with two gym leaders, Brock and Misty. In Alola, Ash is traveling with five other trainers who are a mix of trial captains and regular old trainers. Five may sound like a lot, and it is. The group in Alola is the largest party Ash has ever traveled with, and if that seems like huge news, then you may want to sit down for this next one. For the first time, Pokemon even explored a romantic relationship. Okay, probably not the first time since Brock was in love basically every episode, but fans saw Ash involved in a romantic subplot. It was a moment that Pokefans had been waiting for since the beginning of the show. Though not explicitly shown on camera, as season 19 wrapped up, fans got to see Ash experience his first kiss with his friend Serena. The romance had been hinted at throughout the entire series, and storyboard artists confirmed that while they couldn't directly show the kiss, it happened. If you don't think it's a big deal, just take a second and think about how crazy you would've gone if you saw Ash and Misty kiss. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then of course there's Ash Ketchum's most notable relationship with his favorite frenemies, Team Rocket. The antics between the Rocket Trio and Ash Ketchum are still ever present in the anime, and they certainly aren't going anywhere. They tried it once, it didn't work out. In Season 19, Team Rocket actually joined up with Ash to defeat Team Flare. It was one of those enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of things since they can't capture Pikachu if the world is destroyed, and Pikachu doesn't exist anymore. It's not the first time they've done so either. Throughout the course of the show, Jesse, James, and Meowth have also helped Ash take down Team Galactic and Team Plasma. In the first season of the show, Team Rocket were a trio of incompetent people, but it finally happened. After over 950 failed attempts, Team Rocket battled Ash and actually won in the Sun, the Scare, and the Secret Lair. Naturally, they were just as shy about winning as we all were, so they failed to actually capture Pikachu. But it's still a glorious moment for fans of the show, which I happen to think is a sign of good writing. The fact that fans were actually happy for Team Rocket shows just how beloved this trio has become over the years. So there you have it, 20 years of Pokemon anime in roughly 10 minutes, give or take a few. Venomoth, Poliwag, Nidorina, Golduck, Ivysaur, Grimer, Victorbell, Moltres. He says Moltres funny in the rap. Nidoking, Farfetch, Abra, Jigglypuff, Kingler, Rhyhorn, Clefable, Wigglytuff. God, I love that Pokemon rap. It's just listing Pokemon in a rhyming scheme style convenient way. There's not really a rhyming scheme though, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Speaking of long lists though, how about 107 facts? We'll start off with the legendary 107 Pokemon facts you should know series, parts one, two, and three. Hey everybody, Jen from the leaderboard here, and today we're joined by a very special guest, my puppy Mindy. Say hi Mindy. Hi everybody. So today, on the leaderboard, we're going to be giving you 107 Pokemon video game facts. Let's get started. Right? Want to get started? Yeah, she wants to get started. Number one, the first Pokemon video game was released in Japan in 1996. Makes me feel old. Fact number two, it was created by a man named Satoshi Tajiri, who as a child was obsessed with capturing and collecting bugs and tadpoles. Fact number three, Satoshi was also obsessed with the Ultraman TV series, where giant monsters would battle each other and they were collected in small capsules. Fact number four, when Satoshi would see children playing with their Game Boys using the link cables, he imagined creatures crawling back and forth between the games. Thus, the Pokemon idea fell into place. Fact number five, there are 24 core Pokemon games, 
across six generations, including remakes. Fact number six, there are 74 total branded Pokemon games, but there are many, many others out there that use Pokemon as playable or unplayable characters. Super Smash Brothers, anyone? Fact number seven, there are currently 721 Pokemon, way more than my original 151. Do you remember the Pokemon rap? Because I know it by heart. Fact number eight, each generation of Pokemon has a brand new region, and they have different themes, like winter or French theme. Fact number nine, generation one, Pokemon Red and Blue, is known as the Chromatic Generation, which features genetics and engineering. So take a look at Mewtwo, Porygon, and even the resurrection of fossils. Fact number 10, Generation 1 is the only generation where there is no female playable character, although looking at the files of the game, it looks like the option was intended. However, she was added in later remakes known as Leaf. Fact number 11, the original Japanese games were known as red and green, with blue being an updated version with better graphics and sound. Fact number 12, although all the games let you choose your own name and the name of your rival, the canon names are red for yourself and blue for your rival. Ash and Gary only became popular after the anime was released. Fact number 13, red has a Super Nintendo console in his room. Fact number 14, all versions of Red across all Pokemon media own a Pikachu, including Ash from the anime. The one exception is the character Satoshi from Pokemon Zen Show. He evolves his Pikachu into a Raichu. Fact number 15, in Generation 1, Pokemon Red and Blue had a lot of glitches that players like to exploit, including the Messigno glitch, which you could use to duplicate items many, many times over. 99 rare candy items, anybody? Totally did it. All the time. Fact number 16, almost 20 years of the game being released, people are still finding ways to manipulate the game code. Just recently in 2014, a speedrunner was able to put Twitch chat inside of a Pokemon game. Why would you do that? Twitch chat is awful. Fact number 17, Red's rival sarcastically calls him a chatty gossip in the remakes of Red and Blue. Irony is, Red doesn't really talk. Fact number 18, the old man blocking your path in Viridian City? He says he's grumpy because he hasn't had his coffee. But in the original Japanese release, he was just a drunk, passed out old man on the ground. Not exactly kid friendly to Nintendo. Fact number 19, Professor Oak was meant to be a final boss in the game, but was later removed. He can still be fought through a convoluted series of glitches and exploits, and his Pokemon team include Taurus, Executor, Arcanine, Gyarados, and the final evolution of the Pokemon that you or Blue didn't pick. His Pokemon are at the highest level you face in the entire game. Let me know if you've played Professor Oak. Fact number 20. Technically, Pokemon Yellow is an adaptation of an anime, which is an adaptation of a video game. Following me so far? Fact number 21. You can find Pokemon's development team in Celadon City. When you complete your Pokedex, make sure you go back and talk to the lead developer, and he will give you a diploma. You graduated Pokemon. Congratulations. Fact number 22, Gyarados was originally supposed to be a water dragon type, but later was changed to water flying. This was because the water dragon type basically had no weaknesses. And this explains why Lance still has a Gyarados in his party, even though Gyarados isn't dragon themed, which makes complete sense. They didn't have fairies back then. Now fairies changed the game. Fact number 23, Venonat is originally supposed to evolve into Butterfree. They have the same color, the same eyes, the same antenna, same teeth. Take a look for yourself. Makes sense, doesn't it? Fact number 24, in the Generation 1 games Red and Blue, Lickitung can't learn Lick. She knows Lick. Lickitung doesn't, though. Fact number 25, all of the statues in the gyms of Pokemon Red and Blue can be surfed and fished on. The Cerulean City Gym is the only one where you can actually find Pokemon to capture. Fact number 26, there is a very large rumor that the music in Lavender Town was causing children to fall ill and commit suicide. It was later changed in the American release and the rumors grew from there. Turns out it was originally changed because the shrillness of the music were giving a lot of people headaches. Maybe not so much the suicide thing, but it's freaky music. Fact number 27, Generation 2, Pokemon Gold and Silver, is known as the Metallic Generation, which focuses on mythology and tradition. As example, take a look at the legendary Pokemon added, the Unknown, and Kimono Girls. Fact number 28, Pokemon Gold and Silver were hinted at two years before it was released, 
when the Pokemon Ho-Oh made an appearance in the anime. I for one was very confused as a child when this Pokemon appeared because I had no idea what it was and like I said before, I had memorized the original 150 Pokemon rap. Fact number 29, the protagonists in Generation 2 were named Ethan and Chris. They had TVs in their rooms, but no video games. What the hell? Fact number 30, Generation 2 begins three years after the first game. Fact number 31, Gold and Silver introduced the fewest number of Pokemon at only 100. Yeah, only 100. Simpler times. Simpler times. Fact number 32, a lot of things have changed in Kanto from Generation 1 to Generation 2. There's a new train running from Saffron City, Team Rocket is in complete disarray from the actions of Red, and Cinnabar Island is destroyed by a volcano. Fact number 33, the optional final boss in Generation 2 is the champion Red from Generation 1. Red has no dialogue, which symbolizes him as a silent protagonist from the first game. Fact number 34, the final boss Red in Generation 2, his Pokemon are based on all of the events that happened in Generation 1, Red and Blue, and Pokemon Yellow. Fact number 35, until the release of Pokemon Platinum, Red's Pikachu was the highest level Pokemon you could encounter in the game at level 81. Fact number 36, Ethan is the only male protagonist to ever meet Ash in the anime. Fact number 37, the Dark and Steel type Pokemons were introduced in Generation 2 to balance out the overpowered Psychic Pokemon and the underused Fighting Pokemon. A new type would not be introduced until later, Pokemon X and Y with the Fairy type. Then things got real crazy. Fact number 38, there was a trainer in the original release called Fire Breather Dick. Unsurprisingly, his name was later changed. Fact number 39, a bootleg Vietnamese translated version became very popular due to its nonsensical and almost offensive dialogue. I didn't play this game. Did you play this version? Fact number 40, the love ball was originally supposed to make Pokemon of the opposite gender easier to catch. However, due to faulty programming, the love ball only made it easier to catch Pokemon of the same gender. Very progressive of you, Game Freak. Accidentally progressive, but progressive. Fact number 41, the Pokemon Meryl was originally referred to as Peekaboo. Even promotional cards for Pokemon the first movie use this name. Fact number 42, the Pokemon Azuril, which is the evolved version of Meryl, has a different gender ratio than Meryl, so you have a slight chance of changing gender when your Pokemon evolves into a zero. Fact number 43, in early builds of the game, New Bark Town was called Silent Hills. Unsurprisingly, this was changed. Speaking of which, does anyone want a 107 Silent Hill video? Because I'll do it, I love horror games. Fact number 44, the Pokemon Company CEO thought Gold and Silver were going to be the very last Pokemon games, and thank God he was wrong. Fact number 45, the only Pokemon type in Gold and Silver that doesn't have a specialized gym or Elite Four member is the ground type Pokemon. Fact number 46, Pokemon Silver was way more popular than Pokemon Gold. Sorry Pokemon Gold fans. Fact number 47, Generation 3, Ruby and Sapphire are known as the Advanced Generation because they were released on Game Boy Advance. Fact number 48, Generation 3 focuses on nature and people's relationships with it, as seen with the legendaries, the villains, the newly introduced weather functions, and cities being built into natural landscapes. Fact number 49, the Generation 3 protagonists are Brandon and May, and both have GameCube games in their rooms. Fact number 50, Mei is the first female protagonist to have a serious role within the anime. Fact number 51, Ruby and Sapphire were the only games to feature both of the protagonist's parents. Fact number 52, it is possible to breed a Skitty who weighs 23 pounds and a Whale Lord which weighs 177 pounds together. Try not to picture that. Fact number 53, there is a trainer couple in Generation 3 called Lois and Hal, which is a reference to the show Malcolm in the Middle. Fact number 54, a braille guide was included in the game manual to help players solve a puzzle to get to three of the legendary Pokemon. Didn't have the manual? That's what the internet's for. Fact number 55, over a quarter of the Gen 3 games take place under the ocean. Fact number 56, more copies were sold of Ruby 
than of Sapphire. I had the Ruby version. What version did you guys have? Fact number 57, the Generation 4 games were all about legends, myths, and the history of the universe. The godlike legendaries and people's fascination with stories all tied into this theme. Fact number 58, the starter Pokemon of Generation 4 all evolve into Pokemon based on mythology. Empoleon is based on Poseidon, Torterra is based on the World Turtle, and Infernape is based on Sun Wukong. Fact number 59, the protagonists of Diamond and Pearl are Lucas and Dawn, and both have a Wii in their room. Fact number 60, changes to Pokemon's base stats and the simplification of training led to Generation 4's battling scene being much more popular than the rest. Fact number 61, Generation 4 is the first generation where you can legitimately obtain a level 1 Pokemon. Before, in Red and Blue, if you had a level 1 Pokemon, this was a glitch and would instantly level up to 100 if within the first battle would receive less than 54 experience points. Fact number 62, one myth in the Japanese version of the game implies that people and Pokemon could marry one another way back in the day. I don't know. Fact number 63, the English translations of Generation 4 feature numerous references to internet memes and chat speak. Funny coincidence is that the lead translator is a member of Something Awful Forums. Fact number 64, Generation 5 has the first direct sequel with Black and White and Black and White 2. Fact number 65, Generation 5 focuses on opposites like yin and yang. Some of these include nature and industry, humans and Pokemon, and of course the legendaries that were black and white. Fact number 66, the story of black and white took a year and a half to develop. Production started even before Platinum's release. Fact number 67, every Pokemon generation except five features a playable character in this Super Smash Brothers series. Who wants to see 107 Super Smash facts? Let me know in the comments below. Fact number 68, the protagonists of black and white are Hilbert and Hilda and also have a Wii in their room. Fact number 69, the protagonists of Black and White 2 are Nate and Rosa. There are no video games in their room, but you can place trophies in your room after you earn them. Fact number 70, Black and White are the first Pokemon games that suggest there might be a moral problem with having your Pokemon battle one another. Fact number 71, Pokemon Black sold way more copies than Pokemon White. Which version did you buy? I bought white. Fact number 72, Generation 6 it features the first fully 3D world and focuses on life, death, creation, and destruction. This generation also features many references to the previous games, which sort of implies that X and Y is a rebirth to the Pokemon series. Fact number 73, the protagonists of X and Y are Calum and Serena, and both have a Wii U in their room. Fact number 74, the Kalos region is the first region that features more female trainers than males, and this includes gyms. Fact number 75, in Generation 6, Pikachu is voiced by the same actress as the TV series rather than a generic growl in the previous games. Fact number 76, the world record speedrun for Red and Blue with no glitches took 1 hour and 48 minutes, which is crazy fast. It took me like a month to beat that game when I was a kid. Fact number 77, the general strategy for that speedrun was to get a Needle King as early as possible whose early availability, strong base stats, and TM moveset flexibility made it an easy Pokemon to complete the game. Fact number 78, you can manipulate the game's memory using glitches to allow you to complete the Hall of Fame in less than five minutes. Basically, you can just warp to the Hall of Fame, and you're done. Fact number 79, each of the game's regions is based on a real area in the world. Kanto is based on Kanto, Japan. Johto is based on Kansai. Hoenn is based on Kyushu. Sinnoh is based on Hokkaido. Unova is based on New York City. And Kalos is based on France. Fact number 80, the protagonist in Pokemon Snap is really named Todd Snap. Didn't think I was gonna throw Pokemon Snap games at you, did ya? But I am. I love the Pokemon Snap. Fact number 81, Todd Snap met Ash in the anime, taking a photo of him almost being eaten by an Aerodactyl and he became relatively famous for it. Fact number 82, male Pokemon tend to have higher attack stats than female Pokemon. Sexist. Fact number 83, using built-in chat to deliver inputs to the game, Twitch managed to crowdsource a whole game of Pokemon Red. Fact number 84, it took over 1 million players 16 days to complete Pokemon Red. 
defeating their rival Blue in only two attempts. Fact number 85, more than 9 million people tuned in to watch and the video now has over 36 million views. Fact number 86, a level 100 Shuckle can potentially deal the most damage in one single attack. It can deal over 213 million points of damage with a critical hit. Oh my god. Fact number 87, Mew was the first trademark ever applied for, which was more than six years before the release of Red and Green in Japan. Fact number 88, Rhydon was the first Pokemon ever created. Fact number 89, competitive Pokemon battling places the Pokemon into six tiers including Uber, Overused, Borderline, Underused, Never Used, and Limbo. Fact number 90, Uber is generally used for legendary Pokemon, while Overused are the Pokemon that are generally used in tournaments, such as Charizard, Venusaur, Tyranitar, and Alakazam. Fact number 91, Rayquaza's Mega Evolution is still not eligible for competition, even in the Uber tier. It's just way too powerful. Fact number 92, non-legendary Pokemon still considered too powerful for play include Clefable, Skarmory, Cloyster, and Wobbuffet. Fun fact number 93, Pikachu's Pokedex number is 25 and Meowth's is 52, and in the anime, they are rivals. Fact number 94, there are no dark type gyms which makes me sad because that's my favorite type of Pokemon. Fun gen fact, my favorite Pokemon is Umbreon because it's awesome. Fact number 95, the term shiny was actually fan created. Shiny refers to Pokemon with different color variations and are often much stronger than their original counterparts, but very rare. Shiny wasn't adopted until black and white is official canon. Fact number 96, it is said that the Pokemon Voltorb and Electrode didn't exist until Pokeballs were invented, and this might give some insight into the origins of the Pokemon species. A little food for thought for you. Fact number 97, the Pokemon Weedle can only learn three moves, which is String Shot, Poison Sting, and Bug Bite. Get it together, Weedle. Fact number 98, Rock and Grass type Pokemon both have the most weaknesses at five. Fact number 99, the best defensive type Pokemon is a Fairy Steel combination with nine resistances and two immunities. The only Pokemon with this combination is Klefki and Mawa. Fact number 100, the worst defensive type combination is Grass and Ice, which has seven weaknesses and very little resistances. An example of this Pokemon type is Snover and Abomasnow. Fact number 101, in Fire Red and Leaf Green, the Pokemon Sableye is immune to all of Wild Mewtwo's attacks. Fact number 102, each legendary Pokemon receives its own unique move. However, Mewtwo didn't receive his until Generation 5, when Psystrike was introduced. Fact number 103, in the anime, Professor Oak's Kangaskhan was able to defeat Agatha's Ghost-type Pokemon, despite Ghost-types being completely immune to normal attacks. Several games later, Kangaskhan was given the ability Scrappy, so it can use its normal-type moves against Ghost-types. Way to cover your butts. Fact number 104, many of the strongest Pokemon particularly dragon Pokemon, are considered pseudo-legendary. This includes Dragonite, Tyranitar, and Garchomp. Fact number 105, Doduo, despite not having any wings, can learn the fly move. This includes multiple fan theories of how it actually flies, including using both of its heads in a helicopter motion. I'm guessing. Fact number 106, creators put most of these theories to rest when Doduo was introduced in Pokemon Stadium, when it flew, it just jumped in the air really high and ran his feet really fast. Fact number 107, no two Spinda have the same exact spot patterns. Some Pokédex entries say that the chance of a Spinda having identical spot patterns is 1 in 4 billion. Pokemon is one of the world's most expansive and popular franchises, so how could 107 measly little facts ever be enough? It couldn't. There's just too much awesomeness to cover in this weird and wacky world. So we've got even more facts coming at ya. Tim from Channel Frederator is going to count off the 107 more facts you should know about Pokemon, and whether you're a diehard fan or just wondering what all the fuss is about, 
we've got a little something for everyone. Let's get started. Number 1. Pokemon was created by game designer Satoshi Tahiri. Tahiri's adoration for video games began when he cut a lot of high school classes to go play games like Space Invaders. Number 2. The name Hoenn comes from the Japanese characters Ho, which means rich, and N, which means bond. Developers wanted to make sure the area's countryside looked especially rich for Ruby and Sapphire. Number 3. Game Freak, the company that eventually released the first Pokemon games, started out as Tahiri's fanzine expressing his love for video games. The zine wasn't widely circulated but gained enough attention to attract future collaborators, most notably Ken Sugimori. Number 4. It took Tahiri and company six years to develop the Pokemon games. Game Freak even came very close to going bankrupt. Luckily for Planet Earth, this did not happen, and I'm pretty sure Game Freak's doing quite well now. Number 5. To give an idea of just how humble these beginnings were, the vast majority of development on the first Pokemon games were done by only nine people. Number 6. Ken Sugimori is responsible for the designs of all 151 original Pokemon. He still oversees the designs and productions of the Pokemon world. So basically, this is the guy you have to thank for how Pokemon looks. Number 7. The first few seasons of Pokemon were animated the old-fashioned way, namely hand-painted cells. That's right, all that Pikachu lightning bolt action was painted by hand. And the cells are actually bigger than what you see on screen, meaning there was much more detail to each frame than appeared in the final product. Number 8, however, Pokemon isn't immune to trends in technology, so the series has gone digital since August 2002. Number 9, in 2013, the Black and White series revisited some of the classic scenes from the original anime when Ash's Charizard was reintroduced. However, the scenes were redone in Pokemon's new style, so the difference between hand-painted and digital became readily apparent especially in regards to flame attacks. Number 10, even Ash himself looks a little different. It's a minor difference, but if you look Ash straight in the eyes, you'll notice he lost his brown irises. So his eyes are now just black. Number 11, Ash has never caught a fairy, steel, ghost, or psychic type Pokemon. And don't say Haunter, Ash doesn't actually catch the Haunter. Number 12, despite her son's love for Pokemon and his vast collection, Ash's mom Delia only has one Pokemon, Mr. Mime. Number 13, she was also a former student of Professor Oak, so maybe she's an unsung Pokemon. Pokemon hero. How awesome would that be? Number 14, there's a popular fan theory that somehow Ho-Oh is Ash's father, which is weird. And when this proposition was presented to storyboard artist Masamitsu Midaka, he erupted in laughter. So that's a pretty definitive no. Number 15, there was an episode that features Ash in the Safari Zone that was banned in the United States for the gratuitous use of handguns. This means, in the English dub, Ash never officially visited the Safari Zone, a major feature in the video games. Also, we feel we should mention the episode includes Meowth doing an interrogation with a Hitler mustache. Number 16, because Coco was later promoted to the Elite four that would also make him the first Elite Four member that Ash ever met, even if he hadn't quite made it there yet. Number 17. Due to the Tohoku earthquake and Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011, a two-parter episode entitled Team Rocket vs. Team Plasma has been indefinitely postponed, possibly because it looks like the special has plenty of buildings collapsing and explosions, which might strike a chord. Number 18. This wasn't the first episode to be skipped over due to natural events. Battle of the Quaking Island, in which wish caches cause an earthquake, was also pulled in 2004 after a real-life earthquake occurred two weeks before its scheduled premiere. Number 19. Ash has used all of Team Rocket's main Pokemon, Arbok, Weezing, and Meowth. Which isn't fair, I consider Wobbuffet to be one of the main. Number 20. When Oak was younger, his main Pokemon was a Charmeleon. His grandson's starter choice was Squirtle, which is obviously strong against fire types. Number 21. Gary Oak, the grandson of Professor Oak, is based on the rival from Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, and also Green if you're from Japan. Though not exactly the same, his clothes are similar to the rival in Red and Blue. Also, he's missing the snazzy jacket. Number 22. Because the game was made to match the anime more faithfully, Pokemon Yellow's rival is a much closer match to Gary's look. Number 23. In Yellow, the rival starter is Eevee, to match the player having a unique starter. Since Yellow is largely based on the show, Gary himself also has an Eevee, but Eevee wasn't his starter Pokemon. Number 24, Gary is pretty accomplished. In the first season, he's shown with 10 badges, two more than you can even earn in the Kanto region. Of the badges he shows, only three are ones that we know of, the Cascade Badge, the Boulder Badge, and the Rainbow Badge. So either he's been cheating this entire time, or Ash needs to 
up his game. Number 25, Gary's badges stand a good chance at being legit though, because contrary to the game, in the anime there are more than eight gyms in each area, which means Gary could have gone on all kinds of exciting adventures to places we've never even heard of. Number 26, to make Gary even more impressive seeming, in episode 65 of the original series, Gary is shown to have caught over 200 Pokemon. That's 49 more Pokemon types than even existed at that point. Ash, what are you doing? You gotta step it up. Number 27, Ash and Gary are seemingly childhood rivals and friends, going from later episodes and the game they are based on. Despite this, when Gary meets Ash in the first episode, he states it's the first time they've met, which could just be because Gary is a massive tool. Number 28, Ash received Pikachu in a Pokeball, and as of the current series, that's the only time he's ever been seen in one. Number 29, since entering our lives in the late 90s, Pikachu has actually slimmed down considerably. Fans of my age would argue that the plumper version is even more adorable, but hey, good for him losing weight. Number 30, Pikachu has defeated two legendary Pokemon and was the first Pokemon to defeat a Mega Evolved Pokemon without Mega Evolving himself. I mean, yes, he's a very good Pikachu. I'm sure his IVs are through the roof, but he's still no Jolteon. Number 31, even though it might seem random to most people, Pikachu's words can actually be translated. Most notably, he says Pika P when referring to Ash. Pikachu P for Misty, Pika Chu for Brock, and P when addressing an unknown. Number 32, Pikachu is considered by many to be Japan's Mickey Mouse. According to certain academic circles, Pikachu's worldwide iconic status actually has a shot at eventually dethroning Mickey Mouse as the biggest pop culture icon, which is especially impressive since Pikachu just turned 20. Number 33, Togepi in particular is interesting, as it was one of the first generation two Pokemon that was ever shown, the first one to be owned by someone, and the first one we knew the name of. Of course, she's not the first we saw. That distinction goes to Ho-Oh. Number 34, Togepi was the first Pokemon to hatch out of an egg, which makes sense, it's basically 80% egg. Number 35, since Togepi was born from an egg and not naturally caught, she's never shown having an owner's Pokeball. Misty simply carried it wherever she went. Number 36, Ash and Misty are hinted at having strong feelings for each other, but this is much more played up in an absolutely 90s horrific love ballad in which Misty sings about how much she loves Ash. Number 37, while Brock has repeatedly come back to be Ash's companion, former director and storyboarder Masamitsu Hidaka has stated there are no plans to ever bring Misty back as a regular companion. Number 38, though Brock doesn't have an official last name, his American voice actor Eric Stewart has stated in a 2006 interview that his last name is Harris. Number 39, Misty's last name is never officially revealed either. It's speculated to be Waterflower, mostly because her name in Japanese is Kasumiyawa, and Yawa translates to Waterflower in English. Number 40, Jesse and James' names are based on the Old West gunslinger, Jesse James. The other Team Rocket's names are Butch and Cassidy, so the cowboy theme definitely holds. Except Giovanni. There's, there's not a cowboy Giovanni as far as I know. Hey everyone, taking a quick break to let you know that Frodo online store, Stash Right, is holding a thousand dollar giveaway for buying all your plushies and t-shirts and whatever from your favorite cartoons. All that you need to enter is an email address. Contest rules apply and there's a link in the description below. Also, all shipping in the United States is totally free, and if you're outside the United States, Stash Ride is taking $5 off the shipping costs. So go ahead and check them out now while you can. Number 41, no specific reason has been given for Jessie's signature hairstyle, but in some promo images, it allows for her to make an R shape with her body. Number 42, her hair was originally red, but in the changeover from traditional coloring to digital color, it transitioned to a more magenta color. It's subtle, but it's there. Number 43, Jessie's Wobbuffet, though it's never a main focus, is the third most consistent Pokemon in the series, appearing less than only Meowth and Pikachu. Number 44, Meowth is never seen inside of a Pokeball. Does this mean he could actually be wild? Number 45, because of his unique status, Meowth is the only Pokemon to be a gym leader when Team Rocket was put in charge of Giovanni's gym. Number 46, in Japan, Lieutenant Surge's name is the Lightning American. Number 47, the Pokemon War Lieutenant Surge talks about was real. Producer Juinichi Masuda says, the war was a clash between two different countries. People treated Pokemon with special powers as mere tools in their conflict. They gathered lots of Pokemon and Pokemon with unique powers. This long conflict was drawn out and many lives were lost. Number 48, though Koga, the Fuchsia City gym leader, has appeared in the anime, his daughter Janine never has, making her the only gym leader to be excluded from the series. Number 49, Blaine, the Cinnabar Island gym leader, uses a disguise that's likely a reference to the fact that he 
has had two official game designs. His incognito look has the sunglasses and mustache that he had in Pokemon Red and Blue, while his revealed look has no mustache and a receding hairline, much similar to how he looked in the original Japanese release of Pokemon Red and Green. Number 50. In the English dub of Pokemon, Mewtwo is the first Pokemon ever seen, as he is shown flying by in the intro sequence, but the Japanese opener saves Mewtwo for later, so Charizard gets the distinction. Number 51. In the United States, the first eight seasons of Pokemon were dubbed and edited by 4Kids Entertainment, the same company that also oversaw the English versions of Yu-Gi-Oh! and One Piece. 4Kids has been at the center of controversy for heavily anglicizing their series, though, believe it or not, Pokemon is one of their more lightly edited properties. Number 52. That doesn't mean that 4Kids didn't get their hands dirty. 4Kids passed off a number of Japanese festivals in the series as just happenings within the Pokemon world, most notably the Summer Festival, Kids Day, and the Princess Festival, all of which have real-life equivalents in Japan. Number 53, another notable change revolved around Ninetales, who's based on the Kitsune, a mythical Japanese fox that can have, well, up to nine tails, and turns white or gold when it earns its ninth tail, either through age, wisdom, or power. Older Kitsune can also shapeshift into humans, which poor Ninetales can't do. Number 54, believe it or not, Magikarp also has its source in mythology. There's a Chinese legend that a carp that can jump over a waterfall can transform into a powerful dragon, like, say, Gyarados. This is especially intriguing when you consider that Magikarp's attack splash is better translated as hop. Number 55. One of the changes that fans did enjoy, however, was the inclusion of the infamous polka rap. Number 56. The rap was written by 4Kids series composer John Siegler in collaboration with R&B singer James D. Train Williams and rapper Baby Floyd. Siegler admits the rap is one of his least favorite pieces he wrote for the series, since it's not particularly musically interesting. Number 57. The only Pokemon missing from the Generation 1 Poke rap is Mew, as when it was written, he wasn't widely known. Number 58. Similarly, because certain Pokemon did not appear until later in the series, they had to be replaced by the closest things. This includes Kabuto being represented by Bill dressed in a Kabuto costume, and Venusaur, Blastoise, Charizard, Raiden, Kabutops, and Zapdos being the gigantic robot versions of them from the episode The Island of Giant Pokemon. Number 59. There are a few errors in the early versions of the Poke Rap, including showing Poliwag when Poliwrath was mentioned, and showing Geodude during Graveler segment. Number 60. The Pokemon anime is the only official depiction of the games released. They also released Pokemon Origins, a shorter mini-series that tells the story of Pokemon Red and Blue from gaining their starter to fighting Mewtwo. Number 61. Does the Japanese voice of Red sound familiar? It's Junko Takeuchi, known for playing Naruto Uzumaki in Naruto. Number 62. The original plan for the third Pokemon movie revolved around the discovery of a Tyrannosaurus skeleton, which would abstractly deal with why no real-world animals exist in the world of Pokemon. The T-Rex fossil would come to life and have to be stopped by Ash and company. The film was rejected because the powers that be thought a story where a bunch of minerals gain consciousness and come back to life wouldn't be a hit. So I guess the powers that be have not seen Jurassic Park. Number 63. Shundo Takeshi, the chief writer of the original series and the writer of this scrapped third film, says that any appearance of real-world animals in the series were due to animation staff not paying close enough attention. Number 64. Diglett has feet? In a mission for Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, you have to save a Diglett that is hanging on the edge of a mountain. After saving it, the Diglett says he feels like his feet are still walking on air. Number 65. One perk of always being around water is that Misty has great lung capacity. She has been able to spend extended amounts of time underwater during her performances at her gym. Number 66. Blastoise's original design didn't include the cannons coming out of his shell, which he still would have been awesome and Squirtle would still have been the best starter. Number 67, in pre-alpha sketches, Torchic had floppy ears, which would make it a cute little bunny chicken thing instead of just a chicken thing. Number 68, Empoleon's name is based on Emperor and Napoleon, except in Japan where it's a combination of Emperor and Bonaparte. It's also 5 foot 7, around the same height as Napoleon Bonaparte. Coincidence? I think not. Also, Napoleon wasn't that short. He was 5 foot 2 inches by French feet and inches, which is larger than the standard unit. The whole short thing is a myth based around propaganda. Who said you wouldn't learn anything watching a Pokemon video. Number 69. Weedle was originally intended to follow the real-life growth cycle of a beetle. Beedrill won out because, according to designer Atsuko Nishida, it was simply cooler. Number 70. Machoke and Machamp aren't wearing pants. It may look like they have some serious tight shorts action happening, but it's really just part of their natural markings. Number 71. Pidgeot earned the ability to Mega Evolve because the game makers wanted to give Pidgeot the spotlight one more time, since it's a popular Pokemon and one that your rival uses in red and blue. Number 70. 
1972, certain Pokémon didn't receive Mega Evolutions because creators felt Pokémon couldn't evolve further in terms of their design. So basically, they're just too perfect. Number 73, Mega Slowbro was created because designers asked, wouldn't it be interesting if Shelter was biting Slowbro's body and not just the tail? Number 74, Pichu was designed as the next Pikachu, but you can't replace Pikachu. Number 75, there's a popular theory that Gengar is Clefable's shadow, since the two have an eerily similar shape, and Gengar is just enough taller than Clefable to make a convincing shadow. He's officially listed as a shadow-type Pokémon after all. Aren't cartoon theories fun? Number 76, it's impossible for a Pokémon to have more than two types, but if you combined all 18 types in one Pokemon, it would still have one weakness, rock. Number 77, it took Snorlax's sprite 17 years and 8 months to stand up. He got it by the 6th generation though. Better late than never. Number 78, Snorlax's Japanese name, Kabagon, is a play on words for sleep, snoring, and rest. Number 79, Tepic was designed to start off as cute enough to eat, but evolve to a point where it would wind up eating you instead. Which makes sense considering it starts as an adorable little piglet, then turns into a fiery Ganondorf-esque death machine. Number 80. We know that Charmander's tail needs to be kept lit so that it can live, but I think Spoink has it worse. He has to continuously bounce or its heart will stop. Number 81. Apparently it's completely possible for people to just turn into Pokemon if you're special enough. Beside that time, Ash turned into a Pikachu. Legend has it that a boy with extrasensory powers suddenly transformed into a Kadabra. Number 82. All Yamasks are also derived from people. They are the spirits of people interred in graves, and each one carries around a mask that resembles its face when it was a human human and retains memories of its former life. Sometimes they look at the mask and cry. Number 83, Lampent is even darker. It's known to hang around hospitals waiting for people to die so it can use their spirits as fuel for its fire. Number 84, if you're a kid you should probably avoid Drifloons. Kids unlucky enough to mistake it for a balloon tend to turn up missing. Oh yeah, they're also made up of the spirits of humans and Pokemon. Number 85, the Pokemon Bonnet is simply a plush doll that was thrown away, which came to life because it was that angry. It stopped around looking for the child that abandoned it. It's basically a horror story version of Toy Story. Number 86, a drawing of Bennett was commissioned by Pokemon from famed horror manga author Junji Ito as part of a Halloween related promotion called Kawapoke. Don't worry, Pokemon also allowed Ito to ruin Gengar for you. Number 87, in the original Pokemon Adventures manga series, Sabrina, Lieutenant Surge, and Koga are all members of Team Rocket. Number 88, in the same series, the Elite Four is an evil corporation that is trying to use the gym badges to power a laser that would wipe out humanity, except for a few people who are nice enough to their Pokemon. Number 89, Team Rocket did a rather unethical experiment on Moltres, Articuno, and Zapdos that combined them into one giant named Pfizer. It's like a legendary version of Dodrio. Number 90, Pokemon Red and Blue sprites were criticized for not looking enough like the art in the anime. You know, the anime that came out after the games were made. In response, Game Freak modified the sprites for yellow to make them look more like the anime. Number 91, Ash has caught a starter from every region. Number 92, a musical stage show called Pokemon Live toured the US in the second half of 2000. If you haven't seen it, you missed it. By 16 years. Number 93, the musical incorporated some songs from the show as well as plenty of new exclusive material. If you're promoting the fact that you missed this, you can still buy the cast recording titled Pokemon Gotta Catch Em All Live, featuring such hits as What Kind of Pokemon Are You, You and Me and Pokemon, and Brock's Unforgettable Two Perfect Girls. Number 94, all 150 original Pokemon managed to make a cameo. All of them. I feel bad for the costumes and props departments on that show. Number 95, the musical also introduced Mecha Mewtwo, which is a robot owned by Giovanni. Number 96, famous MMA fighter Ronda Rousey is a massive Pokemon fan. She says she lost a ton of weight the summer she got Pokemon Blue because she wouldn't stop playing. Number 97, there is a Pokemon club at Cornell University where young hopefuls can battle members and try to become the Pokemon champion of Cornell. They focus on both the card and video games. Number 98, the Pokemon World Championships have been held in a different city every year, and with the number of players worldwide, I don't think they're worried about running out of cities. Number 99, on April 1st, 2014, Google had the cruelest April Fool's Day prank, when they released a joke advertisement for an augmented reality version of Pokemon, along with an accompanying Google Maps game. Alongside the game, they also offered a job at Google with the official title of Pokemon Master for anyone who captured all 150. Number 100. Although the job offer was just a joke, two and a half 
half months later, in June of 2014, users who had caught all 150 Pokemon were given official Pokemon Master business cards from Google. Also, you don't need all 150 Pokemon. You just need one. Choteyam for life! Number 101. Pikachu has been a staple of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade since 2000, making 16 consecutive appearances. Number 102. Pokemon is now in its 17th season, and all the series combined have over 800 episodes. So if you haven't been keeping up, you have some binge watching to do. Number 103, there have been over 260 million Pokemon games sold, and more than 21.5 billion cards shipped to 74 countries. The Census Bureau estimates that there are 7.4 billion people on Earth, so that's roughly three cards for every person on this planet. Number 104, in 2005, Pokemon the Park opened in Nagoya. Don't go buying a plane ticket, though. The park was only a temporary traveling fair from March to September. Taiwan got it for a few months as well. Number 105, don't cry though, recently Nintendo announced that Nintendo theme attractions will be coming to Universal Studios theme parks. And while nothing specific has been announced, we all know a certain franchise that regularly partners with Nintendo. Number 106, one of the most recent Pokemon games released in Japan is Detective Pikachu, a simple point and click adventure game that wouldn't be terribly exciting if it weren't for the fact that it stars a talking Pikachu. But this Pikachu drinks coffee, is intelligent enough to solve mysteries, and is a womanizer. Number 107, to further augment how intriguing this game seems, at the time of writing there is a petition on change.org with nearly 48 thousand supporters for Danny DeVito to play Detective Pikachu in the English version of the game. And thanks to a fan video, it's already proved to be an amazing idea. What's new in the Pokemon series? What's Ash's winning rate for fights? Why does Brock keep trying to get a girlfriend? We'll tell you right here. Just like we can't get enough of Pokemon episodes, we also can't get enough Pokemon facts. Hi, I'm Adam with Channel Frederator, and we're here to check out even more info on our favorite fire types, water type, grass type, and more. So grab your Pokeballs and come catch a 107 even more facts about Pokemon. Let's get started. Number 1. Ash's outfit has changed with every series, but XY marked two huge changes for Ash. The first being that Ash is noticeably taller and leaner. This new look led to many believing that Ash finally aged, but no, our little trainer is still 10 years old. Number 2. Ash isn't the only one who's grown. Compared to older series, Ash's mom has gotten noticeably taller. Guess they're drinking milk and eating their veggies? Number 3. The other big but small change for Ash, he now has, wait for it, fingernails. It's all in the details, guys. Number 4. Ash seems to prefer grass starters, as he has owned every grass starter except for Chespin. What's the matter with Chespin, Ash? Why don't you love him? Number 5. Ash has evolved all of his fire starter Pokemon at least once. Number 6. Froakie is the only water starter that Ash has evolved. All the rest have stayed in their first stage evolution. Jeez, Ash, talk about playing favorites. Number 7. Ash Ketchum is especially good at climbing, and his climbing skills have been compared to Mankey and Apom. Number 8. Misty's Togepi did finally evolve into Togetic. 260 59 episodes after Misty got it. In the games, Togepi evolves into Togetic when leveled up with high friendship. So, what does this say about Misty? Number 9. Misty returned to her water roots in the same episode, when she released her Togetic in order to let it protect the Mirage Kingdom. All that work and you immediately release it? Come on, Misty. Number 10. As it stands, Azuril is now the only Pokemon that Misty currently owns who isn't a water type. For some reason that we can't really explain, Azuril is a normal slash fairy type. Number 11. Misty Psyduck can't swim. A topic discussed heavily in the episode, the blue badge of courage. Number 12. Jesse and James released Arbok and Weezing in order to let them protect Ekans and coughing. What? No, oh, I'm not crying. Number 13. James's first Pokemon was a Growlithe, who, for some inexplicable reason, he gave up. Can you imagine how much more effective Team Rocket would be if James was running around with an Arcanine? Number 14. Jesse and James met at a Pokemon Technical Institute, an alternative school for trainers who don't want to collect gym badges. Unfortunately, Jesse and James both flunked out of Pokemon Tech, but we can't help but wonder what could have been. Number 15. Meowth's gift of gab comes with a cost. Our feline friend is unable to learn his signature move, Payday, because his ability to talk negates his ability to learn the move. Number 16. Appropriately, Meowth's first word was Rocket. I wish mine 
was Rocket, way cooler than Mama. Number 17. Meowth originally stayed at Team Rocket's headquarters with Giovanni, but was assigned to Jesse and James after he tripped on a wire and spilled Giovanni's coffee. Number 18. However, this Meowth story contradicts the Pokemon Chronicles episode, Training Days, where Meowth says he asked Giovanni to be made a field agent. I guess we will never know the truth about Meowth's origins, and if Giovanni needs more coffee. Number 19. Ash has lost at least one official gym battle in every region. In Kanto, he lost to Brock, Lieutenant Surge, Sabrina, and Blaine. He lost to Whitney in Johto, but let's be honest, with that mill tank, we all lost to Whitney in the games. Brawly in Hoenn, Rourke in Sinnoh, Lenora in Unova, and Viola and Wolfric in Kalos. That's a lot of losing. Number 20. Pikachu has had his fair share of WTF moves, including Rocket Punch, Static Jolt, Thunder Spark, Volt Tail, and Thunder Armor. Number 21. The episode Hocus Pokemon is the first time we see a human transformed into a Pokemon in the anime, which is strange considering Ash and the gang met Phil 200 episodes earlier. Number 22. Refresher for those who don't remember. In the Generation 1 games, Bill can be found in his lab near Cerulean City. However, when the player first meets Bill, he is a Pokemon due to a failed experiment. The anime overstepped this whole ordeal by just introducing us to Bill as the guy stuck in a Kabuto costume. Number 23. Ash's hat has gone through various design changes, but the original concept sketches show that his first hat was going to have a lightning bolt and the letter P on it. Number 24. Anytime you start Pokemon Red, Blue, or Yellow, you will watch a battle between Nidorino and Gang. And that same battle is also the first thing we see in the Pokemon anime. We also see Red watching footage of the battle in Pokemon Origins. Number 25. Ash's original hat is an official Pokemon League Expo hat, which he won from sending in postcards. Now you know what that L stands for. Number 26. Ash has gotten a new hat for each Pokemon series, and the tradition will continue with Pokemon Sun and Moon. Number 27. Ash has destroyed three bikes throughout his training career, Misty's, May's, and Dawn causing an estimated 3 million Poke Dollars worth of damage. Yep, in Pokemon Red and Blue, bikes cost 1 million Poke Dollars. Number 28. The act of Pikachu destroying a female companion's bike became a running gag in the anime at one point, but then stopped because Iris and Serena didn't own bikes. Number 29. In Pokemon Origins, Red's final team is made up of Jolteon, Persian, Scyther, Dodrio, Lapras, and Charizard. They were the same six Pokemon in Satoshi Tajiri's team during his first playthrough of Pokemon. Number 30. When he completed the Indigo League Championships, Ash's team consisted of Squirtle, Kingler, Pikachu, Pidgeotto, Bulbasaur, and Charizard. And now I'm beginning to understand why he didn't win. Number 31. In the anime, trainers must compete in and win a Pokemon League Championship in order to earn the privilege of battling the Elite Four. Number 32. The League Championship competition lasts eight rounds. The preliminaries consist of the top 256, top 128, top 64, and top 32. And then the final rounds consist of the top 16, top 8, top 4, and the top 2. Number 33. Ash has battled various Elite Four members, and it usually ends in him being beaten to a pulp. He's battled Lorele, Drake, Flint, Agatha, and Iris. Though it was before Iris was an Elite Four member. Number 34. Technically speaking, Ash has only beaten one Elite Four trainer, Koga. At the time of their battle, Koga was still just a gym leader. But in the Generation 2 games, we learn that Koga has been promoted to a member of the Elite Four. Number 35. In the Indigo League Championships, a trainer loses a battle if their Pokemon falls asleep. Sleep powder for the win, baby! Number 36. Gary couldn't resist battling Ash one more time, and the two duked it out for the final time in the season finale of Advanced Generations, where Gary won, going out on top. Number 37. In Pokemon Origins, we learn that Red got his name from his dad. His dad named him Red in hopes that when he grew up, he would have the passion and energy of a red hot fire. Because of his name, Red picks Charmander. Blue calls this move ridiculous and chooses Squirtle because of the tight matchup. Now that's ridiculous. Number 38. Being closer to the original game, Red has no long term companions, like Ash does. So unfortunately, no Brock or Misty hijinks. Number 39. Misty, being the
the water-based gym leader is obviously named after water, but this is only unique to her when it comes to her family, as her sisters Daisy, Violet, and Lily are all named after flowers. Number 40. Pokemon Adventures in the Orange Islands never aired in Finland. But don't worry, it's not like they're super bitter about it or anything. Number 41. Ash's Noctowl was the first shiny Pokemon to appear in the anime, and you know how I love shiny things. Number 42. The most famous shiny Pokemon, Red Gyarados, got an interesting backstory in the series. In the episode talking about an evolution, we learn that Team Rocket forced Magikarp to evolve early, and so Gyarados retained the red color of his pre-evolution. Number 43. Over 30 islands make up the Orange Island archipelago, including Cinnabar Island and the Seafoam Islands. Number 44. One of the islands is Pinkin Island, one that is inhabited by all pink Pokemon. On this island there are <gasps> Caterpie, Weedle, Pidgey, Pidgeotto, Rattata, both Nidorans, Nidoking, Vileplume, Paris, Parasect, Venonat, Diglett, Mankey, Primeape, Bellsprout, Dodrio, Executor, Rhyhorn, Rhydon, Electabuzz, Poliwhirl, Geodude, and Scyther. I guess you can go there if you need any Pinkymon. Number 45. The Orange Islands only appear in the anime and one issue of the manga. They are not accessible in any of the Pokemon games yet. Number 46. Okay, we're gonna take a couple of facts here to show some love to Ash's most underappreciated companion, Tracy Sketchit, because honestly, he deserves some love. First and foremost, for some tragic reason, Tracy has spent the least amount of time traveling with Ash, only accompanying him for 32 episodes. Chipped. Number 47. Tracy is the only one of Ash's friends who officially has a last name. If you've watched our 107 more facts about Pokemon, you know that there's speculation about Misty and Brock's last names. And if you haven't watched it, what are you waiting for? Number 48. Brock was dropped in the Orange Islands because the Japanese crew was fearful that Brock's character would appear racist because of his eyes. They were worried about complaints, so they created Tracy to replace Brock. Number 49. If you're wondering how Brock was able to return, it's because the crew realized that nobody really cared about his appearance and really liked Brock as a character. Not to dramatize it or anything, but basically, if Tracy wasn't there to patch the hole, the crew might not have ever realized their mistake. Number 50. According to storyboard artist Matsumitsu Hidaka, episodes are made six months in advance. It takes one week just to make a storyboard for each episode. Number 51. In case you were wondering, Ash's favorite move is Thunderbolt. What's your favorite move? Comment and let us know. Number 52. According to concept art tweeted out by Ken Sigimori, Brock wasn't originally supposed to be the first gym leader. It was instead going to be this unknown kid, who many people have speculated would have been a grass trainer. Number 53. Pokemon, the first movie, returned to theaters on October 29th and November 1st, 2016. And of course, Pikachu's vacation was also shown. Number 54. The original series is the longest running Pokemon series, with 274 episodes. That's pokey long. Number 55. Jesse went through 10 partners before settling down with James and Meowth. You know what they say, when it comes to finding the right match, 11 times the charm. Number 56. Team Rocket got their infamous Wobbuffet after Jessie accidentally traded her Lickitung away. In Tricks of the Trade, Jessie got bumped into a trading machine. Her Lickitung falls into the machine and it accidentally traded for a Wobbuffet. The Wobbuffet is the third most prevalent main Pokemon, appearing in over 511 episodes, after only Meowth and Pikachu. That's pretty prevalent. Number 57. Every great trainer has a rival. Ash has Gary, Serena has Shauna, and James has the Magikarp Salesman? Over the course of a couple episodes, the Magikarp Salesman has managed to trick James into buying a Magikarp, a Hopip, and into trading away his Victory Bell. Number 58. While Brock was adventuring in Johto, his mother turned the Pewter City Gym into a Water-type Gym. Brock then set the record straight by crushing his mom's Mantine with his Onyx. Number 59. Ironically, a few episodes later, Brock catches two Water-type Pokemon, a Lotad and and a Mudkip. Mama knows best. Number 60. In the very same episode, there is a now famous scene where Ash scans two Mudkip with his Pokedex. The moment has now become an internet sensation, spawning hundreds of YouTube videos with millions of views. There's even a 10 hour version so you can has Mudkips. Number 61. Speaking of Brock, he's kind of let his rock status go. From what we've seen, out of his nine Pokemon, only two are part rock type, and three of them are water type Pokemon. Number 62. Hilda and Hilbert, the character characters you play as in Pokemon Black and White and Black and White 2 were the first player characters who did not appear in the anime. Since then, we also haven't seen Nate and Rosa or Kaylin. 
Number 63. This could have something to do with the fact that Hilda and Hilbert are the oldest protagonists, beginning their Pokemon journey at 16 years old, compared to every other character starting who is roughly 10. Anime, why you gotta hate on the late bloomers? Number 64. Nate and Rosa were actually part of a special animated trailer for Black and White 2 that was also dubbed in English. Nate is seen getting his Pokemon and later engaging in several battles. Rosa is also seen battling and kicking butt with Superior. Number Number 65. When it comes to the main characters of the games, the guys have only made brief appearances. Ethan, Gold and Silver, starred in a special TV movie, The Legend of Thunder, although he goes by the name Jimmy in the special. Number 66. The TV movie was unique in the fact that it was the first time we got an anime special starring someone other than Ash, and it was also the start of the Pokemon Chronicles series. Just think, without the success of this three-parter, we may never have gotten the awesomeness that is Pokemon Chronicles. Number 67. Kind of a mini fact but absolutely worth mentioning. Once again, Finland was snubbed. For whatever reason, The Legend of Thunder was never aired there. Number 68. Ethan also appears at the start of the 13th movie Battling Ash, but as Ethan, not as Jimmy. This begs the question, are there two identical looking, identically dressed trainers in Ash's universe? What are they hiding? Number 69. At the beginning of Giratina and the Sky Warrior, Brendan and Lucas appear alongside each other, duking it out. Number 70. In in case you didn't realize it, Ash kind of has a thing for traveling with female protagonists. Mei is the playable character from Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Dawn is the hero of Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, and Serena is the leading lady of X and Y. He really knows how to pick them. Number 71. In the Dragon Master's path, Iris reveals that she wants to become a Dragon Master, a highly skilled trainer who can synchronize their heart with Dragon-type Pokemon. While we don't necessarily know if she achieved that goal, we do know that she is the Pokemon champion in Black and white too, so she probably got pretty close. Number 72. Misty is shown to have a deep phobia for bugs and bug type Pokemon, even screaming and running away at the presence of a Metapod. She doesn't hate all bug Pokemon though. She likes the ones she deems cute, like Ladybug and Butterfree. Number 73. While not official by any stretch of the imagination, you should probably know that some wonderful internet Samaritan organized a very convincing mega cut of Obama performing the Pokemon theme song. And if you haven't watched it yet, stop whatever you're doing and go soak in this viral video. Number 74. After long being absent in the anime, Pikachu's love for ketchup returns in the Pokemon X, Y, and Z series as a replacement credit sequence. First time I stay for the credits. I'll never look at ketchup the same. Number 75. In July 2015, trainers in Japan could visit 7-Eleven and receive an in-game version of Ash's Pikachu with his moveset from the X, Y series. Just in case catching your own Pikachu just didn't feel authentic enough. Number 76. If for whatever reason you haven't been keeping up with the anime, strap in, cause this is about to get crazy. We've briefly mentioned Ash's Greninja, but we haven't addressed the Donphin in the room. Ash's Greninja has an exclusive ability that we haven't seen from any other Pokemon in the anime, a special form called Ash Greninja. Number 77. We'll let the Pokemon company take it from here. They said Ash Greninja is the form that Greninja takes when the bond between it and Ash is raised to the limit. The the strength of their bond changes Greninja's appearance, and it takes on the characteristic look of Ash's attire. Number 78. This may sound ridiculous, but the idea of specialized forms has actually been something the games have been building towards. The story of Pokemon X and Y is centered around a trainer named AZ, and his Floette, whose form also changed to match AZ's. Pretty deep stuff. Number 79. If you're like me and can't get enough of Ash Greninja, players will have the opportunity to train their own Ash Greninja in Pokemon Sun and Moon. All you have to do is play the demo and you will have Ash Greninja by the time the game comes out. As if I needed an incentive to play the demo. Number 80. Easter egg alert! In Pokemon Sun and Moon, Ash Greninja's ID is 131017, which is a nod to October 17th, 2013, when Ash first caught his Froki. Number 81. Despite being his most used Pokemon, Ash has only won about 60% of his battles with Pikachu. Number 82. If we are using his record as a metric, Gudra is Ash's best Pokemon because he 
has never lost with it. Number 83. I know what you're thinking. Who is Ash's worst Pokemon? And it's actually a three-way tie between Noibat, Pidgeotto, and Lapras, who have a combined zero wins. Sorry guys, maybe next time. Number 84. If we played by video game rules of the eight gyms in Kanto, Ash only managed to win three, maybe even four badges. The Soul Badge, the Thunder Badge, the Volcano Badge, and for what it's worth, the Earth Badge. For every other circumstance, he's either won through strange circumstances, as was the case with the Boulder Badge and Marsh Badge, or just given the badge for doing something of worth, such as the Cascade Badge and Rainbow Badge. No wonder he didn't win the Indigo League there. To be fair, he would have beaten Misty to earn that Cascade Badge. Number 85. To this day, Ash has still never won a Pokemon League conference. Yeah, yeah, the Orange League, we'll get to that in a second. He's gotten better through the years, going as far as reaching top two for the Kalos League, but he still hasn't won, much to the dismay of his fans. Number 86. Ash won the Orange League after defeating Drake, but since there's no conference, all he got was a trophy, no special title. And poor Finland, they never got to see it. Number 87. Prepare for trouble and do it every time. The Diamond and Pearl series is the only season where Team Rocket appears in every episode. Number 88. On the day he began his journey, Ash Ketchum was exactly 10 years, 10 months, and 10 days old. Number 89. Since Ash's journey started on April 1st, that puts Ash's birthday at May 22nd. A new holiday for fans. Get those Ash cakes ready. Number 90. Ash spent 10 days trying to figure out his signature victory pose, before settling on his classic hand on the hip, other hand outstretched pose that we all know and love. Number 90. 91. According to the anime's creator, Brock falls in love with every girl he sees because he has some serious mommy issues. Awkward. He basically wants to find a new mother figure for his brothers. But Brock, your girl would be their sister-in-law, not their stepmom. It's gonna be okay. Number 92. In all fairness to Brock, due to a mistranslation from the Japanese version of the show, we were told that Brock's mother was dead in the English version of the showdown at Pewter City, only to find out she was alive in Pokemon Chronicles. Or so they want us to think. I'm on to you, Pokemon. We will solve this cartoon conspiracy. Number 93. Other than a couple of minor outfit changes for Brock, Serena is Ash's only companion to undergo a major design change. A little over halfway through the XY series, she gave herself a haircut. Number 94. 15 plus years of battling seems to have paid off, as our favorite little electric mouse has lost a ton of weight compared to how he looked in his first season. Realistically, it's probably only a pound or two, but for a Pikachu, that's a lot. Number 95. Masamitsu Hidaka said that the show will end when Ash becomes a Pokemon master. Well, then I hope he never does. Number 96. Until then, Pokemon Sun and Moon just premiered in Japan on November 17th, 2016. Number 97. The Pokemon Sun and Moon anime series is bringing Pokemon's biggest design change ever, which has been polarizing amongst the fans. Gone are the rigid, sharp lines of old, swapped out for a more softer, fun art style. So, Oh, hipster Pokemon? Number 98. If you're brand new to Pokemon and wondering why Ash is walking around with a measly Pikachu when he could have a Raichu, it's because Pikachu simply did not want to evolve. He was like, no thanks guys. But to be honest, Pikachu isn't measly. In fact, it's been proven that he's a lot stronger than other Pikachus. Meowth even admitted it. Number 99. Pokey scientists have debated for years why Ash's Pikachu is so special. Some scholars say it's because he was struck by lightning. Some say we have Brock's father to thank for supercharging Pikachu, and others think Pikachu just reached level 100 after taking down all those Spearows in the first episode. What do you think? Comment and let us know. Number 100. Although Red and Blue battle eight times throughout the course of Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue, Ash and Gary have only battled three times. The first fight between Ash and Gary was in the season finale to the Orange Islands, and was as classic as you would expect. Ash's Pikachu versus Gary's Eevee. It was a showdown just like the first battle in Pokemon Yellow, except for the part where Ash loses. Number 101. The second battle happened in the Indigo League Championships as a two-part slugfest that came down to Blastoise versus Charizard. After losing to Ash, Gary decided that he didn't want to be a trainer anymore and instead decided he would be a Pokemon researcher like his grandfather, Professor Oak. Maybe now the professor will remember his name. Number 102. Meowth learned to walk and talk by spying on etiquette classes in an attempt to impress a girl. Ah, the things we do for our crushes. Number 103. Unfortunately, a 
while walking and talking, Meowth terrified her. And so Meowth joined Team Rocket after being rejected. Hey, we all need our emotional outlets. Number 104. Along with his established moves, Pikachu is pretty good at improvisation. He's shown both mixing moves with other Pokemon and also making up some of his own. Number 105. Ash and Serena attended Professor Oak's Pokemon Summer Camp together. Oh, camp bonding. Number 106. Brock received his first Pokemon, Onyx, from his father as a present for his 10th birthday. Aww. Number 107. Who doesn't love tradition? Ash's Charizard always greets him with a warm, loving flamethrower to the face. Zubat, Primate, Meowth, Onyx, Geodude, Rapidash, Magneton, Snorlax, Gengar, Tangela, Goldeen, Spiro, Weezing, Seal, Gyarados, Slowbro. Let's continue our 107 facts journey with a handful of facts about the video games. Specifically, Pokemon Go, Sun and Moon, and Sword and Shield. For generations, Pokemon fans have been waiting for a chance to catch their favorite Pokemon in real life. And now they can. Well, kinda. Thanks to Pokemon Go. Taking over the world one country at a time, Pokemon Go touched the hearts of multiple generations of Pokemon fans with its augmented reality goodness. But how did such an ambitious game come to life, and how is it affecting our daily lives? I'm Adrian with the Leaderboard, and I'm here to guide you through 107 facts about Pokemon Go. Let's get started. Fact number one, Pokemon Go's origins date back to an April Fool's prank by Google and Nintendo in 2014. The idea was conceived by then Nintendo president Satoru Iwata and Tsunekazu Ishihara of the Pokemon Company, along with Tatsuo Nomura of Google Maps. Number two, dubbed the Pokemon Challenge, the prank, or rather the game, required players to find Pokemon hiding throughout Google Maps. Number three, the trailer for the Pokemon Challenge seems to serve the most inspiration for Pokemon Go. In the trailer, many individuals traverse a variety of landscapes to find different Pokemon hidden through their phones. Of course, the way to catch them is by throwing a Pokeball using their phones. Sounds familiar, right? Number four. While the Pokemon challenge was just a prank, players who managed to find all 151 first generation Pokemon received a business card with the job title Pokemon Master. You can tell there was some sort of seriousness involved with the game. I'm still mad I didn't get mine, but in my heart, I know I caught all 151. Number five. Pokemon Go development was officially revealed in September 2015. This was accompanied by a speech by Sunakazu Ishihara which was dedicated to the late Satoru Iwata, who helped conceive the original idea for the game. Number six, Pokemon Go was funded massively by Google, the Pokemon Company, and Nintendo, who together poured $30 million into the game's development. 30 million. Number seven, Pokemon Go's development was handled by Niantic. The company was responsible for the 2012 augmented reality game, Ingress. Number eight, John Hankey believes Pokemon Go can be bigger than popular MMOs. He said in an interview, I think we can be bigger than World of Warcraft. There are more mobile devices than gaming configured PCs out there. Number 9. The music you hear in Pokemon Go might sound a little familiar. That's because longtime Pokemon veteran Junichi Masuda composed music for the game. Number 10. Nintendo revealed that the music in the game is set to a fast tempo to encourage players to walk faster. Well, it sure is working for me. Number 11. You can thank Masuda for the easy to learn, hard to master capturing system in Pokemon Go. Love it or hate it, it's all you got to catch those Pokemon. Number 12. March 2016 was the start of the Japan only beta testing period, giving lucky Japanese players a chance to test out the game. This was followed by a slow beta testing rollout for international fans, expanding to Australia, New Zealand in April, and the United States in May. Number 13. Sadly for beta testers, the trial ended on June 30. And even worse, the Pokemon players captured during the beta test weren't saved for the actual release. Number 14. After waiting a long two weeks after the beta test, Pokemon Go was released in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand on July 6. This expanded to the United Kingdom on July 13, and 26 new countries on July 16. Number 15. Currently, only the original 151 Pokemon are planned to be catchable in Pokemon Go. However, the developers hope to one day expand the roster to the rest of the Pokemon generations. Sooner or later, I'll be able to catch my own Fennekin. Number 16. I say planned to be catchable, because as of this 107, currently six Pokemon are unavailable. Ditto, strangely enough, along with the legendary Pokemon Articuno, Zapdos, Moltres, Mewtwo, and Mew. Number 17. The catching gets tougher, as some Pokemon are even region exclusives. Currently discovered exclusives are Tauros for the United States, Kangaskhan for Australia, Mr. Mime in Europe, and Farfetch'd in Asia. Number 18. Pokemon Go took the world by storm and has been insanely popular among fans and non-fans as well. The game has been downloaded more than 15 million times in Apple's App Store and Google Play Store combined. Number 19. Investors took notice of Pokemon Go's popularity as well. Nintendo stock jumped nearly 25% over the release's weekend, giving the gaming giant its biggest rise in years, as well as a huge boost in its share prices. Number 20. As of July 14, 2016, Pokemon 
Pokemon Go is the biggest mobile game out there, beating out daily active users of Candy Crush Saga and Draw Something. Number 21. Not only is it the biggest mobile game, but it's also proving to be one of the biggest mobile apps. Pokemon Go is reported to have beat out Twitter and daily users, and even Facebook in engagement. Players spend an average of 33 minutes and counting in game, as opposed to Facebook's 22 minutes. Number 22. Apparently, Pokemon Go is also a good way to find dates. There are dozens of stories popping up on social media about people meeting while they're playing, and the misconnection section on Craigslist is full of messages from players. The app has also bypassed Tinder in terms of usability. Number 23. The Pokemon Go wave has affected nearly everyone, and we mean that. Some notable celebrities playing Pokemon Go include Josh Groban, the Jonas Brothers, Wiz Khalifa, Monica Lewinsky, Stephen Colbert, and Ruben Rivlin, the president of Israel. Somebody calls security. Number 24. Redditor The Stars Are Waiting even ran into The Daily Show host Trevor Noah while on a run to catch water Pokemon at Riverside Park. The people you meet on these Poke Runs, man. Number 25. Not only are celebrities dropping Pokeballs left and right, but politicians as well. During the 2016 campaign, Hillary Clinton reached out to young people by setting up one of her campaign events near a Pokestop. She encouraged supporters to use the lure module, get free Pokemon, and battle each other while registering to vote. What world do we live in? Number 26. Spotify streams of the Pokemon theme song Gotta Catch Em All also increased 362% worldwide, while streams of other Pokemon songs have more than tripled the amount than normal. Guess everyone needs a killer soundtrack while tracking down Pokemon. Number 27. Pokemon Go's release wasn't without problems. Due to the large amount of players downloading and playing the game, the game was plagued with server issues. Players were left with an unplayable game until the team could alleviate the server strains. Number 28. If your country doesn't have Pokemon Go yet, you can blame those stupid servers. Because of the unstable servers, Niantic paused the release of the game in other countries until they were comfortable fixing the constant issues. Number 29. Outside of the US and other countries where the game was officially released, users around the world have been trying to download Pokemon Go using an APK, bypassing the official app stores. The main source of these APK downloads saw its traffic go from roughly 600,000 visits on July 5 to over 4 million visits on July 6 alone. Number 30. Unfortunately, Nintendo isn't too keen on letting this happen. To avoid any problems, Nintendo has been issuing takedown notices left and right to limit the area players want to download. This is to avoid any problems in areas where the game hasn't fully released yet. Number 31. Pokemon Go also took flack from users wary of their personal information being stolen. Players who signed up using Google gave the app unrestricted access to their respective Google accounts on the iOS version of the game, which sparked questions regarding their privacy. Niantic have since fixed this issue, and the game no longer has unrestricted access to the information. Number 32. To nobody's surprise, Pokemon Go will kill your phone battery. The general estimate is that about three hours of on and off use can leave you without juice. Guess it's time to take an external battery on your Pokemon Go adventures. Number 33. There is a remedy to this, however. When you have battery server mode on, you can turn your phone upside down to darken your screen so it will no longer draw the map and put less strain on your battery life. Number 34. Like in the main Pokemon series, your character needs a starter Pokemon. Much like in Pokemon Red and Blue, the three starters you can choose from outright are Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle. Number 35. As a wise professor once said, the early bird gets the worm, or in this case, the Pokemon. But unlike Ash, who was forced to choose Pikachu, you can choose whether or not you want Pikachu as a hidden starter Pokemon. All you have to do is ignore poor little Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, and keep walking until Pikachu appears on the map. Number 36. The world is filled with Pokemon for you to catch, and not just in tall grass. Some Pokemon are based off of location, so if you want to catch water Pokemon easily, you best be near a body of water. Number 37. Pokemon show up mostly in densely populated areas. This is why trainers have bad luck finding Pokemon in large open fields, but tons of luck finding Pokemon in department stores. Number 38. Time of day is also important to the Pokemon in Pokemon Go. The time of the day influences what Pokemon you can catch. You're more likely to catch a Ghastly at night than during the day. However, don't rely on time of day to affect the amount of Pokemon you catch. Number 39. Having trouble finding your Pokemon of choice? Well, on the bottom right of the screen, you can check out the nearby feature implemented in the game. Pokemon distance is indicated by the amount of footprints it has, three being the farthest at 90 meters and above, and none being the closest at under 40 meters. Number 40. See those green leaves flying in the air? There might be Pokemon there. While not precise, heading that direction might bring up your chances of finding Pokemon. Number 41. Running out of items? Well, you can stop by your local Pokestop for more items. By visiting a Pokestop, you can acquire items such as Pokeballs, potions, and other wonderful goodies to use on your adventure. Number 42. Pokestops, which are littered all over the map, more so in densely populated areas, are based off of real landmarks, interesting spots, and other known locations. These little buggers are indicated by a light blue diamond in your in-game map. Number 43. Like Pokestops, Pokestops, gyms can be found scattered around the map. Unlike Pokestops, gyms are PvP areas that players can capture and defend from other players. Number 44. The teams in Pokemon Go act in a giant territory control game within the Pokemon Go community. The point
point is to push your team to control as many gyms as possible. Controlling gyms also give you the ability to get 10 free Pokecoins every 24 hours. Number 45. If it's a gym that your team's captured, you can head over there to train your Pokemon. Number 46. You can also leave your Pokemon at a gym to defend it against rival teams and hold on to that gym for your team. Number 47. Players can choose to associate themselves with one of three factions upon reaching level 5. These factions are Team Instinct, Team Mystic, and Team Valor, representing Zapdos, Articuno, and Moltres respectively. Number 48. These teams are also divided by color. Red, blue, and yellow. Sound familiar? Well, those are the same colors of the original Pokemon games for the Game Boy. Now, when are we going to get a green team? Venus or anyone? Number 49. The most popular team right now, and I stress right now, is Team Mystic. Go Articuno! You are totally the number one bird. Number 50. Fans tired of the cross-faction hostility have created a quote-unquote team dubbed Team Harmony. They are represented by Alugia, the legendary Pokemon known to have quelled the fighting between Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres in the movie Pokemon 2000. The so-called team also has a nice graphic made by DeviantArt's Seoxys 6. Number 51. We mentioned that the legendaries were currently unavailable to catch. However, since Niantic has a history of hosting special events for their previous game, Ingress, and allowed players to collect exclusive emblems for taking part, it's theorized that these special Pokemon will only be available during these public battles. So get ready to buy some plane tickets, or just incubate a serious number of eggs. Number 52. When asked whether live events are something that the game will do right off the bat, Hanky replied by saying, We haven't announced it yet, but I'd say that given the success of Ingress, it's a pretty safe bet. Number 53. Speaking of Ingress, Pokestops and gyms were based off of the Ingress map. Ingress, the augmented reality multiplayer game, was launched in beta by Niantic in 2011. Its users are responsible for helping create the data pool that determines where Pokestops and gyms appear in Pokemon Go. Number 54. The CEO of Niantic also believes that while the technology is not yet mature, the game will potentially be working with augmented reality goggles. Number 55. Boy, haven't we come a long way. Before there was Pokemon Go, there was geocaching. Started in 2000 by computer consultant Dave Ulmer, geocaching was a recreational activity of hunting for hidden objects by means of GPS coordinates posted on a website. Originally, he had left behind some CDs, a VHS tape, a slingshot, a book, a can of beans, and a logbook. It was a geek's guide to exercising, but without the possibility of catching a Gyarados. Number 56. You can't really cheat egg hatching. If you gotta walk 5 kilometers, you gotta walk 5 kilometers. Taking a train, bus, plane, or car will not trick the game, as it uses the pedometer on your phone to make sure you're on the straight and narrow. However, if there's a will, there's a way, and people have found the way. Number 57. While most people have already figured out that driving a car will not count towards your egg hatching, riding a bike or skating will. Any method of slow transportation works, even if you aren't stepping. So, a really slow car ride will also help you hatch eggs. Number 58. Exercise was one of the explicit goals to creating Pokemon Go. John Hankey even explained, a lot of fitness apps come with a lot of baggage that end up making you feel like a failed Olympic athlete. When you're just trying to get fit, Pokemon Go is designed to get you up and moving by promising you Pokemon as rewards, rather than placing pressure on you. Number 59. It's not all talk either. Preliminary data from the Cardiogram app for Apple Watch and the fitness tracking company Jawbone show that there's been an uptick in physical activity among users since the launch of the game. Number 60. There's always two types of people in this world. A lot of fans are figuring out ways to beat the game's physical exercise requirement. The reports of people using drones and ceiling fans to keep their phones moving and to get Pokemon creatures to appear. Tsk tsk. Number 61. While the trading feature shown in the announcement trailer has yet to be seen, John Hankey teased that trading will definitely come to Pokemon Go. That and bi-weekly updates to the game. So, uh, when trading comes, can somebody trade me a Dragonite? I can give you my favorite Pidgey. Number 62. The turn-based battle system is gone. It's been replaced by a faster system, utilizing swipes and taps to dodge an attack. Number 63. Putting weak Pokemon into gyms does no one any favors, except maybe yourself, you greedy Pokecoin hoarder. You might hold it for your team initially, but only until it's beaten by the opposition. You can't train it up or swap it out, so you're more likely to simply have it beaten and taken over, booting everyone out of the gym. Number 64. You want to work on getting up your team's prestige by battling, which is how gyms become higher level. In other words, by taking on friendly matches at a gym your team already owns, you're making that gym even stronger against future attacks from rival teams. Number 65. Just like in previous games, Pokemon Go allows players to have a type advantage over their opponents. Doing so will cause much more damage than normal. For instance, a single type advantage, such as a water attack against a ground type Pokemon, will be super effective. Sweet. Number 66. Look for Pokemon Go gyms on your map. If you're planning an outing, try the PokeGo map website. It's a massive database of user-reported Poke gyms and Pokestops. The site is constantly updated with new locations and information. Number 67. The levels of a gym indicate how many Pokemon you might potentially battle. If the gym is level 1, you've only got to fight one Pokemon. If it's level 2, then you've got to fight potentially two Pokemon. Number 68. If you want to take over a gym, that's a different story. Sure, you can defeat the gym once, but in order to take over the gym, you have to keep battling until the gym's prestige depletes to zero. Not only that, but you have
have to place Pokemon at the gym so that they can defend it from opposing factions. Number 69. Want to launch some of those special attacks? Once your special attack meter is charged, long press your Pokemon to perform a special attack. Special attacks cause large amounts of damage, far better than just viciously tapping. Number 70. Duplicate Pokemon can be sent to Professor Willow to get more candies, which are used for powering up and evolving other Pokemon of the same species. Always make sure to transfer the weakest version of each Pokemon. Number 71. Cherry berries, orange berries, Lepa berries, so many berries. But out of all the berries in the Pokemon series, only raspberries have made it into the game. In the main series of games, a raspberry has no effect when used, but it could be used as a crafting ingredient for the berry systems in the games. In Pokemon Go, raspberries improve your chances in catching a Pokemon. Number 72. Evolution shards have become all that people can talk about, or not. Evolution shards have been scrapped from the beta, instead being replaced by candies. The shards would have allowed trainers to evolve their Pokemon into more powerful forms, just as leveling up and evolution stones did in previous games. However, this feature has been shifted to candies, possibly referencing rare candies. Still, evolution shards, evolution. Number 73. Incense is made to be just for you. It works great if you want to wander around the city and make sure Pokemon come to you, or if you want to stay in a lure module and use incense and have Pokemon come to you and appear around you. That's a tip right there. Number 74. Dropping a lure module at a Pokestop will let Pokemon come to that Pokestop. It can also be used for making fast friends with any Pokemon Go trainers in the area. Your nickname will appear next to the lure module so others know who is nice enough to share the wealth. Number 75. The in-game shop gives players the opportunity to purchase items that they wouldn't normally find at a stop. For example, there are 20 packs of Pokeballs and upgrades to the storage unit available. Getting anything from the Poke Shop requires players to have the appropriate amount of gold. Purchasing gold runs between $1 up to $100. Number 76. Multiple users can see the same Pokemon spawn in the same spot at the same time, and multiple users can capture that same Pokemon at the same time. Number 77. The circles that you see overlapping wild Pokemon are more than just a target. You'll notice that they shrink and grow as you hold your Pokeball. When the circle is at its smallest, that's when your catch rate is the highest. Number 78. There's a device known as the Pokemon Go Plus that players can wear. The device senses nearby Pokemon and informs the wearer of their presence by vibrating and flashing. By pressing the button, a trainer can capture the Pokemon and view it later on their mobile device. In this way, users aren't forced to continually take out their phones to play the game. Number 79. It might be a bit tough trying to find a Pokemon Go Plus though. The craze caused the device to sell out online. Unless you go to eBay, where resellers are selling their pre-orders for ridiculous amounts. Number 80. You may have noticed the arc over your Pokemon's head and how it fills up when you power them up. This roughly corresponds to your Pokemon's level, or CP. The further over to the right the arc is, the more powerful your Pokemon is in relation to other Pokemon of the same species. Number 81. If you see purple leaves around a Pokestop, that means someone used a lure module on it. This not only causes the stop to generate more and better items, it also attracts wild Pokemon to it. If one's nearby, you should check it out right away. If you check my Pokemap out during lunchtime, it's filled with purpley Pokestops. Number 82. Even if your bag's full, you still get 50 experience points from each visit to a Pokestop, which is quite a small amount but can be very useful for leveling up when you first start. Number 83. Pokestops can be used multiple times. The icon will turn purple when you visited a Pokestop, but wait 5 minutes or so and you'll be able to access it again. Number 84. We know the game is still pretty buggy, but here's a tip. Once you catch Pokemon, don't move your camera, because there's a tendency for the game to freeze and you're gonna have to restart the app. Number 85. Always be aware of your Pokemon CP or combat power. It expresses how likely your Pokemon is to win in a fight. You can range your Pokemon display by CP so you can see who's the strongest at any given time. But remember, CP doesn't always mean it has a lot of HP. Number 86. You might also want to wait until you're level 9 to evolve your Pokemon. Once you hit level 9, you'll get something called a lucky egg, which gives you double the experience points. My suggestion is to catch a lot of pigs and evolve them while you have the lucky egg on. You get tons of experience points. Number 87. Caught an Eevee and wanted to evolve into your favorite Eeveelution? Well, a neat little trick involves nicknaming your Eevee. If you want a Jolteon, name it Sparky. A Vaporeon, name it Rainer. And a Flareon, name it Pyro. These were the names given to the Eevee brothers in the Pokemon anime. Number 88. Small businesses are monetizing on Pokestops and gyms located near them. One New York City pizzeria has seen a 75% boost in its business as a result of dropping a lure. Number 89. Huge Inc. has also started experimenting with Pokestops. Their Atlanta location is home to the Huge Cafe, which is located between two Pokestops. They activate lures throughout the day to encourage players to catch Pokemon near their location. They plan on seeing the effectiveness applying game mechanics in the real world has on businesses. Number 90. The effects of Pokestops has led to businesses to seek sponsorships with Pokemon Go. McDonald's will be the first sponsored locations for Pokestops. Number 91. T-Mobile announced that it's thanking its customers with free, unlimited data for Pokemon Go for a whole year. On top of that, 250 people will eat 
each win $100 in Pokecoins, and five people will win a Pokemon Go hunting trip anywhere in the US for themselves and a guest. Number 92. Looking for a room to rent or a house to buy? While some real estate agents are using proximity of Pokestops and gyms to sell houses. One advertisement in New York pitches, we live above a Pokestop, so if you're an aspiring Pokemon Go master, unlimited raspberries, go crazy. Number 93. Players can now request Pokestop and gym locations. Just simply go to the Pokemon Go support page, fill out a form to submit your request, and even attach a photo. Just don't make my house a Pokestop. Number 94. These forms also allow players to report the means of unwanted landmarks. Police stations have already warned players not to go to their locations for Pokestops. Number 95. Memorials and cemeteries are also pushing against Pokestops to be on their sites. Officials at the Holocaust Museum and Poland's Auschwitz Memorial are calling on Pokemon Go maker Niantic to take Pokestops off their location, saying it dishonors Holocaust victims. Remember, there's a place for everything, folks. Be mindful of where you're catching your Pokemon, please. Number 96. Reports of trespassing to get to Pokestops has led to serious arrests and even death. In Germany, police arrested a suspect who was wanted for evading a prison sentence after he was out venturing with his friends to catch Pokemon. Number 97. On July 15, two California men fell off the edge of an ocean bluff while playing Pokemon Go. They both suffered from moderate injuries, which goes to show that being aware of your surroundings is super important when playing the game, especially if there might be a Gyarados in front of you. Number 98. On July 8, 19-year-old Chayla Wiggins was trying to find a water Pokemon in a location that sounds like the perfect place for them, near a river in Riverton, Wyoming. While scanning the area, Wiggins discovered what turned out to be a body floating in the water and called 911. Wiggins told Kotaku that because she quit playing to dial 911, she never did find the Pokemon she was looking for. Priorities, man. Priorities. Number 99. Four suspects in O'Fallon, Missouri allegedly used Pokemon Go to lure at least 11 users into a trap. The suspects set locations on the app where players could find wild Pokemon. They then allegedly mugged them when they arrived at the location, stealing phones and personal belongings. Number 100. A perk to the crime rate? Well, it's making police's jobs a whole lot easier catching criminals with warrants. Some police stations are requesting gyms nearby to lure in criminals with warrants. One instance occurred at the Milford Police Station when a criminal arrived in his pajama pants and t-shirts seeking a gym, but was arrested for his long criminal record, so you can catch them all. Number 101. Pokemon Go players all over the internet have been claiming that the app is sending them to the strangest places. There have been reports of Pokestops and gyms inside graveyards, behind strip clubs, at London's MI5 security agency headquarters, in toilets, and inside places of worship. One user discovered that his home was listed as a gym, and noticed several people parking outside his gate. Number 102. If you thought living in the suburbs was bad for Pokemon Go, wait till you live in South Korea. Currently, the only place that people in South Korea can play Pokemon Go is in the remote city of Sokcho. It's been dubbed the Pokemon Go Holy Land, and players have flocked to the city to get a taste of the game. Number 103. There are Pokemon gyms at the White House and the Pentagon. Maybe the next president will be determined by Pokemon battles. Number 104. Turns out, the Pokemon aren't afraid with tampering with the extraterrestrial. Quite recently, the gaming channel Frag Hero went out to Area 51 only to find empty gyms and a bunch of interesting catches. There, they caught Sand Slash, Abra, Ponyta, and of course, Pikachu. No Mewtwo though? What a waste. Number 105. However, as far as real space goes, NASA confirmed that astronauts can't hunt Pokemon aboard the International Space Station. Although they have smartphones, they only use them for research and not scoping out for Deoxys. <laughs> nerds. Number 106. Despite the negatives, parents are using Pokemon Go to practice wellness with their children. Rather than existing solely as a game, Pokemon Go is being used as a way to engage in social events and family activities. Number 107. Pokemon Go is having big positive impacts on mental health by combating issues with depression, anxiety, and even agoraphobia. Pokemon Sword and Shield is out and I gotta tell you, I am very excited to be a silly little Scottish girl roaming the British countryside, training sheep to fight dragons. It's gonna be awesome. Oi, I'm Mads with a leaderboard, and we're here today to take a deep dive into Pokemon Sword and Shield. We've gathered 107 facts about what's been added and removed from the upcoming Pokemon games. And they only got me to host this because I'm British. Literally the only reason. Oh, and I like Pokemon. Alright, for our first fact, it was believed that Game Freak didn't include any other starter Pokemon from the previous games except for the Charmander line. However, people have since discovered that the other starters from the Kanto region are actually in the game. Trust me, I, I would have been very upset if they weren't there. Number 2. Okay. I've calmed down a little. The new Pokemon region is Galar, and like most Pokemon regions, Galar's Pokemon draw inspiration from the real world. Galar is based on the United Kingdom, so you can find lots of references to the UK in the new Pokemon. 
Number 3. Stepping up to the role of art director is James Turner, who has previously designed several Pokemon such as the slightly controversial Vanilla Evolution line, as well as Phantops line and several Ultra Beasts. Because of his English background, Turner was consulted about the region even during early stages of the game's development. Number 4. Let's talk Pokemon. The new Fire-type starter, Scorbunny, uses its powerful legs to run around and generate heat. Its feet become hot, but it also stores fire in its Fire Sack, which acts like its second heart. When Scorbunny is full of flames, it increases all its physical abilities. Number 5. The new Grass-type starter, Grookey, he's the best by the way, has a special energy in its body that it can channel through its stick. When it bangs its stick to make music, the sound has the power to heal nearby plants or, as director Shigeru Omori states, instills life. Number 6. The new Water-type starter, Sobble, is already famous for being a crybaby, but did you know its tears are actually contagious? A crying Sobble will make other people and Pokemon cry around it. When it comes to making people cry, Sobble's tears are as powerful as a hundred onions. Number 7. According to director Shigeru Omori, Scorbunny was energetic and Grookey set the mood. They wanted a more subdued Pokemon, which inspired Sobble. He also thinks that people who pick Sobble are kind and caring. Number 8. The Galarian starters all take cues from UK pop culture. Scorbunny's evolution line is based on sports, from football or soccer to track. Sobble's evolution line is modeled after spies like James Bond, and Grookey's evolution line is inspired by music culture. Number 9. Of the three starters, James Turner likes Sobble the most, Shigeru Omori likes Grookey the most, since he likes to party, <laughs> and producer Junichi Masuda considers Scorbunny his favorite. Number 10. One of the easiest UK references to spot in the new Pokemon, Yampa, which looks a lot like a Pembroke Welsh Corgi, the Queen's favorite loaf of bread, and, apparently, the New York Post's hottest dog of 2019. Number 11. Yampa will also catch Pokeballs that fail to capture a wild Pokemon. This means you could use an expensive Ultra Ball on a wild Pokemon and, even if you miss, Yampa will return the ball to you. That's really cool. Number 12. Corviknight and its evolution line are based on common ravens which are native to Britain. Ravens supposedly protect the Tower of London and the Crown. There's a superstition that if the Tower of London ravens are lost or fly away, the Crown will fall and Britain with it. Number 13. Corviknight is a flying steel type Pokemon and is more than just the Skarmory 2.0. It actually plays an important role in the public transportation system in the Galar region. It's used as a flying taxi to fly from town to town, replacing the TM Fly from earlier games. Its character design could even be a reference to the silhouetted bird used in the Fly animation from past games. Number 14. Similar to Alola, the Galar region is host to different forms of old, familiar Pokemon. These are known as Galarian forms, and similar to Alolan forms, these Galarian forms differ in both looks and typing. Number 15. The new Grass-type Pokemon, Gossiflower, which evolves into Elder Goss, is a rare healing-focused Pokemon. Its ability, Regeneration, heals damage any time it's switched out of battle. Its nutritious seeds are also said to have healing properties. Number 16. If you combine the names of Gossiflower and its evolution, Elder Goss, you get Elderflower, which is a common wild plant and popular flavor in British cuisine. Elder Goss also looks a lot like a thistle, which has been used as a symbol for Scotland and the Stewart family. Number 17. While on his UK trip, Shigeru Omori heard the legend that if you catch a floating cotton ball, you will have good fortune. This was used as inspiration for Gossiflower. Number 18. In the Galar region, a Farfetch can evolve into Surfetched, who looks like a knight ready to protect the royal family. Surfetched has the signature move, Meteor Assault. The move works similar to Giga Impact, it delivers a big hit on the first turn and requires Surfetched to rest on the next turn. Number 19. If you're into ancient history, Stonehenge finally gets its own Pokemon, in the form of Stonejourner. The Pokemon resembles a section of the ancient monument. Number 20. In the 18th century, the Industrial Revolution caused an energy to go boom. Game Freak gave Weezing an Industrial Revolution makeover. The Galarian form of this Pokemon has smokestacks on its heads, which also looks a lot like top hats. You know, to uh, drive home the English stereotype. Thanks, Game Freak. Number 21. While the classic Weezing was a pure poison type, the new Galarian Weezing has poison slash fairy typing, giving it extremely high defense against fighting, bug, and dragon attacks. Though its smoke may look like toxic pollution, the smoke that emits from its hat is actually purified steam. Number 22. In keeping with the pollution theme, the Pokemon Roly Coley's evolution line is, well, coal. Seriously, it only evolves into more coal. Roly Coley has a new signature ability called Steam Engine that gives it a speed boost after it's hit with fire or water attacks. Until about 100 years ago, every house in the Gala region had a Roly Coley to handle their cooking and heating needs. Number 23. The Generation 2 Pokemon, Corsola, makes an appearance in Sword and Shield as Galarian Corsola. Unlike its pink counterpart, the Galarian Corsola is white and grey, and it's a ghost type, referencing bleached or dead coral. Coral bleaching is actually a real world problem caused by pollution, and what a bleak way to end this section of pollution inspired Pokemon. Number 24. The new Galarian ghost type Pokemon, Poltygeist, references Britain's love for tea. 
Thank you, Game Freak. Poltegeist? Jeez. Poltegeist is based on black tea. They reproduce by spreading into non-living tea and then splitting its liquid up into smaller containers. Its teapot is not part of its body and can be shed in battle using the ability Weak Armor. Number 25. Another new food-based Pokemon, Applin, along with its evolution line, looks like an apple. Its final form, Apple Tunt, looks like an adorable apple pie. Number 26. To keep with the food theme, the new fairy-type Pokemon, Alcremie, is based on strawberries and cream, a popular dessert in the UK. Alcremie has the ability Sweet Veil, which allows it to temporarily blind its opponent with a sweet-smelling cream so it can make its escape. Number 27. Alcremie also comes in different flavours, its alternative flavour giving off a minty vibe with cookies in its... hair? as opposed to berries? Um, what is this? Number 28. Obstagoon, which evolves from Galarian's Linoon, represents the UK's rock culture. I know it looks like a member of KISS, which is an American band, but it's probably because KISS has one of the most recognisable looks from that genre. Thank you for joining me in my mental gymnastics trying to justify this fact. Number 29. Joining the countless ranks of Pikachu clones, we have the new electric dark type Pokemon, Morpeko. It can switch between two forms, full belly mode and hangry mode. When it's in full belly mode, its move Aura Wheel is electric type, but in hangry mode, it switches to dark type. Interestingly, the word hangry was only added to the Oxford English Dictionary last year. It means hungry and angry if you didn't already know that. Number 30. On October 5th, the Pokemon Company hosted a live stream inside the Glimwood Tangle area of Galar. And it was during that live stream that Galarian Ponyta was revealed. The Galarian Ponyta is a unicorn that comes with a fluffy tail or no tail at all, depending on its gender. Number 31. The curious new Pokemon Impitimp is the first ever Pokemon to have a dark and fairy typing. This grants it full immunity to both dragon and psychic type attacks, and very strong resistance to dark attacks. Impidimp trolled the Glimwood Tangle livestream by obscuring the view of Galarian Ponita before it got officially revealed. Number 32. The new normal type and fan favourite Pokemon, Wooloo, was one of the first Galar Pokemon to be revealed. Wooloo's fur is so fluffy that it halves damage from any attack that makes contact. However, this fluffy fur causes it to take double damage from fire attacks. It's obviously inspired by all the bloody sheep we have here. Number 33. The new water slash rock type Pokemon Dreadnought has powerful jaws and access to strong jaw ability, which increases the power of biting type attacks. This includes moves like Crunch, Bite, Fire Fang, Ice Fang, and Thunder Fang. Number 34. The new water slash flying type Pokemon Cramorant has an ability called Gulp Missile, where it can swallow a fish after using Dive or Surf. It will then spit the fish as a counter attack when it's hit. Sometimes it will even spit out a Pikachu, which is hilarious. This is one of the first times we've actually seen a Pokemon eat another animal on screen in a Pokemon game. Number 35. The new legendary Pokemon, Zacian, holds a powerful sword in its mouth. Its name seems to be a play on the word cyan. Its color scheme consists of cyan, yellow, and magenta, colors that are typically used as ink in the printing process. Number 36. The new legendary Pokemon, Zamazenta, can block any attack with its shield around its mane. Its name seems to be a play on the word magenta, and its color scheme is slightly darker than Zacian's. Number 37. Junichi Masuda said that if Zamazenta picked up Zacian's sword and held it in its mouth, it would become the most powerful Pokemon in the world. He was probably joking, but still, could you imagine? Number 38. Turner had two goals for the Gala region. First, he wanted to convey the beauty of the UK, and second, he wanted to capture the smaller details of a region, so it didn't seem like a rough interpretation. Number 39. One of the artists paying close attention to the details were the signposts on roots. They originally had a medieval or fantasy design, but Turner requested they look more modern instead. Number 40. The Galarian Pokemon Center designs are partially inspired by the pubs the designer Shigeru Omori saw while visiting the UK. The idea behind using pubs was that they were places that people could gather together. Number 41. Omori's visit to Windermere, England gave him the idea for the first town in Sword and Shield with all the sheep and stacked stone walls. Number 42. The team couldn't make everything realistic. Unlike the UK, Galar includes more extreme locations to make the region more fun. Number 43. If you needed more evidence of all the UK influence, the shape of Gala is basically that of the UK, just flipped upside down. Number 44. When Sword and Shield's region and player characters were revealed, fans took a liking to the female player character, with some even making videos of her as an angry Scottish girl. Hey, uh, editor, can you, uh, can you show the memes? Number 45. Speaking of the player characters, the canon male character's name is Victor, while the female character's name is Gloria. Number 46. As with Pokemon games since Gen 6's X and Y, there's a major new feature in Sword and Shield called Dynamax. A Dynamax Pokemon can have very different battle mechanics than its normal counterpart. When a Pokemon Dynamax ability is activated, it grows into a towering Goliath gaining stat increases and powerful new moves. You can begin to Dynamax your Pokemon once you've collected the key item called Dynamax Band. 
Number 47. Unlike Sun and Moon, where you can Mega Evolve and use Z moves, Dynamax replaces both of those as Sword and Shield's signature game changing gimmick. Number 48. When your own Pokemon use Dynamax, the effect will only last for 3 turns. When a Pokemon is Dynamaxed, all of its moves become max moves. These moves typically have lingering effects, such as changes to the weather or terrain. Number 49. When Pokemon Dynamax, they aren't really growing in size, unfortunately. They're actually becoming more like a giant holographic projection. Number 50. Unlike Mega Evolutions and Z moves, Dynamax Pokemon can be found outside of trainer battles, making it possible to encounter wild Dynamax Pokemon in max raid battles. Number 51. Wild Dynamax Pokemon can create barriers around them that need to be taken out by attacking a certain number of times. You can only begin to chip away at the Pokemon's HP once the barrier is resolved. Number 52. Wild Dynamax Pokemon can cancel out of the abilities of a player character's Pokemon. Number 53. If you catch a Wild Dynamax Pokemon, there's a chance it can have a hidden ability. Number 54. A special version of Dynamaxing known as Gigantamaxing not only makes the Pokemon larger, but also transforms its looks. Number 55. As a special early bonus, you can get a Meowth that can Gigantamax as a mystery gift by choosing the Get Via Internet option. Number 56. If you have any play history with Let's Go Pikachu, you will also be able to receive a Pikachu that can Gigantamax. Gigantamax Pikachu bears a strong resemblance to his slightly chubbier Pikachu design from Red, Blue, and Yellow days. Number 57. The same goes for folks who have Let's Go Eevee game history on their Switch, except they will receive an Eevee that can Gigantamax. Number 58. The three special Pokemon I just mentioned may be able to Gigantamax, but they won't be able to evolve. Number 59. Pokemon in this game appear in the overworld, much like how they did in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. The game may still have random encounters, but all random encounters come with an exclamation mark alert. If you react to the exclamation mark alert in time, you can avoid the battle altogether. Number 60. The wild area is a new feature in Pokemon Sword and Shield, where trainers can explore a vast open world of interconnected wilderness. It also features dynamic weather conditions, including sunshine, rain, and thunderstorms. And that means you'll find different Pokemon depending on the weather. Number 61. The wild area was inspired by the vast landscapes of the UK that director Shigeru Omori saw when he was doing interviews for Sun and Moon. He saw the lakes, rivers, and towns in the distance while riding a train. Number 62. It's a simple feature, but one I've personally wanted for a long time. While in the wild area, you'll be able to freely control the camera with the right analog stick. Number 63. The concept behind a singular large wild area as opposed to traditional routes was this idea of returning to a familiar place and spawning differences every time you came back. Number 64. When they say large, they actually mean it. The wild area is roughly the size of two regions within Breath of the Wild. Number 65. The team's need for a large enough area to include multiplayer also played into the decision of the creation of the wild area. Whilst in the wild area, you'll be able to access multiplayer features at any time to interact with other players. Number 66. You can also trade and battle with strangers that you connect within the wild area using the Ycom feature. Number 67. You'll be able to set up a camp in the wild area where you and your friends can hang out with your Pokemon outside of their Pokeballs. Number 68. While camping, you'll be able to make curry for your Pokemon in a minigame that's reminiscent to the Poffin making minigame from the fourth generation of Pokemon games. Why curry? Well, it's a popular dish here in the UK. Number 69. Pokemon Sword and Shield is the first game in the series that lets the player eat meat. Yeah, seriously. You can put sausage in curry. No, I don't know what kind of sausage, don't ask me! Number 70. Pokemon can also have jobs in the Gala region and are often employed alongside humans, which kind of reminds me of Rhyme City from Detective Pikachu. In Sword and Shield, trainers can send their own Pokemon off on poker jobs, which allows them to earn experience and rewards. Number 71. When asked if Pokemon are sentient, Sword and Shield's director Shigeru Omori said, They're just getting by. They're just living. Same here, Omori. Same here. Number 72. In the Galar region, Pokemon battles are a popular spectator sport. Gym leaders and champions are celebrated like famous athletes. The numbers on their jerseys use a form of Japanese wordplay called Garaways, which means each number has a meaning. Number 73. Milo is the new grass type gym leader, and he looks like he's been eating his vegetables like Popeye. His league number is 831, meaning vegetable. Number 74. Nessa, well known for being stuck in your Twitter timeline, is an expert water type gym leader. She's athletic and competitive, but maintains a calm, cool, and collected demeanor. Her league number is 049, meaning to swim. Number 75. Sword and Shield is the first in mainline Pokemon games to feature exclusive gym leaders. Gym leader B is exclusive to Pokemon Sword, and the spooky little shy guy looking dude is a ghost type gym leader named Alistair, and he is exclusive to Pokemon Shield. B's league number is 193, which means to fight, whilst Alistair's league number is 291, meaning hateful. Number 76. This game's answer to Professor Oak is Professor Magnolia. Her research focuses on the Dynamax phenomenon. Her name is the first in the main series to be a plant instead of a tree. Number 77. Sonya is the granddaughter to Professor Magnolia. She's also the childhood friend of the champion, Leon. 
Number 78. Chairman Rose is the chairman of the Gala Pokemon League, as well as the president of a large business conglomerate. It's hard to tell if this guy is a millionaire with a heart of gold like Steven Stone, or if he's a more sinister CEO like Lysander. Number 79. Chairman Rose has endorsed one of your rivals, Bede, to take on the gym challenge. Bede also seems to have other plans outside of a competition. Could he be connected to the game's villain? That's my guess, that kid. Number 80. Oliana is Chairman Rose's secretary, who is largely in charge of running his day-to-day -day business operations. I don't trust the one bit guy, she's scary. Number 81. The champion of the Gala region is the trainer named Leon. His partner Pokemon is a Charizard, which I guess is why Charizard is the only starter that got included. Leon's younger brother is named Hop, and he's one of your rivals. He dreams to be a champion someday, just like Leon. His league number is 189, which can be translated to leaping. Number 82. Marnie is another one of your rivals. Her league number is 960, which can either be read as hardship or black. Number 83. Team Yell, the villainous team for this gen, are super fans of Marnie. They'll do whatever it takes to help her become champion. They also appear out of nowhere, it seems, to cheer Marnie on in battle. Some people have suggested that Team Yell represents a toxic fan base, but take it as you will. Number 84. Sword and Shield introduces the very first dark type gym leader in the main series. Its gym leader also has their own main theme, and it's amazing. Number 85. Due to a statement by Shigeru Omori, during an interview with Game Informer, it was once believed that there was going to be 18 gyms in the Gala region. However, this was a misunderstanding. People will only ever face 8 gyms, but because of a version exclusive gyms in each game, the total gyms between games is 18, rather than 18 unique gyms per game. Number 86. Pokemon Sword and Shield has a feature called Battle Stadium, which lets you connect with others online to battle with either your own team or a rented team of Pokemon. Number 87. This time, you can play ranked battles online and slowly make your way up the ranks. Similar to a lot of other games, you'll be paired against trainers of a similar ranking. Improving your rank will increase the tier. The final tier is the Master Ball tier. Once you've maxed out your ranking, you'll only face off against the strongest trainers. Your ranking will reset at the end of each season, but a portion of your ranking will carry over to the new season. Number 88. You'll receive rewards for participating in online battles. For example, you can get a Pearl String as a reward for completing several consecutive battles. Number 89. You can use the Pokemon Home smartphone app to view more detailed information about the battle study and participants. Number 90. You can play in casual battles where anything goes. You can even use banned legendaries. Number 91. You can participate in official online competitions. If you do well enough, you can be invited to the Pokemon World Championships in real life. That's so cool! Number 92. You can upload your own rental teams and easily rent teams from other players. All you have to do is enter a 14-digit ID code, which sounds easy. Friend codes all over again? Number 93. You can even battle against other players in ranked battles using rental teams, which means even if you don't have top shelf Pokemon yourself, you can still stand a chance in the competitive meta. Number 94. With a surprise trade feature, you can put Pokemon up for trade, and the game will automatically find a training partner in the background while you continue to play. Number 95. Max raid battles are a new co-op multiplayer experience in Pokemon Sword and Shield. They allow up to four players to fight against one Dynamax Pokemon. Number 96. XP share is baked into Pokemon Sword and Shield. In past games like in X and Y and Sun and Moon, you'd have to use an item to share XP across your party, but now it happens by default. Number 97. There are no HMs in Pokemon Sword and Shield. They were absent from Sun and Moon, and I don't think anyone will really miss them. Number 98. A new system in Sword and Shield allows players to modify the invisible stats that determine a Pokemon's viability. Mints were also added to the game to change Pokemon's personality or nature something that was never possible in previous Pokemon games. The goal was to allow players to make any Pokemon viable, even if it's the first one they caught of a species. Number 99. Pokemon Sword and Shield is the first game of the series to include an autosave feature. You can still save your game like normal, but if you power off without saving, you'll have a recent autosave to load into. Number 100. Pokemon trainers in the Gala region can make custom trading cards of themselves. You can make your own card of a Pokemon Center, and you can even get cards based on gym leaders. Afterwards, you'll be able to trade your personal card with other players. Number 101. Card customization allows you to change the background, frame, and even your trainer's pose. Your card is displayed during Link battles, so make sure it looks good. Number 102. Over 250 Pokemon are confirmed to appear in the Gala Pokedex. Unfortunately for some fans, the new games will not come with a national Pokedex. However, the Pokemon company has confirmed that all the Pokemon cut from this game will appear in future games. Number 103. The game initially faced harsh backlash after it was revealed that you can't capture the entire back catalogue of Pokemon. You will only be able to import old Pokemon that could be captured normally in the Gala region. 
Number 104. Pokemon director Junichi Masuda has said that these cuts were made to balance gameplay and conserve resources for high quality animations, which proved to be a controversial statement among the fanbase. Number 105. This will be the first mainline Pokemon game to appear on home consoles. According to a Game Informer interview, Game Freak essentially had to double the amount of staff working on Sword and Shield, going from around 100 people to 180 to 200. Number 106. Composers Monaku Adachi and Go Ichinos return for Sword and Shield. However, this time around, they're not the only ones making music for the game. Toby Fox, creator of Undertale, is a guest composer for Sword and Shield. Yes! He recently composed music for another Game Freak IP, Little Town Hero. Can you believe this man started making music for a mother fan game and is now working with Nintendo? Here's to hoping for another Megalovania. Number 107. This time around, the Pokemon's cries will sound as if they're living creatures, which means this may be the first Pokemon game in 20 years where you never hear this sound. 20 years since the original Pokemon Red and Green, Game Freak has come out with the latest and greatest Pokemon adventure for Pokemon trainers everywhere. With a tropical setting and a ton of new companions, the release was a highly anticipated one for many Nintendo 3DS owners. Alola everyone, my name's JD with the leaderboard, and we're here to check out the newest generation of Pokemon, and the changes to all our old favorites. So get ready, because we've got 107 facts about Pokemon Sun and Moon. Let's get started. <laughs> Number 1. To get this one out of the way at the start, the Pokemon Sun and Moon games were created by Japanese developer Game Freak, the same team that's worked on every main entry in the Pokemon series since the original Pokemon Red, Green, and Blue. Aside from their never-ending devotion to the Pokemon franchise, Game Freak has also developed games like Pulse Man, Yoshi, and more recently, Tembo the Badass Elephant. Sounds like Game Freak is badass. Number 2. Pokemon Sun and Moon contains the 7th generation of Pokemon. Seems like just yesterday there were only a measly 151. No, missing no doesn't count. Number 3. The game takes place in the previously unexplored region of Alola, a Pacific Island environment based on the real Hawaiian Islands. More like Aloha. Number 4. The team at Game Freak strove to make Alola as close to Hawaii as a colorful Pokemon invested world could be, so they took a trip to the USA's 50th state itself to study the landscape for the utmost authenticity. They should make every game take place in a Hawaiian-like setting. More time to relax on the beach, surf, and partake in a luau. Number 5. Pokemon Sun and Moon was teased three years before its unveiling in Pokemon X and Y. In the game, you can meet a mysterious backpacker who will give the player a scene seemingly useless item known as the Strange Souvenir, which comes from a foreign region that players have never experienced before in the games. The souvenir looks like a miniature tiki of Hawaiian culture, which is clearly a huge hint towards Sun and Moon's region, Alola. Number 6. Alola has its own challenge that serves as a Pokemon trainer's rite of passage, known as the Island Challenge. Each of the four islands contains its own trial, run by a trial captain. Unlike the gym leaders of old, you'll need to do more than just battle against the trial captains. There's a variety of challenges, from testing your knowledge, to finding a specific set of items. And let's just say, finding these items won't be as simple as go to Viridian City and get Oak's parcel from the Pokemart. Number 7. At the end of each trial, you're met with what is known as a Totem Pokemon, a much bigger, more powerful version of a Pokemon that you can find in the wild. To make matters worse, Totem Pokemon can call upon other Pokemon to aid in battle, making it even stronger than it already is. How's that even fair? Number 8. Each of Alola's islands is led by a political leader known as a Kahuna. Each island's Kahuna is chosen by Pokemon that are guardian deities. Number 9. The final trial of each island harkens back to the gym leader challenges of old, pitting the Pokemon trainer against the Kahuna leader of the island that you're currently attempting to pass. You're only able to move on to the next island after besting the Kahuna. Number 10. Each island has a trial captain, a trainer that has previously passed the island challenge and has been chosen to help newer trainers do the same. But like the Kahunas, there's four of them, each of them specializing in a specific type of Pokemon. Number 11. Lana is a trial captain that specializes in water type Pokemon. She's very dedicated dedicated to her family, watching over and taking care of her younger sisters. Captain Malo is a grass type expert with expertise in cooking. Captain Sophocles' go-to type is electric, which is fitting seeing as he's a mechanic that has built many machines. Last but not least is Kiawe, a trainer with a burning passion for fire Pokemon. His favorite is his Alolan Marowak, which he has studied and practiced traditional Alolan dances with. Number 12. The official artwork for Captain Sophocles has a fourth wall breaking easter egg. If you look at Sophocles' shirt, it features a print of a Nintendo Game Boy connected to a link cable. The original Waze trainer would trade Pokemon starting with Pokemon Red and Blue, which came to an end with the advent of wireless communication. Does this mean Pokemon exists as a game within the world of Pokemon? Number 13. Much like Pokemon X and Y, you're able to customize your player as opposed to either choosing a base male or female character like in previous games. You can choose your trainer's skin and hair color. Number 14. You're able to even choose your trainer's outfit with a variety of clothing options to choose from. Found a shirt with a cool design but wish it were blue instead of red? Wish granted. So long as you have the proper color dye to do so. You can even change your eye color with interchangeable changeable contact lenses. Number 15. Pokemon Sun and Moon operate like two different time zones. While Sun's time is determined by your Nintendo 3DS's internal clock, Moon's time
time will always be 12 hours ahead of the system's internal clock. Number 16. Do you wish Nintendo made a Pokemon Snap 2? Well, they aren't making it, but Game Freak is bringing something of a spiritual successor to the N64 classic in Sun and Moon. Introducing the Poke Finder, a mode that allows players to snap pictures of wild Pokemon throughout set locations in Alola. Much like Pokemon Snap, your photos are rated based on their quality and composition. Number 17. Sun and Moon utilizes the Pokemon Bank, a system that allows trainers not only to transfer their Pokemon companions from X, Y, Omega Ruby, and Alpha Sapphire, but the virtual console versions of Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, allowing you to battle like it's 1996. Number 18. Looks like Pokemon has taken a page from Mortal Kombat's book. Sun and Moon introduces its own version of fatalities known as Z-Moves, extremely powerful attacks that break out in miniature cutscenes that can only be used once per battle. These moves require both a trainer worn Z-Ring and a Z-Crystal to work. The move only occurs when a trainer and their Pokemon's wishes resonate with each other. Number 19. Sun and Moon also introduces a new feature known as the Pokepelago. After years of being shoved into Pokeballs and PCs, your Pokemon will finally catch a break at the Pokepelago, where they're free to roam and play in the fresh air. You can also participate in minigames that reward you with items and experience points for your Pokemon. Number 20. Your trainer's trusty Pokedex gets a complete revamp in the form of the Rotom Pokedex. The Rotom Pokedex is capable of providing the player with hints and directions towards the next objective, rare Pokemon, and items. So long as it doesn't have the sass of Ash's original Pokedex, it should be the perfect companion. Number 21. The game introduces a new mode called Battle Royale, in which four trainers face off against each other in a free-for-all battle for glory and pocket change. Each trainer is armed with three Pokemon at their disposal. Whichever trainer has the most Pokemon standing at the end of the match will be declared the winner. Number 22. You don't need to necessarily bring your Pokemon to the Pokemon Center if they've been roughed up in battle. Game Freak has added a refresh mode to Pokemon Sun and Moon, which allows you to fix up your Pokemon after a battle. You can clean them using the touchscreen or feed them Poke Beans, which will help cure them of certain status conditions. Giving your Pokemon this extra love and attention can even improve their performance in battle. Number 23. Pokemon Sun and Moon are the biggest main series Pokemon games ever made. With the digital copy of the game weighing in at about 3 gigabytes of storage, Pokemon X and Y only took up 1.8 gigabyte each. It means the game is also bigger in terms of map size, content, and of course, the Pokemon themselves. Number 24. Following a Pokemon tradition that has been around since Professor Oak forgot his own grandson's name, Alola's resident Pokemon expert, Professor Kukui, is named after a tree. The Kukui, also known as the Candle Nut, is the official state tree of Hawaii. Number 25. Professor Kukui is so devoted to his work that he's to voluntarily taken direct hits from Pokemon for the sake of his research. Number 26. Much like Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and others before it, Alola is plagued by an evil organization called Team Skull that's bent on enslaving Pokemon for the sake of profit and domination. They're led by Guzma, who appears to have a personal connection to Professor Kukui, and Plumeria, who, despite the team's cold nature, acts as the group's older sister who has a soft spot for her loyal underlings. Number 27. Because Team Skull isn't run by some rich, stereotypical mob boss like Giovanni, their budget is a bit thin. As a result, the grunts of Team Skull are responsible for buying their own gang outfits. Number 28. Pokemon Sun and Moon contains an additional threat beyond a criminal organization known as the Ultra Beasts. Their true origin is currently unknown, but they certainly aren't Pokemon. Ultra Beasts are creatures who possess abilities that pose a threat to both humans and Pokemon alike. Number 29. ub one is an Ultra Beast composed of a glass-like substance that constantly changes its shape. It's unknown if it has emotions or even free will of its own, but it has been said that ub ones movement resembles that of a young girl, oddly specific. Number 30. In Pokemon Moon, ub one takes the form of Beauty, who's so quick that it can dodge lightning. In addition, any Pokemon that lays eyes on ub 2 Beauty will no longer have the desire to battle it, instead becoming completely infatuated with the mysterious creature. Number 31. In Pokemon Sun, ub 2 takes the form of Absorption, which is a force to be reckoned with. Its body is bursting with intimidatingly large muscles that would make him a champ feel insecure, and its long beak is as hard as a diamond. Yikes. Number 32. The mystery of the Ultra Beast will not go unsolved, for an organization known as the Aether Foundation is devoted to researching and understanding the mysterious creatures. They're located on the man-made island cleverly known as Aether Paradise, home to refugee Pokemon and, of course, Aether Foundation researchers. Number 33. Jengmoo, the cute little dinosaur-looking Pokemon, was the first design for this new generation. Number 34. Alolan Executor was designed with the idea that Sun and Alola was so strong that Executor just keeps growing and growing. Number 35. Shigeru Omori explained that since it's Pokemon's 20th anniversary, he and the team wanted special surprises, including funny elements when working on the game. For this reason, a lot of the designs for Pokemon are more extravagant, and sometimes a bit silly. Number 36. If you're wondering why the oh-so-wondrous Professor Kukui is shirtless, well, it's because of the temperature. According to Omori, the team had no intention of making professors cooler or prettier. And no, it wasn't because Professor Sycamore was good-looking and they wanted to continue that trend. Number 37. Red and Blue, or Green in Japan, make a return, along with some other well-known Pokemon trainers. You can check them all out at the Battle Tree. Number 38. Red and Blue are sporting new looks as well. Upon closer inspection, Red's shirt has a 96 on it. What does this mean? Well, the original Pokemon in Red and Green were released back in 1996. Number 39. Need something to rap to? The Pokemon Company released an advertisement featuring
featuring a rap by none other than our adorable ghostly friend, Mimikyu. Number 40. While we've learned that kids can start their Pokemon adventures at the good old age of 10 in previous games, Sun and Moon's age limit cranks it up to 11, literally. The youngest a kid can be before they take part in the island challenges is 11 years old, which just so happens to be the age of our player characters. Number 41. After the reveal of Young Goose and Gumshoes, many started speculating that the Pokemon was modeled after Donald Trump, but Shigeru Amori confirmed that no, the Pokemon are not modeled after the man himself. He stated that they haven't been paying attention to the current events in the United States. Number 42. With a ton of colors, stones, and letters out there, why choose the name Sun and Moon? This goes back to the creators and how they look at Pokemon as a whole. For Pokemon's 20th anniversary, those at Game Freak wanted to re-examine what Pokemon are. Pokemon are living beings, and Sun and Moon are involved in the creation of life on the planet. Number 43. Now that you know why they picked Sun and Moon, why a region based on Hawaii? Amori's gone to Hawaii many times, and he believes that it's the best representation of what he wanted in Sun and Moon. A region filled with life, one with nature, and of course, the warm sun. He also says that the people of Hawaii are really one with nature. Number 44. They were originally going to be vehicles. However, to stay in line with the concept of human and Pokemon relationships, it was decided that they would use Pokemon as rides instead. Number 45. For the first time in the main series of Pokemon games, there's no Pokemon League. Yet! The Pokemon League in the Alola region isn't fully established. Number 46. Per tradition, Sun and Moon has three starting Pokemon to choose from. This generation's Grass-type starter is an adorable Owl-like Pokemon, Rowlet, who doubles as a flying Pokemon. The Fire-type starter is a Cat-like Pokemon that you might want to think twice about cuddling, named Litten. The Sea Lion Pokemon, Poplio, has taken the mantle of this generation's Water Starter. Number 47. The legendary Pokemon featured on the box of Pokemon Sun is what you get when you mix a Mighty Lion with the power of the Sun, Solgaleo. It possesses an ability called Full Metal Body, which means that Solgaleo's stats cannot be lowered or affected by another Pokemon's move or abilities. Number 48. Lunala is the poster Pokemon for Pokemon Moon. Resembling a giant bat, it's known by the citizens of Alola as the beast that calls the moon. It has a special ability called Shadow Shield, which means that whenever Lunala has full HP, any attack made on it will do significantly less damage. Number 49. The mythical Pokemon of Sun and Moon is a steel fairy type known as Magearna. Much like Mewtwo or Porygon, Magearna is a Pokemon created by man. Despite its futuristic appearance, Magirna was created over 500 years ago before the events of Sun and Moon. Its special ability is Soul Heart, which raises its special attacks when a Pokemon is knocked out. Number 50. One of the game's newest Pokemon, Bruxish, is a water Pokemon notorious for emitting psychic waves from the growth on its head, which can cause sickness and dizziness for any nearby living organisms, even having the ability to render them unconscious with minimal effort. Despite its bad reputation, the denizens of Alola have repurposed this Pokemon with keeping some of the more dangerous water Pokemon away from the region. Number 51. Pessimistic Pokemon trainers may have a hard time tracking down the adorable cutie fly, as it tends to only gravitate towards Pokemon with a positive aura. Number 52. Drampa is perhaps one of the more unsettling of the new Pokemon. While typically a calm species, Drampa has an almost unhealthy affinity for children, so much that they tend to gravitate towards schoolyards. If a child is ever hurt in their presence, they'll break their calm demeanor and go into rage mode. Teachers and parents of Alola, you've been warned. Number 53. Melee Melee Island has its own guardian Pokemon, known as Tapu Koko. This Pokemon is well aware of its high status and has been described as being fickle, because it won't always come to the aid of those in need. However, when Tapu Koko grows attached to somebody, they become crazy possessive, never ever leaving their side. Number 54. Meet Togedemaru, the newest adorable electric Pokemon that surely got Pikachu sweating bolts. If it's attacked by another electric Pokemon, it can absorb their energy and use it against them. Togedemaru is also into some pretty weird extracurricular activities, its favorite being standing around during a storm and hoping it'll get struck by a bolt of lightning. Weirdo. Number 55. Chargebug is a living battery of sorts, generating enough energy to power up an entire house alone. It can even attach itself to other Pokemon to increase the effectiveness of their attacks. Number 56. Chargebug actually works quite well with the final form of its evolutionary line, Vikavolt. The two will merge together to increase Vikavolt's attacks late into the battle. But if push comes to shove and things aren't looking good for Vikavolt, it'll forcibly detach Chargebug to lighten the load and restore its usual speed. Number 57. Much like the species it's based on, the koala Pokemon Komala is both sleepy and lazy. Unlike the real life koala bear, no Komala has ever been seen awake, remaining in a permanent state of hibernation. Number 58. Komala Owls are valued for much more than their ability to win their trainer's badges and pocket change. Their saliva has historically been used to treat sleep deprivation. Number 59. While Mimikyu appears to be an unholy merging of Ditto and Pikachu gone horribly wrong, this isn't actually the Pokemon's true appearance. It has instead made itself a bodysuit out of old Pokemon merchandise that it can hide underneath, due to its fear of sunlight. Number 60. The Pokemon Beware gives the term Big Ol' Bear Hug a terrifying new definition. Its hugs are so strong that it can easily break a man in two. Unfortunately, hugging is one of its favorite pastimes. Number 61. Rockruff is a 
unique Pokemon in that its evolution, Lycanroc, can appear as one of two forms, depending on which version of the game you're playing. In Pokemon Sun, Lycanroc takes on its noble Midday form. If it evolves in Pokemon Moon, it takes on a much more sinister form, known as Midnight form. Number 62, Pikapak ain't no Pidgey. This little guy has the potential to be a killing machine. This bird type can strike with its beak 16 times per second, which is enough force to shatter a stone. Number 63, the Dancing Bird Pokemon, or Corio, is unique in that it comes in four different forms, one for each of the four islands that make up the Alola region. You've got the Fire-type Bali style, Electric-type Pom Pom style, Psychic-type Paiwu style, and the Ghost-type Sensu style. Or Corio changes its form by sipping the nectar of specific flowers. Number 64, Sandy Gaster created when hordes of Pokemon soak into the sand after falling in battle, basically making a spazzy pile of sand. Whatever you do, don't try to pull the tempting shiny red shovel from its head, because if your curiosity gets the better of you, Sandy Gaster will become your new master and order you to gather and add more sand to its body. Number 65, on its own, Wishy Washy appears to be nothing more than bite-sized fish food, but there's a reason that even Gyarados fears. When it's in danger, a lone wishy-washy can send out a signal by reflecting the light off its eyes, an SOS of sorts that'll call an armada of its wishy-washy brethren, who will then take on its more terrifying school form, proving that there is in fact power in numbers. Number 66. Pokemon trainers can have quite a hard time earning the respect of their passimians. It's all in how trainers throw Pokeballs, which they liken to throwing berries in the wild. If the trainer is the Tom Seaver of Pokeball throwing, you'll have no trouble keeping it in line. Number 67. You'd think Crab Brawler would be a water type, since it's got the word crab in its name, but it's actually based on a real, non-swimming species in Hawaii called the coconut crab, the largest anthropod currently known to exist. Seriously, these things are almost as big as some dogs. Despite their horrifying size, coconut crabs can't swim like their smaller and less scary brethren, which is quite alright, because would you really want to surf on top of a coconut crab? Number 68. Pukumuku are numerous and are often scattered across beaches. They're considered unappealing to Alolan tourists, so a common line of work for Alolan citizens is cleaning the beach of this Pokemon, tossing them as far back into the sea as they can. Number 69. Unfortunately for people, Pukumuku are quite content with where they decide to settle, so even if they're thrown into the sea, they'll always make their way back to their favorite spot, no matter how far removed they may be. Even if their favorite spot is devoid of all food, the Pukumuku will gladly stand its ground and starve. Number 70. Minier originate from the planet's stratosphere. They spend the start of their lives absorbing the detritus around them until they consume so much that they become heavy, causing gravity to take over and send the Minier to its new home on Alola. Number 71. Minier's core will change color depending on the kinds of particles it's absorbed, making them quite visually stunning. In fact, their looks have become so iconic amongst the Alola's people that they're a popular design to place on both clothing and accessories alike. Just make sure Disney doesn't get a hold of them. Number 72. Type Null is not found in nature, because it was created by humans who were trying to recreate the power of a mythical Pokemon. While its design is a Frankensteinian mixture of several Pokemon, it's actually a normal type. Number 73. Type Null possesses a special item known as Memory, which activates the Pokemon's special ability to temporarily change into one of 18 Pokemon types. Number 74. Jangwoo may be small and cute. These Pokemon are constantly training together to become the best they can be, and often reside in normally uninhabitable areas. Number 75. The bell attached to Torcat's neck isn't actually a bell at all, but an organ that enables the Pokemon to produce flames. Its temperature is based on Torcat's emotional state. When it releases flames, it makes a loud bell-like sound. Number 76. Dartrix has incredible reflexes. Not only can it detect an enemy directly behind it without even turning its shoulder, it can shoot out dart-like feathers in an instant and hit its target every time without looking. Number 77. Brion prides itself in its ability to learn as many dances as it possibly can. It starts life on the dance floor by learning its first moves from other, much more older Brion's in the colony. It'll then venture off into the world, learning dances from other Pokemon and even humans, dancing perfectly in sync with those they've met for the first time. Number 78. The Fruity Bone Sweet gives off an aroma that not only smells incredibly pleasant, but also has a calming effect on humans. As a result, many humans of Alola have allowed Bone Sweet to live in their homes in exchange for their therapeutic aroma. Number 79. Passimians pride themselves on their collection and use of berries in combat. Not only do they hurl their fruits at their foes, they also use soft berries to obscure their opponent's vision. Passimians keep their opponents guessing when attacking in coordination, faking them out by constantly passing berries amongst each other until their foe is pegged when they least expect it. Number 80. Alola features altered variants of pre-existing Pokemon that have adapted to different microclimates of throughout the region. These changes not only alter their abilities, but their appearance as well. For example, Alola's Rattata has a black coat of fur, and a mustache that would make Waluigi blush. Number 81. The frequent eruptions of volcanoes near the sandy, desert environments of Alola threaten the safety of the region's sand shrew population, causing the ground-type Pokemon to ditch the sand portion of its name and migrate to the snowy mountaintops. As a result, Sandtree's body took on more of an icy pigment, its head resembling that of an igloo, and Sandslash's quills have evolved into razor-sharp shards of ice. Number 82. Vulpix was another Pokemon that was brought to the Alola region by humans, but they quickly ran to the snowy parts of the region to avoid other Pokemon species. Because of this, their type was reversed from fire to ice, with their appearance being almost identical to its original form, only with an icy recolor. Has Game Freak started taking artistic cues from Sonic fans? Number 83. Alola Ninetales exclusively lives atop 
atop a holy and sacred mountain by Alolan natives. So Ninetales are seen as sacred emissaries and are known for being quite loyal to humans, helping anyone they find in distress. While they're typically calm and gentle, they can change on a dime if anyone threatens or damages their home. Good thing snowy mountain tops aren't an ideal location for condos. Number 84. Unlike the other Alolan forms of classic Pokemon, Alolan Executor is the Pokemon's true form due to the fact that it's getting the proper amount of sunlight it needs in the Alola region, as opposed to the other regions where sunlight is much less common. As a result, this Executor has a longer neck and a tail containing a fourth head that can attack Pokemon flanking from behind. If that's not enough to convince you to take Executor seriously for the first time in 20 years, the Pokemon is now a dragon type, for some reason. Number 85. If you thought the original Marowak bio was dark, guess again. Alolan Marowak has all the sadness of the original, but is now feared by the people of Alola, seen as a conjurer of the dark arts. This may have to do with the fact that it's become a ghost type that now lights both ends of its signature bone weapon on fire. Number 86. Though Young Goose is being introduced to players for the first time in the Alola region, they were actually imported from other regions to combat a Rattata infestation that had spread through Alola. Alola's Rattatas were able to dodge this genocidal initiative by taking advantage of Young Goose's loss of stamina during moonlight hours and becoming nocturnal. They also moved from the wild into urban areas. This caused the Rattata population to receive a darker fur coat and, for whatever reason, that funky mustache. Number 87. A nest full of Alolan Rattatas are typically led by one Alolan Raticate, who serves as the nest's mob boss. Alolan Raticates are much bigger than the Raticates trainers have encountered since the Kano region. Number 88. While Team Rocket underappreciates theirs, Meows are highly valued Pokemon in the Alola region. Historically, they were given to Alola nobility as gifts, making for pampered and spoiled generations of unique looking Meows. Number 89. The Raichus of Alola possess psychic abilities that allow them to surf using their tails. Unlike the other Alolan changes to classic Pokemon, researchers have yet to discover why it is that Raichu develops psychic abilities. The Alola Raichu has also developed a new ability that no other Pokemon has ever had, called Surge Surfer, which allows it to move more quickly on electric terrain. Number 90. Alola doesn't just feature alternate variants of classic Pokemon, but classic characters as well. Pokemon Sun and Moon introduces us to Professor Oak's identical looking twin cousin with a pretty severe tan, Samson Oak. He specifically studies Alola's unique Pokemon variants. Number 91. Pikachu's Z-Move, Catastropika, looks almost identical to a popular reverse gif on the internet of Ash Ketchum from the Pokemon anime hurling his Pikachu into the sky. Number 92. Your Pokemon trainer is the proud owner of a Wii U, as a Wii U gamepad can be seen in the room at the start of the game. This is an Easter egg tradition found in some of the other Pokemon games, like Generation 1, which featured a Super Nintendo, or Generation 3, in which the trainer owned a Nintendo GameCube. Number 93. Pokemon Sun and Moon was not revealed to the masses officially, but through a leak. On February 25th, 2016, Nintendo's trademarks for the games were found on a website of the European Union Intellectual Property Office. Is it even possible to keep a secret anymore? Number 94. The games were officially announced a day later during a Nintendo Direct livestream on February 26, 2016, just one day before Pokemon Red and Green's 20th anniversary. Number 95. Pokemon Sun and Moon was released exclusively for the Nintendo 3DS family of systems. Sorry, smartphone players, you'll just have to stick with Pokemon Go for the time being. Number 96. Nintendo and Game Freak showed their impatient fans some sweet mercy by releasing a demo for Sun and Moon in October 2016. The demo features the exclusive Pokemon, Ash's Greninja from the Pokemon anime, which can be transferred into the full release game. Number 97. As with every other generation, the Pokemon anime is headed into a new region with a soft reboot in Alola to coincide with the release of Sun and Moon. Ash, Pikachu, and his mother relocate to Alola where, after 18 years of being 10 years old, Ash attends a school with the intent of graduating. The show also received a complete visual overhaul with updated character designs. Oddly enough, Ash appears to be the Pokemon equivalent of Benjamin Button, looking younger than he ever has in his 18 years on the air. Number 98. For the first time in the Pokemon series 20 year history, the new games are available in Chinese, both simplified and traditional. Pokemon Sun and Moon will also support Japanese, English, Korean, Spanish, French, Italian, and German for a total of nine languages. Number 99. As mentioned, Pokemon Sun and Moon was released on November 18th, 2016, near the tail end of the Pokemon franchise's 20-year anniversary. The first entries in the series, Pokemon Red and Green, were both released in Japan in February of 1996. Number 100. Before the games were even released, one of Sun and Moon's new Pokemon, Young Goose, became a sensation on the internet due to its resemblance to U.S. presidential candidate Donald Trump, with hundreds of memes being created upon the creature's unveiling. Number 101. After the tragic Harambe incident in May 2016 at the Cincinnati Zoo, many people became upset over the gorilla's death. A change.org petition was started to have Game Freak honor Harambe's memory by creating a Pokemon for Sun and Moon based on the beloved gorilla. It called for a ghost fighting type named, well, Harambe. Within four days of being posted, over 53,000 people had signed the petition. Number 102. Tomy International released a real-life Z-Ring for a more immersive experience for trainers everywhere. The Z-Ring syncs up with the Nintendo 
Nintendo 3DS, allowing it to glow and vibrate whenever a Z-Move is used in-game. Number 103. For those of you that decide to pick up Sun and Moon in the first few months after its release, you'll be able to pick up a special Munchlax holding Snorlium Z, which will give Munchlax's evolution, Snorlax, its own Z-Move, called Pulverizing Pancake. Number 104. The trailer for the game focusing on the Munchlax promotion acknowledges a popular internet meme that pokes fun at the fact that Snorlax took six generations to stand up. It showcases a montage of Snorlax throughout the years, laying down until finally showing his Z-Move. Number 105. To commemorate the release of Sun and Moon, Nintendo released a new limited edition new Nintendo 3DS XL in October 2016, just three weeks before Sun and Moon came out. The design features the cover Pokemon of both games, but unfortunately the full games are not included as a bundle. Number 106. While the West is getting a special edition new Nintendo 3DS XL, Japan will be releasing a limited edition Pokemon themed Nintendo 2DS in December 2016 to commemorate the new release. It's a baby blue colored system with a Pikachu silhouette on the front, as well as the silhouettes of Alola's three starters, Rowlet, Litten, and Poplio. Number 107. The release of Pokemon Sun and Moon coincided with the release of the game's soundtrack. All 175 tracks found in the game are available as part of a four disc set or as a download on iTunes, much like previous Pokemon titles. Now you can jam out to that sweet Team Skull battle music while you walk. Kabuto, Persian, Paris, Horsey, Radicate, Magnemite, Kadabra, Weeping Bell, Ditto, Cloyster, Caterpie, Sandshrew, Bulbasaur, Charmander, Golem, Pikachu, and on that note, let's talk about Pikachu. Here's 107 facts about everyone's favorite electric rat. Pikachu is the most famous Pokemon in existence. The adorable electric mouse is loved by everyone worldwide for its charm, strength, and friendship with Ash Ketchum. Hi, I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator, and don't waste your Pokeballs because we captured 107 facts about Pikachu. Let's get started. Pikachu, I choose you. Pikachu. Pikachu is number 25 in the National Pokedex. You know, something just feels right about Pikachu being that number. In fact, it's that number again in the Alolan Dex. The average height of a Pikachu is 1 foot 4 inches, or for our non-American viewers, 0.4 meters. Imagine if you saw a real mouse of that size charging at you. Yikes. A Pikachu's average weight is approximately 13.2 pounds. That's roughly 6 kilograms. The Pokedex classifies Pikachu as a mouse Pokemon. It shares this classification with Rattata, Raticate, Raichu, Sandshu, and Sandslash. As a pure electric type, Pikachu is super effective against flying and water types. However, it is weak to ground types and can't do any damage to them. That said, Ash's Pikachu did knock out a Golem, which is a ground type Pokemon, in the movie Pokemon Mewtwo vs. Mew by using a Thunderbolt. Oops. Pikachu's name is a pun. In Japanese, Pika Pika is the onomatopoeia for crackling electricity, and chew is the sound that mice make, meaning Pikachu's name sort of translates to electric mouse. Apparently, Pikachu was one of the more difficult names to create because the Pokemon company wanted it to be global and not change the name from country to country, not to mention it helped trademark the name universally. In the Electric Tale of Pikachu manga, which is roughly based on the show, Ash actually does give Pikachu a nickname, John Luke Pikachu. Supposedly, this is a reference to the famous Star Trek character, John Luke Picard. Nowadays, it's generally accepted that Ash's Pikachu is a boy, especially since female Pikachu have a heart-shaped tail after the fourth generation. But there's been lots of fan debate about Pikachu's gender in the past. The company initially kept silent about it so that the electric mouse would appeal to boys and girls. Speaking of which, in the wild, aka in the games, Pikachu have a 50-50 chance of being a male or female. Like Ash, the eternal 10-year-old, although he's supposedly 11 in Alola, Pikachu is technically ageless. We were never given a definite age for him and aren't sure if or when he evolved from a Pichu. While Ken Sugimori is credited for designing many Pokemon, it was actually Atsuko Nishida who designed Pikachu. She also designed multiple evolutions, like the most recent, Sylveon. Since many Pokemon are based on real animals, <clears throat> or household items, quite a few people believe that Pikachu is specifically based off of a small mammal native to China, called the Lily Pika. Unfortunately, the Pika is currently endangered since the country believes they are pests and are trying to get rid of them. If only we can just catch them all. Pikas are part of the Lagomorph family in the animal kingdom, which is otherwise populated by rabbits, so it's believed that Pikachu's ears are based on long-eared hairs. Pikachu is quite chubby in his original design. People have noticed how Pikachu is significantly shaped up and like to debate which version is the cutest iteration. What do you think? I personally like the little chubby Pikachu. Initially, Pikachu's design included white around his muzzle and the tip of his tail, but eventually they decided to just keep him predominantly yellow. The yellow fur has also changed throughout the years. At first, Pikachu's was a deep shade of yellow, but as time has gone on, he's literally lightened up a little. He also used to have a different colored tummy, a detail which was removed down the line, though it's still prevalent in the early red and blue games. Even Sugimori drew a version of Red's Pikachu with a white belly. Pikachu's red cheeks aren't just for decoration. They hold the electric sacks that help the Pokemon generate sparks. So, as much as you may want to, it might be best not to pinch those cheeks. Actually, if Pikachu doesn't release its electricity regularly, 
can cause a number of health issues and could even kill the poor thing. Ikue Otani is the primary voice actress for Pikachu in the Japanese and all other versions of the show, not to mention sound bites for other media. However, Rachel Willis occasionally provided Pikachu's voice in the English dub when other characters' dialogue overlapped the Japanese audio. Casey Rogers, who voiced multiple humans and Pokemon throughout the show, also provided her voice for Pikachu specifically for the Pokemon Learning League, which was a web-based educational series. Fans have noticed that Pikachu's speech pattern is relatively consistent throughout the show, and some fans have even been able to translate some of Pikachu's phrases. For example, Pika P means Ash, and it has the same amount of syllables as Ash's Japanese name, Satoshi. Pikachu wasn't originally intended to be Pokemon's mascot, that was Clefairy. The decision was made from a marketing perspective since there weren't many famous yellow cartoon characters at the time, apart from from Winnie the Pooh, so the team simply thought Pikachu would be more recognizable. We first meet the famous Pikachu in the pilot episode, Pokemon, I Choose You, after Ash receives him from Professor Oak to start his journey across Kanto. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Pikachu has been in every single episode of Pokemon thereafter. There's a reason he's the mascot, you know. Upon meeting Ash, Pikachu wasn't that fond of his new trainer. He only began to trust him after Ash saved Pikachu from a brutal Spearow attack. Since then, he's been completely loyal. Unlike many other Pokemon, Pikachu has an aversion to staying in his Pokeball. This is why he usually follows Ash around on foot. Or in the early series, Pikachu could be found sitting on Ash's head while the gang walked. But now he is more often found perched on Ash's shoulder. Even if he's not in it often, Pikachu is a pretty unique Pokeball. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that there's a small lightning bolt on the red top of the capsule just above the button. How often do we actually see Pikachu inside this ball? Well, for now, the total count is up to five. That's not a lot considering how many episodes exist of the show. While he may not have listened to Ash when they first met, Pikachu now enjoys battling alongside Ash and tries his hardest to help the team out in any situation. Team Rocket wants to capture Pikachu because they believe he's an extremely rare Pokemon. This isn't because he is a Pikachu, but because they feel he's extremely powerful since he defeated them the first time they met. In Season 1, Meowth even mentioned that Pikachu is much stronger than he would be if he were a Raichu. One might say his power level is over 9,000? <laughs> is that joke dead? S sorry, not sorry. But how strong is Pikachu really? Well, we know that his Thunderbolt packs a punch with 100,000 volts. Pikachu has also battled against several legendaries and came to a draw in a battle against the Latios in the Sinnoh region. For a common Pokemon to go head-to-head -head against an opponent like that is no small feat. Not to mention that Pikachu previously defeated Arrested Regi Ice with what was basically a single Volt Tackle. These battles actually made Pikachu become the only Pokemon in the series to single-handedly beat not one, but two legendaries. Impressed yet? Pikachu was also Ash's first Pokemon to defeat a Mega Evolved Pokemon, which is Karina's Lucario. Additionally, Pikachu has partook in every gym battle across all the regions. This doesn't mean he has been in every battle, just that he's faced off all gym leaders. He's nearly faced off all Elite Four members as well. The only exception is when Ash went up against Sinnoh's Bertha in an Elite cover-up. Several devotees tried to determine what Pikachu's level is in the show, but they determined that his level was infinite, which is just a fancy way of saying inconclusive. When arriving in some new regions, after a string of different events, Pikachu's strength is reset. The first happens in Hoenn, and is believed to be a plot device to make sure Pikachu isn't overpowered. As strong as Pikachu is, some fans believe that he's not the strongest of Ash's Pokemon. They especially cite Charizard and Greninja. What do you think? By the end of Pikachu and Ash's adventure in the Kalos region, dedicated fans determined that throughout their entire journey, Pikachu has won 62% of his official battles. This doesn't even include wild encounters, though. Ash's Pikachu uses two moves that other Pikachu can't learn in the games, Tackle and Leer. We would have probably swapped those moves out anyway. Pikachu has also improvised several moves within the show. From Electric Slam to Volt Tail, there are pretty cool combo moves that we wish we could use. It's generally accepted that Volt Tackle is Pikachu's most powerful non-special move in the show, especially since the most powerful attack that in-game Pikachu can learn. It's really exciting when a Pokemon learns something new. However, Pikachu didn't learn any new attacks throughout the Diamond and Pearl series or the X and Y series. Pikachu is Ash's first Pokemon to perform a Z-move. At this point in time, Pikachu can use both Gigavec Havoc and Breakneck Blitz. It wouldn't surprise us if he learns even more. Pikachu has a habit of accidentally electrocuting Ash and his friends. If he's so powerful, why doesn't that, well, kill everyone? A few fans looked into this and believe that although Pikachu's electricity has a lot of volts, these attacks aren't necessarily high on amps, which would do real damage. Plus, it seems that wearing rubber helps deflect Pikachu's electric shocks, as seen with Ash's rubber gloves in the first episode. Could it be that everyone's shoes are made of rubber or something? Who knows? Perhaps a cartoon conspiracy. A common joke is that upon meeting a female trainer who will join Ash on his journey, Pikachu tends to accidentally destroy their bikes or just electrocute them directly. And Missy definitely won't let people forget how charred her bike was. Like Pokemon in the game, Pikachu has an ability and has used it a few times in the show. It's static. This ability can paralyze an opponent upon contact. Out of all of Ash's officially captured Pokemon, Pikachu is the only electric type. 
In fact, until Dawn caught Pachirisu, Pikachu was the only Electric-type Pokemon to be a main character in the anime. Ash's Pikachu enjoys doing impressions by stretching his face and contorting his ears. He's really good at it. While Ash is his best friend, Pikachu has one true love, ketchup. He even sang a whole song about it. But don't let Dawn's Baneri know. Baneri has a huge crush on Pikachu and would be devastated to learn that Pikachu's heart already belongs to another. Pikachu also enjoys orange juice, as seen in the fires of a Red Hot Reunion. It's believed that this is because of the sour flavor. Overall, Wild Pikachu are pretty smart. If they come across a berry that is too hard to eat, they'll soften it up with their electricity. Instant meal. They've also been caught nibbling at wires. Good thing Ash's Pokedex doesn't have a charger. Pikachu don't evolve based on level. Rather, they evolve after they come into contact with a Thunderstone. Whether they take the form of Raichu or a Lolan Raichu depends on the region they are in. Ash's Pikachu absolutely doesn't want to evolve into a Raichu. When offered the opportunity to do so at the point where he and Ash were going up against Lieutenant Surge, Pikachu preferred to stay the way he was and just train to get stronger. Most people don't recall that Pikachu had a second chance to evolve into Raichu while he was traveling in Sinnoh. To prevent this decision from ever happening again, Team Rocket actually stole the Evolution Stone from Ash. Pikachu seems to make every Raichu his rival when he meets them. One such moment is the popular short, Pikachu's Vacation. Pikachu also developed a rivalry with Noah's Alolan Raichu. Whether this has anything to do with Pikachu's desire to remain a Pikachu is unclear. Even other Pokemon know how beloved Pikachu is. That's exactly why Mimikyu wears a disguise pretending to be Pikachu. I just want some of that love. <sighs> However, there is one Mimikyu that despises Pikachu, Jesse's Mimikyu. Unlike other Mimikyu, it wears the costume out of hate and wants to attack Pikachu whenever it sees him. During Pokemon XY, Pikachu received his own one-hour special of Pokemon XY Pikachu the Movie. The TV film only features a single type of Pokemon, any takers of which kind? There have been 28 other short specials that predominantly focuses on Pikachu and his Poke friends. These usually air before the feature films and only 19 of them have been translated from the original Japanese. The most popular special is definitely the first Pokemon short that was ever made, Pikachu's Vacation. You might remember watching it before the original Pokemon movie. We also need to mention the short Pikachu and Pichu because at this point in the series, Pikachu has been traveling with Ash for a whole year. Yes, we know, years and Ash don't make sense, just go with it. These shorts are prime examples of how Pikachu acts as a leader for all the other Pokemon in the gang. Not to mention how he always helped to settle things between the bickering Chespin and Faroki. He especially acts as a big brother figure to Pokemon younger than him, such as Togepi and Dedenne. Jaw. But there are some Pokemon that he's not so fond of. Pikachu isn't a big fan of Meowth, but that may have something to do with the fact that Team Rocket is always trying to kidnap him. Pikachu has been captured by nearly all other evil organizations for one reason or another. Currently, the only team that has never taken him hostage is Team Aqua. Maybe if he was a water type? When Pikachu was captured by Mewtwo, he was cloned like all the other Pokemon. Pikachu 2 looks slightly different from the Pikachu we know and love, as it has fuzzier ear tips. Talking about different appearances, a shiny Pikachu is a darker shade of yellow. Hmm, maybe shiny Pikachu likes mustard over ketchup. And we can't forget to mention cosplay Pikachu. If Pikachu has a heart-shaped tail with a black tip, they can dress up. There are five costumes in total. Rockstar, Bell, Popstar, PhD, and Libre. Which do you like most? Tell us in the comments below. Did you know you can get Ash's Pikachu in multiple games? The first time this happened was with Diamond and Pearl. The event gave you Pikachu leveled at 50, knowing Bolt Tackle, Iron Tail, Quick Attack, and Thunderbolt. There was another opportunity to grab Pikachu and Unova. It came with a Wishing Ribbon, and Bolt Tackle was replaced with Electro Ball. While these event Pikachu were said to be Ash's Pikachu, there was nothing distinguishing them otherwise. That all changed with the Alolan games. Ash's Pikachu was given out again, but this time he would wear one of Ash's regional caps. Based off of these event Pikachu, it seems that the Pokemon Company is still trying to decide what Ash's Pikachu's official nature is. The first event Pikachu were either set as naughty or brave, while the Alolan event gave Pikachu a hearty nature. Ash's Pikachu can be found beyond the series and games as well. He has about 10 cards in the Pokemon trading game as of this video. Here are a couple of our favorites. To promote Pokemon 2000, Koro Koro released a Pichu and Pikachu card. This is based on the short that aired before the film and also features the Pichu brothers. All the cards specifically listed as Ash's Pikachu depict Pikachu wearing Ash's cap yet again. There really is no better way to distinguish Ash's Pikachu from other Pikachu. And while this card doesn't specifically portray Ash's Pikachu, it is one we should mention. The Pikachu Illustrator card is the most exclusive TCG card as only six were ever made. It, of course, features a Pikachu and has previously been sold for $100,000. Some say that Pikachu is so emblematic that he's reached the level of Mickey Mouse. And it isn't just because they are both mice. 
Since its conception, Pikachu has skyrocketed as a pop culture icon. For example, Pikachu became so popular that a protein was named after him. Pikachurin is a human protein that delivers electric impulses between the brain and eyes. Knowing that his name has been immortalized through biology would probably make Pikachu very proud, since, like his trainer, he has a curiosity about science. Pikachu has also appeared on official currency in Niue, a small country in the Pacific Islands. In 2001, Pikachu could be found on their dollar coin. Nowadays, collectors sell them for quite a lot more. We found a listing for 80 bucks. Pikachu has also been featured in the Macy's Day Parade since 2006 in the form of a balloon. It was the first balloon to have electricity running through it, which lit up Pikachu's cheeks. Authentic. For a day back in 1998, a Kansas city named Topeka renamed itself to Pikachu. Wish we lived there. In 1999, Pikachu was named one of the best people of the year by Time Magazine in its Asian edition, calling him the most beloved animated character since Japanese cartoon icon Hello Kitty. High praise back in the day. Fans in China were protesting a specific issue regarding the electric mouse in 2016. Pikachu's name was changing. After Nintendo announced that Sun and Moon would be available in traditional and simplified Chinese, the population that spoke Cantonese were upset that Pikachu's name would be changing to the Mandarin version. Instead of Pikachu, it would now be read as Baikachu. Speaking of names, in 2013, a Japanese soothsayer predicted that naming a child Pikachu would bring them good luck and fortune. So, have you met a <clears throat> human Pikachu in the wild? A controversy regarding Pikachu is the Porygon episode. This episode is famous for sending multiple children to the hospital after Pikachu delivers a red and blue flashing electric attack. Even though Pikachu is the reason for this, Porygon took all the blame and hasn't appeared in any episode since. Pikachu has a habit of being a popular Easter egg in other shows, both Eastern and Western alike. We've mentioned a few previously in our Pokemon references video, like how Maggie from The Simpsons is often dressed up as Pikachu. But here are a few more. In a Crayon Shin-Chan special, a parody doll of Pikachu can be seen. Though personally, we feel that Pikachu looks a little more like a dog here. Pikachu can be found in Osmosis Jones. A germ is carrying Pikachu in its arms, suggesting that Pikachu causes allergies. Pikachu has also been in the topic of question in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? For $8,000, it read, as any Pokemon-loving kid could tell you, Pikachu is primarily what color? We definitely know the answer. Where's our $8,000? Pikachu is also referenced in other games. For example, in Animal Crossing, a neighbor will occasionally ask you to find their missing item. One of these items is called a Pokemon Pikachu 2GS. And unfortunately, you can't get one yourself, whatever it is. If you like mystery movies and you like Pikachu, there's a film in development that's just for you. Based off of the Japanese game with the same title, Detective Pikachu will be produced by Legendary Entertainment, directed by Rob Letterman and written by Nicole Perlman and Alex Hirsch. The Pikachu in this film won't be Ashes, but a different talking Pikachu, and many want Danny DeVito to be the voice of the Sherlockian Pikachu. Why? Because DeVito's voice coming out of a cute Pikachu would be perfect. The moment I sat down, I thought I was looking into a mirror. There's a theory going around that Ash isn't actually Pikachu's first trainer. This stems from the fact that most Pikachu evolved from Pichu, and that Pokeballs with a small lightning bolt symbol on them have already been noticed in Sinnoh by fans. Do you think that there's something to this? All right, I'll stop doing the Pokemon rap between each segment, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop naming Pokemon, all right? In fact, here's the 12 most underrated Pokemon from Gen 1. Everyone loves Pokemon, but not all Pokemon are loved equally. Hey, I'm Vincent, and today here on Cartoon Hangover, we're going to take you through our list of the top 12 underrated Pokemon from Generation 1. When I say underrated, I mean Pokemon that just never quite got the credit or popularity they deserve, taking into account a bit of everything. Character design, moves, some stats in the video games, and personality. Uh, unfortunately, that means Farfetch just doesn't quite make the list. I mean, sorry, buddy, I love tiny little spring onion celery wielding ducks as much as the next guy, but come on. Number 12, Magneton. Sometimes, Pokemon evolutions are simple. Take an existing Pokemon and put more faces on it. Diglett becomes Dugtrio. Doduo becomes Dodrio, and Clink becomes Clink Clank Clink Clank Clink Clinker cl uh, Is that another face on that big gear? What the hell is this thing? Of all the multi-faced Pokemon, Magneton stands out above the rest. It's got pretty good speed and special attack in the video games. It totally looks like a sculpture made by a hipster art student. And as an added bonus, this cluster of magnets represents friendship and the importance of sharing your food. Remember in Pokemon Snap, when three little Magnemites evolved because they were all eating the same apple? Oh, Number 11, Parasect. There are plenty of Pokemon horror stories out there. 
But back in Generation 1, we had something truly special in Parasect. It's a zombie. <laughs> According to its Pokedex entry, Parasect is a host parasite pair in which the parasite mushroom has taken over the host bug. Yowza! That's why Parasect has no pupils. It's a freaking zombie. Zombie Pokemon! <laughs> Number 10. Gold Duck. Back when Pokemon was just starting to become popular and everyone was watching the first few seasons of the anime, Psyduck really made a name for itself. A big yellow duck that constantly has headaches, even on paper that makes for a funny, memorable character. So memorable, in fact, that people completely forget about its evolution, Gold Duck. This Pokemon has pretty decent stats all across the board and can learn a handful of psychic type moves despite it remaining a solid water type. We're talking about a blue duck with a smirk that seems to say, I know something you don't know, topped off with a freaking infinity stone in its forehead. Gold duck, man. Number 9. Doduo, the wingless, two-headed bird, is undeniably cute. With its two heads that don't always seem to agree, a ridiculous voice, and the fact that it's perhaps the most original-looking bird Pokémon of the first generation, it's not hard to imagine why we think Doduo is underrated. Number 8. Primeape. While it's not uncommon for a Pokémon to be difficult to catch and put up an occasional fight before being caught by a trainer, Primeape stands tall amongst its peers for being possibly the most stubborn, hard-to-catch Pokémon in Ash Ketchum's entire run as a Pokémon trainer, refusing time and time again to simply accept its Pokéball prison and even going so far as to steal Ash's trademark hat, Primeape makes this list because it's a fluffy ball of stubborn monkey rage with the video game attack stat to mostly back that up. If Pokemon were real, Primeape would be both terrifying and very tempting to hug at the same time. Number 7. Muck. If a real-life Primeape would be terrifying, just imagine the nightmares a real-life Muck would give you. Muck is living sludge. Living, poisonous, amorphous sludge with a big, drippy mouth and lifeless, cold eyes. Imagine this thing turning a corner toward you as you're walking by an alleyway. Imagine it slipping beneath the crack under your bedroom door late at night as it cries out. Muck is underrated because it's the boogeyman of the Pokémon universe, and nobody seems to realize that. Number 6. Hypno. I know what you're thinking. Vincent, what could be scarier than the boogeyman of the Pokémon universe? My answer? The Freddy Krueger of the Pokémon universe, aka Hypno, a Pokémon who has yet to really hit mainstream attention for the serious walking creepypasta that it is. I'll give you two of its Pokédex entries from the video games. When it is very hungry, it puts humans it meets to sleep, then it feasts on their dreams. It carries a pendulum-like device. There was once an incident in which it took away a child it hypnotized. Oh! Oh, really, Hypno? Just once, huh? That poor kid! Number 5. Sandshrew has the whole package when it comes to pre-evolutions from a design standpoint, but it makes this list because of one particular episode of Pokémon's first season, The Path to the Pokémon League. In this episode, Ash meets AJ, a very different type of trainer from the hero we're used to. AJ and Sandshrew have a bond similar to Ash and Pikachu's, however his training methods are very different from Ash's. Using whips, tight bracing, and constantly commanding Sandshrew to dive into water its natural weakness, this episode really presented some themes that made us think, even as kids. Was AJ's tough love type of training acceptable? Isn't this animal abuse? What could cause someone to be so hard on themselves and their friends? No answers to these questions are given, and AJ doesn't change his ways in the end. Ash and AJ part ways as unlikely friends. This episode really makes an impact, and because of it, along with its adorable armadillo-y appearance, Sandshrew should serve as a constant reminder of the incredibly dynamic relationships Pokémon can have with their trainers. Number 4. Wheezing. Weezing is my personal favorite Pokémon of all time, which just might have something to do with it showing up on this list, but I can tell you why. Weezing has a very impressive defense stat in the games, and his character design's got this interesting blend of I'm gross, but also I'm appealing and helpless. I have no arms. Weezing has a Pokédex entry in Generation 3 that reads, By diluting its toxic gases with a special process, the highest grade of perfume can be extracted meaning Weezing is both a big, gassy purple balloon 
as well as a floating metaphor that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Except when it comes to Farfetch'd, number three, Venusaur. Anybody who grew up with the first generation of Pokemon could recall a popular debate among Poke fans. Who's cooler, Blastoise or Charizard? Blastoise or Charizard? When going to buy the first Pokemon games outside of Japan, you had the choice between Pokemon Red, with a fire-breathing dragon on the front case of the game, and Pokemon Blue, featuring a burly turtle tank hybrid. Two designs that were super easy to identify with as a young, aspiring Pokemon trainer. And then there was Venusaur, the dinosaur, frog, flower, plant thing, sitting on the other side of the room, never quite feeling cool enough for the cool kid's lunch table. Our leafy friend has a design that maybe seemed too complicated to kids at the time. This, coupled with the fact that it never landed a major role in the anime, leads Venusaur to being high up on our underrated list. Its lack of popularity shouldn't be mistaken for a lack of power, though. With stats arguably better than Blastoise's, a design that's more unique than its counterparts, and a super wicked cool holographic Pokemon card back in the day, Venusaur deserves more love. Uh, by the way, guys, Remember Venus Dois? Try that on for size! Number 2. Rattata. Pokemon fans that started back in Generation 1 will tell you, Rattata is synonymous with... Ugh. It seemed like every five seconds, this totally useless rat would show up in the early routes of Pokemon Blue and Pokemon Red, only serving to waste your time. But Rattata isn't all that bad. Ask yourself, would Pokemon be the same without it? Rotetta made such a significant impact to the series that future Pokémon, like Zigzagoon and Badoof, are referred to as the Rotetta of their generations. Plus, Rotetta evolves into Raticate, and with Raticate's move Hyper Fang, yikes, you could really start doing some damage. Number one, Farfetch. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's Poliwhirl. It's, it's Poliwhirl. Ah, oh, Poliwhirl. This Pokemon makes the number one underrated spot because, quite honestly, it's difficult to figure out why Poliwhirl isn't way more popular than it is. And I'm talking Pikachu status popular. Its simple, huggable, friendly, derpy design seems like it should have sold billions of plush toys and skyrocketed Poliwhirl into mainstream level fame. For a hot second during Generation 1, it seemed like that might have happened, with Poliwhirl being featured beside Pikachu and Charmander in the Pokemon Center Tokyo logo, as well as showing up front and center on the cover of Time Magazine. The rest of the Pokemon on this list are underrated for reasons that make sense. Muck and Weezing are gross, Hypno is scary, Primeape is too mad, but Poliwhirl? We love you, Poliwhirl. Maybe someday you'll win the hearts of the universe. Maybe someday you'll have a balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And maybe someday, if we're really, really, really lucky, Farfetch'd will be completely erased from the Pokédex. Next up, here's the 12 best Pokémon moments ever. If your favorite moment didn't make the list, make sure you make a case for it down in the comments. I'll see you soon. This February, Pokemon celebrated its 20th anniversary, which may feel weird for those of us who remember getting our hands on Pokemon Red or Blue, spoiler alert, the cool kids got blue when it first came out. But the popularity of these little pocket monsters hasn't waned at all since then, spawning a small battalion of video games, nearly 20 movies, a wildly popular card game, and a TV show that served as a staple for many a childhood. So to celebrate 20 years of Pokemon, today on Channel Frederator we're counting down the 12 best moments from the series, and some of the movies too. Let's get started. Number 12. James Buys a Magikarp Poor decision-making was a character hallmark of Team Rocket, but few moments in the series highlighted this more than when James is conned into buying Magikarp. Even though the salesman was awkwardly racist, the dramatic irony of the audience knowing that Magikarps are totally worthless made James's optimism and inability to sense anything fishy absolutely hilarious. In the Route 4 Pokemon Center, in the original red and blue versions, you could buy a Magikarp in similar fashion. Though if you're better than James, you know to send it straight to daycare and rare candy that sucker to level 20. See how much of a scam it is then. Anyways, needless to say, when James tries to use the Magikarp in battle, he finds himself floundering. Okay, okay, we're done with the fish puns. You feel bad when he kicks the Magikarp though. It's not its fault it battles like a fish out of water. Number 11, the origin of Mewtwo. After a couple of seasons of haphazard villains, the rise of Mewtwo was a refreshing change of pace. Finally, a villain that was the cause for legitimate concern. And yet, as unequivocally evil as Mewtwo turned out, his origins humanize him to an unexpected degree. Once we learn that Mewtwo 
Mewtwo was in a lab without knowing who or where he was and see how all his friends die right before his eyes, suddenly we feel bad for Mewtwo. The story has some actual depth too as a warning about a man corrupting the course of nature for the sake of greed and power, in addition to putting an unforgettable spin on one of the most formidable villains in Pokemon history. Number 10, Mirage Mew's Sacrifice. In the 10th anniversary special of Pokemon, Ash and Pikachu must battle a holographic but equally deadly version of Mewtwo. And as we've learned by this point in the series, going against Mewtwo on your own is basically a death sentence, especially if you're Ash and you're not very good at what you do. Thankfully for our heroes, a Mirage Mew intervenes and sacrifices itself to subdue the Mewtwo so Pikachu can destroy it. Watching the Mew heroically dissolve into non-existence can only be met with a heavy heart. But on the bright side, fans got to witness a tiny, non-evolved Pokemon take down the most formidable in history. Number 9, Growly. For many, the optimal human Pokemon relationship is epitomized by Ash and Pikachu, but James has again and again proven himself to be surprisingly compassionate, capable of developing deep relationships with his Pokemon. And his bond with his childhood Growlithe, adorably nicknamed Growly, is perhaps one of the most touching relationships in the whole series. Anyone who had a rough childhood, like James did, can tell you that a relationship with a pet can grow incredibly strong during that period, which is why James's backstory and the necessity for him to leave Growly twice is the incredibly dangerous combination of both heartbreaking and relatable. Number 8, the many, many Nurse Joys and Officer Jennies. You may have noticed in the Pokemon video games that the police officers and nurses are stock characters, so you could easily identify them in any given city. When it came time to make the anime, the animators decided to keep all the nurses and officers as identical stock characters, quickly making Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny one of the show's best running gags. The only explanation the characters offer is that they are related to one another. It's also one of the best meta phenomenon in the anime, and fans are obsessed with creating clone theories. Number 7, Metapod versus Metapod. If you ever played the games and you were an impatient person, you probably never took the time to train a Metapod, which is probably why you beat the Elite Four and Ash never has. Still, one of the worst Pokemon can lead to the most intense fight when facing a trainer who also sends out a Metapod. What's a Metapod to do except harden? Who can harden the hardest? Who can become the most- Okay, okay uh, we're not gonna touch that one. Point is, the battle literally lasts all afternoon, and no one really ends up winning, but it's a hilarious illustration of how straight up silly some Pokemon are. And really, the only Pokemon sillier is Spoink. It has to keep jumping or it dies. Number six, Jigglypuff gets mad. Everyone knows that Jigglypuff's signature move is Sing, and how that haunting melody is guaranteed to put your enemy, and anyone else within earshot, to sleep. Even though this is usually a brilliant strategy, Misty's Jigglypuff loves singing so much that it will close its eyes as it performs, and then is understandably upset when it realizes that its song has induced snores instead of applause. So what does Jigglypuff do? What any angry musician does when people don't pay attention to their music. It draws on the audience faces. This is especially excellent when Jigglypuff puts on a concert in a town square and, predictably, puts everyone to sleep. Jigglypuff must work the whole night to exact its revenge on an entire town. Maybe more bands should try this tactic if anyone's using their phone during a concert. Number 5, Meowth's Backstory. Team Rocket's Meowth spends most of the Pokemon series spitting sarcasm and sassy one-liners, which are a delight. But when one considers that he's one of the select few Pokemon who has full command of language, it becomes clear that there was more to Meowth than meets the eye. So it was a welcome gesture when the show finally hit us with Meowth's backstory. But boy, it was a doozy. Poor Meowth was abandoned as a baby and was always starving, and so he moves to Hollywood for ice cream and fried chicken. You know, the usual reasons people move to Hollywood. The story only gets sadder from there, revealing that he learned to walk and talk for the love of a she Meowth, who eventually just called him a freak. Who among us hasn't learned an entirely different language for love? Te espero, mi amor. It gave us a depth to a character that most shows would have left one-dimensional. It still never explained why he has a Jersey accent, though. He and Joey Wheeler should really talk about that. Number 4, Red Defeats Mewtwo. Pokemon Origins was something a lot of people always wanted to see. A telling of the story of the first games in anime form, where the protagonist was capable and Pikachu was underpowered at best. It's awesome, and it caps itself off in one of the most climactic battles in any young trainer's life, facing off against Mewtwo. Where the first movie chooses to explore the existential crisis of a Pokemon grown in a lab and how that might make a supervillain, the Pokemon Origins fight is content to capture the spirit of the battle itself. A level 70 demigod versus you and your best team of six. It's every bit as fierce as your childhood mind made it out to be. Mewtwo levels an Articuno with a single attack. Everything here is a well choreographed testament to the original fight that blends in some of the new games with the featuring of a Mega Evolution. Number 3. 
3, Butterflea Leaves Ash Forever. Metapod wasn't content to just take up one spot on this list, the evolved form of the Pokemon gets a well-deserved encore. Pokemon had its fair share of tear-jerking moments, and everyone felt this softer side of the series when Ash realizes his Butterfree wants to start a family, and sets him free. The tears and feelings shared between both Pokemon and owner is enough to make almost any audience member cry. The scene is a reminder of how life can drift us apart against our wishes. Number 2. The Squirtle Squad here Comes the Squirtle Squad was one of the most popular episodes of the original anime. Watching a gang of delinquent Squirtles terrorize our heroes and Team Rocket for the hell of it was an absolute delight. And it was clear the show's writers had a ball with them as well, working in as many cowboy and battle references as possible, as well as supplying the squad with ample opportunity to laugh in people's faces. And their sunglasses were so stylish. As far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest Pokemon mysteries is why Ash's Squirtle didn't keep the shades. I think we can all agree we could have stood a lot more Squirtle Squad in the series. And number one, Pikachu crying. Pikachu emerges as the first movie's pacifist hero. Ash is turned to stone in an attempt to stop Mewtwo and Mew from fighting, and Pikachu's compassion towards his master puts everyone else to shame. Before even Mr. Brock can run over, Pikachu is there, shaking Ash and trying desperately to revive him. And when that doesn't work, the waterworks come. And so we all learn that Pikachu crying is the saddest sight ever. No one wants to see something that adorable cry. Fortunately for our childhood memories, the tears pay off, and Ash is revived. But in a series supposedly about mastering and training Pokemon, Pikachu's display of devotion is arguably the most heroic and heartbreaking gesture in franchise history. If you're feeling really good about being the next Pokemon master after watching all those heartwarming Pokemon moments, just hold on a sec, alright? Being at the top comes at a price. If you're still feeling a little delusional, don't worry. We've got 14 reasons why you don't want to be a Pokemon master right here, right now. You want to be the very best like no one ever was? Well, the Pokemon world is full of challenges, and if you face them all, you just may be a Pokemon master. But is it worth it? I'm Kyle G, and today on Channel Frederator, we're going to talk about what separates the Poke Champions from the Poke Casuals, as we count down the top 14 reasons you might not want to be a Pokemon master. Number 14, the constant challenges. Trying to take a peaceful stroll? Not if any nearby trainers have anything to say about it. No Pokemon Master can turn down a challenge, so don't count on a quiet night out. It just might turn into a battle of fully trained fighting machines, or a less epic head-to-head -head between hardening Metapods. If you catch eyes with someone sharing that fighting spirit, then it's time to prove your worth. Number 13. Pokemon Poachers and Gangs Pokemon gangs are always coming up with an evil scheme, and you can't just stand by and let it happen. This can include protecting legendaries from the abusive hands of Team Galactic, stopping the climate-changing annex of Team Aqua and Team Magma, or thwarting the thieving plans of Team Rocket, even when their obsessions are a little odd. It's a Pika Palooza. We're at the Pika, our powers. Chew can say that again, Jez. <laughs> <laughs> Number 12, dealing with type advantages. Pokemon battles are a constant game of rock, paper, scissors, and being mindful of that is important when you want to be a master. So, if you start with fire, you might want to teach Solar Beam to deal with water, ground, or rock, but if they switch to a dragon type, you should switch to a fairy type. Unless you use Iron Tail, then you can switch to steel type to counter that, but it better pack a steel and take care of those fighting types, man. Whew, man, that's a lot. And on top of those, you have to watch for tricky trainers, like using arena sprinklers against your rock type, or that ride on horn as a lightning rod. Number 11, don't plan on any vacations. Even a cruise on a luxury ship is an excuse for a Pokemon master to take a break. Before you know it, it turns into an all out brawl between peers. And if that's not enough, chances are one of those aforementioned villainous teams may come along and break up the party. Forget about relaxing by the pool, a trainer is always on the job. Number 10, legendaries. With these godlike Pokemon flying around, causing havoc over some petty squabbles, what the heck are you supposed to do about it? Well, you better figure it out, future master. So sometimes you have to deal with the Pokemon poachers who are just pushing their buttons. Who can blame Zapdos' rage getting shoved into a cage like that? Okay, maybe it could release its anger in a more constructive way. Number 9. Tough Love you are spending every moment with your Pokemon team, so those bonds of friendship are bound to grow, right? Well, when that comes with a hug from 66 pounds of toxic acid, it gets a little dangerous. 
Is Victory Bell your toughest fighter? Then watch out, you'll be loved like a Venus flytrap loves its prey. Number 8. Paparazzi Fans don't sound bad until they are a constant factor of your day-to-day -day life. If the all-day challenges weren't enough, try sneaking up on a rare Pokemon with someone shoving a camera in your face. Some people seem to embrace it. Alright Gary, good luck hunting for Pokemon with that convertible and gaggle of cheerleaders following you around. Ugh. Number 7. The Endless Gym Battles Maybe it isn't so bad to get to the Pokemon League in one region, earning 8 badges there, but a Pokemon Master doesn't stop at one region. So you just completed Hoenn? Well, head on out to Sinnoh, or Kanto, or Johto, or Kalos, or Unova, or... Well, you get the picture. Better have some frequent flyer miles saved up because you're gonna have some traveling to do, buddy. Number 6. Contests Thought all there was to this Pokemon training thing was battles, huh? Well, think again. Turn that Mamo swine from beast to beauty and gear up to stun, shock, and awe during a Pokemon contest. Being a master at contest takes a lot of time, love, and a massive amount of poffins and candy to max out your Pokemon's individual style. And don't think you're let off the hook from the razzle-dazzle of contests. You're required to look like just as much of a diva as your Pokemon. Number 5. Feeding Pokemon Sure, maybe you can have your local professor take care of a lot of your Pokemon eating needs, but the party you have with you needs a healthy diet too. Now imagine having to feed 6 additional mouths a day, and I am not so sure the pellets you feed Baneri are going to satisfy that mad hungry Gyarados. And if you have a Snorlax, well... Snorlax, he's sleeping Pokemon. Snorlax isn't satisfied unless it eats at least 900 pounds of food per day. Number 4. Expensive being a Pokemon Master isn't exactly priceless. In addition to the previously mentioned Poke food expenses, you have to buy Pokeballs for every one of those Pokemon when trying to catch them all. On top of that, you have potions, camping supplies, cooking tools, and much, much more. Hope you saved well before starting your journey. I know when I was 10, I had maybe six bucks to my name. Number three, disobedient Pokemon. Have an awesome Charizard, but can't use them without crisping all the hair on your head? or an electric mouse that charges you like a cell phone, you need to crack that whip, friend. Being a master takes a fine balance of tough discipline and loving friendship, so keep working on it, unless you want burn marks on your entire wardrobe. Number two, your rival. That smug look, that condescending attitude, those two cool hairstyles, you just wanna punch them. But how would you test yourself without a rival pushing you at every turn? It may be oh so satisfying when you finally beat them, but the mental torture you endured along the way will last a lifetime. Number 1. Catch them all. The name of the game, the main part of the quest, the light at the end of the long, long tunnel. Completing the Pokedex and finally catching them all. Now maybe back in 1995 that wasn't so bad. A quick 150 and you're done? Easy. But now we are talking 721. Let me say that again, 721. If you caught one a week, that would still take over 13 years. And by then, how many more would be discovered? And I doubt getting those legendaries would be too easy to collect either. So in the end, is it worth it? And with new Pokemon discovered all the time and regions yet to explore, can you ever truly be a Pokemon master? Who am I kidding? This list doesn't dissuade you one bit, does it? Go get them, champion. Back when Pokemon had its 20th birthday, Frederator got some animators together and animated the original 151 in all sorts of different styles. Enjoy and let us know which one you like the best down in the comments. I'm partial to Scyther. To commemorate the 20th anniversary of Pokemon and the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon, members of the Channel Fredraider Network worked together to bring you the original 151 Pokemon animated in their own style. Let's check it out. Boba, 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 Shop! Ivy, push it. Sorry? No. Boba! Char, Charmander, Char, Char!
Magic Peck music. Bwom, 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 bwom. Magic Peck music. Bwom, 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 bwom. Magic Peck music. Bwom, 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 bwom.
Hit, 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 hit. Mann, 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 Mann. Oh no. Go Pokemon has been censored? How did that happen? If you're questioning everything right now, just like me, answers are on the way. Here are seven censored Pokemon episodes. When I say banned episode, you're probably thinking of something that skews a little more adult. Plenty of raunchy comedies have had jokes cut and episodes pulled, but it's a lot less common for shows that center on colorful cartoon monsters and the value of friendship. Hey guys, it's Alyssa with Channel Frederator, and today we're bringing you our top censored moments in Pokemon. So pull out the fainting couch and clutch your pearls, viewers, as we go into these censored moments. <laughs> We begin with a tale of intrigue, excitement, and snacks. One curious phenomenon that's visible through much of the Pokemon franchise is the need to adapt bits and pieces of Japanese culture throughout the Pokemon world in a way that made sense to an American audience. Sometimes that meant crudely inserting a sandwich over another food item, or calling traditional Shinto protection talismans anti-ghost stickers instead. But perhaps the most famously unwieldy attempt to render Pokemon culturally neutral for the English-speaking world came in the show's 25th episode, Primate Goes Banana 
bananas, where Ash's traveling companion, the rock type specialist Brock, introduces a batch of onigiri, or stuffed rice balls, as a jelly donut. Now, your standard onigiri is going to come with a filling, but you're more likely to find pickled plum, or some kind of fish inside, than strawberry jelly. And while Brock is known for his permanently closed eyes, even he ought to be able to tell the difference between a donut and the fluffy white pyramids he's holding. Rice balls have made frequent appearances throughout the show's history, under a variety of synonyms, but real donuts wouldn't get their fair shake in the Pokemon world until 2016's Sun and Moon, which introduced Malasadas, a fried dough treat of Portuguese origin that's popular in Hawaii. Of course, cultural standards vary on more than just donuts. Different countries can have widely varying views on the kind of violence that's acceptable for younger audiences. And in spite of all the time Ash and his Pokemon spend being zapped, blasted, and set on fire, one episode failed to make it across the Pacific, where the danger got a little too real. In The Legend of Dratini, originally the 35th episode of the series in Japan, Ash and his friends find their way to the Safari Zone, a park full of rare and exotic Pokemon, including the titular dragon. But they quickly find themselves tangling with a gun-toting Safari Warden, and things only escalate from there when Team Rocket's Jesse and James arrive, up to their usual brand of incompetent villainy. At a time in the late 90s when Pokemania was at its peak, the series was facing heavy scrutiny from media and parents parents who are utterly confused by the cartoon monster obsession. It's not hard to imagine a skittish TV exec axing an episode that sees its 10-year-old protagonist held at gunpoint. While the show's Monster of the Week format meant that the episode's absence was largely unnoticed by the large audience at the time, it does feature Ash catching an entire herd of Tauros, whose reoccurring appearances in the later series go mostly unexplained. If you spent the last 18 years wondering about that load of bulls, now you know. We've looked at some cuts and alterations made for an American audience out of what might be called an excess of caution. Certainly, the efforts taken to remove anything as self-explanatory as a rice ball seem a bit silly, but this next censorship came at a time when the world was in a delicate state and precaution was necessary. The aftermath of 9-11 in the US saw widespread efforts to clear the airwaves of imagery that was too close to the national tragedy, and Pokemon was no different. Two episodes from the show's early run were temporarily pulled from rotation. Episode 19, Tentacool and Tentacruel, featured the eponymous jellyfish Pokemon grown to gargantuan proportions to run amok through a city, toppling buildings in its path with obvious and troubling associations. On the other hand, episode 23, The Tower of Terror, was nicked simply for its unfortunate title. Another episode continued to run while its name changed, swapping the unfortunate A Scare in the Sky for Spirits in the Sky. Ultimately, none of the three would remain altered or off the air permanently, but the incident stands as a memory of just how shaken the country found itself at the end of 2001. Even the youthful innocence of Pokemon did not go unaffected. There has also been times when the cultural disconnect between the East and the West has led the franchise's Japanese creators to produce something that unintentionally crossed the line overseas. If you've been keeping track at home, you might notice that there's a Pokemon from the original batch that has almost never appeared on US television. Jinx, an oddball ice psychic hybrid, was designed to evoke certain traditional monsters as well as the provocative Gen Girl fashion trend a style that emerged in Japan in the mid-90s and saw young women dousing themselves in spray tan and bleaching their hair. But no matter the intent, Jinx's pitch black face and pronounced lips made it the spitting image of a racist caricature in the eyes of American viewers. And after the original airing of the one early episode, Holiday High Jinx, public outcry would quickly lead to Jinx's removal from American broadcasts, including a second Jinx-heavy episode that aired in Japan in 2002. In the long run, Jinx would receive a franchise-wide makeover that gave her a purple face, but several early episodes of the series that feature brief appearances of the original design have remained out of circulation. Up to now, whether it's been a case of donut confusion or an ice type in the need of a makeover, we focus on times that the show has been edited or pulled entirely from the US. But Pokemon has faced censorship in its own home country of Japan as well, for some truly unfortunate reasons. While there have been episodes pulled from rotation after as little as one airing, more on that later, there have actually been three episodes that have never made it to air at all. We start with what would have been been the 101st episode of the Advanced Generation Era of the series. It's centered on two water ground types, Wishcash and Burboach, whose designs and abilities draw a link between catfish and earthquakes in Japanese folklore. It's believed that catfish are able to predict earthquakes, and there's even a giant catfish in Japanese mythology called Onumazu, who lives beneath Japan and causes the earth to shake as he thrashes about. But the catfish would not have their day, since not long before the episode was due to air in November of 2004, a major earthquake struck the Niigata region of Japan. It caused widespread damage and became, at the time, the deadliest quake to strike the country since 1995. The episode was cancelled, and any earth-shaking battle techniques have been avoided since. Unfortunately, that's not the last time Japan saw a tragic earthquake. In 2011, 
Tohoku region in the northeast was struck by a massive earthquake and accompanying tsunami that led to the nuclear disaster of Fukushima, which ranks as the financially costliest natural disaster in history. While it's trivial to note in the light of the human toll of the disaster, there were two episodes of Pokemon that were canceled in its wake. A two-parter in the series Black and White Generation that depicted a confrontation between rival baddies Team Rocket and Team Plasma. No insensitive material this time, simply two episodes that got lost in the shuffle as airtime was shifted to more important things. Luckily, not every episode cut in Pokemon's history has happened under such somber circumstances. We're getting into our final stretch here, and for our penultimate Pokemon pick, there's no way we could overlook what might just be the strangest item on this list. An episode that broke the American taboo on lewd content in children's entertainment in a ridiculous fashion. The show's 18th episode, Beauty and the Beach, centers around a swimsuit competition. So right off the bat, we're in territory that's out of place in a realm of a Saturday morning cartoon, especially when we throw preteen gym leader Misty into the mix. But the episode's infamy doesn't come from showing a little skin. And really, there's a lot of skin. It doesn't even come from the old man who flirts with Misty, who is, let's be clear, 10 years old. No, the moment in which the beauty in the beach goes too far is when, in an attempt to win the bikini competition and secure the prize money for themselves, Team Rocket takes the stage. Both of them. That includes James wearing a bodysuit with giant inflatable... Let's just say James really gets in touch with his feminine side in this episode. It's more bizarre than any Anything else, but someone in charge of the show decided that a grown man driving a 10 year old to tears with a superior chest size was not something they wanted to be held accountable for, especially airing in between episodes of Animaniacs and Batman. Beauty and the Beach would eventually run as a lost episode, cut down to a brisk 18 minute runtime by the removal of its more suspect elements. But for children of that era, the era when Pokemania was raging and the internet was young and full of hearsay, the legend of a banned Pokemon swimsuit episode may never die. But if there's one incident that's more infamous than James's ill-advised costume decision, there's this one. A moment so iconic that it broke into the public consciousness and was even parodied in The Simpsons. This episode of Pokemon had an unfortunate effect on several hundred Japanese children and adults at the time. We're talking, of course, about Electric Soldier Porygon, widely known as the Seizure episode. On an ordinary Tuesday in December of 1997, Japanese fans were treated to an unpleasant surprise when a strobe light effect in the episode caused them to experience a range of adverse symptoms, all the way up to seizures and vomiting. The episode was aired just once before being locked away for all time. It never left Japan, and Porygon and his evolutions have been almost completely absent from the show ever since. But the more surprising part in all of this is that it wasn't Porygon's attack that managed to do so much damage to viewers. In the episode, Ash and friends travel into a kind of pokey internet where Team Rocket is disrupting the transfer of other trainers' beloved fighting animals between Pokemon centers. And though it's Porygon who helps them make their way through the computer and stop the rockets from taking off with a horde of digital monsters, it's actually Pikachu who comes to the team's defense when they're attacked by the system's own antivirus. Pikachu's Thunderbolt takes out the antivirus's missiles, which explode in rapidly alternating red and blue lights that fill the screen for several seconds, which cause the seizures. So perhaps the greatest scandal in all of Pokemon is not a banned episode at all, but the injustice dealt to one innocent Pokemon. Porygon, as it turns out, is a noble creature unfairly burdened with a grim reputation, and Pikachu, who is the one that caused the problem all along, has avoided punishment appearing in almost every episode of the series since. What did Porygon know that made Pikachu want to silence him? There's no telling how deep this conspiracy goes, but that's another topic for another video. Everyone loves Pokemon. It's a pop culture staple and spans generations of fans. No wonder it's referenced so often in other media. Heck, it even references itself sometimes. That's the kind of legacy we're rocking with here. Enjoy this trio of videos cataloging Pokemon references. Plus, a video discussing the best Pokemon parodies on the internet. From hip hop lyrics to political taglines, there's no escaping Pokemon's influence on pop culture. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're digging even deeper this time to unleash references from modern hits as well as some deep cuts that only the very best will remember. So grab your potions and kiss your mama goodbye because we're on the road to more Pokemon references in cartoons that Pokemon fans should know. <laughs> Wano and Ling Ling, Kappa Mikey and Drawn Together respectively. Pikachu is the adorable red-cheeked face of the franchise, so whenever a cartoon wants to pay homage to the series, it serves up its own tweaked version of Pikachu. Take American Dad for instance, where Toshi wears an off-brand Pikachu shirt, or Steven Universe, where Steven has a figurine of a Pikachu Moogle love child. Some shows though go the extra mile by making their Pikachu parodies main characters. The show Kappa Mikey, about an American cartoon actor who stars in a fictional Japanese anime, features a 
snarky purple Pikachu doppelganger named Guano. He also happens to be the director and writer of the show within the show, Lily Moo. While he's the brains of the operation, on Lily Moo, he's just a magical creature that can only say his own name. Sound familiar? Then we've got Ling Ling from Drawn Together. Like Kappa Mikey, the show pokes fun at animation stereotypes by sticking them all in a house together, Big Brother style. Ling Ling was the show's archetypical Asian battle monster, armed to the teeth with supernatural abilities and always speaking in, well, it's not Japanese, but it's definitely in the ballpark. Ling Ling is also quite homicidal and even used their powers to disembowel their former trainer named, wait for it, Gash. Yeah, and you thought that the original Pikachu was a jerk. Adventure Time, Joshua and Margaret Investigations. Pokemon games are always named after flashy gemstones, colors, celestial bodies of some kind, letters, but sometimes subtlety is the name of the game. Some references aren't as in your face as those off-color, vaguely identifiable mouse monsters with names like Pico Chump. While I can definitely imagine Adventure Time having just such a character, they decided to go for a more subdued route. In the episode Joshua and Margaret Investigations, Margaret bursts open the doors to her weapons room to reveal an arsenal of axes, bows, cleavers, daggers, and a dang Pokeball. It's a neat little nod from the acclaimed show, and the Pokeball deserves to find itself in such a deadly arsenal. After all, we don't know what Pokemon is in there. And do we even know how it converts living beings into light to store them in a seemingly endless stasis until they're needed again? However it works, here's hoping that Finn breaks out an Ultra Ball in the series finale and uses it to capture the Lich. Garage Band Super Zeros. Garage Band certainly doesn't have the same name recognition that Pokemon does, so if this is your first time hearing about the show, let me give you the lowdown. It's a Canadian cartoon about an indie band made by the creators of Total Drama. Are you sold or are you very sold? In the episode Super Zeros, the band's lead guitarist Corey discovers that their fans go wild over gimmicks. Their fans, of course, being the little kids attending the parties that they play at. In order to harness that raw fandom, Corey pitches a series of gimmicks to his bandmates that they can exploit as party performers. Some of these include dressing band members as clowns, performing as a cowboy band, and dressing as something with tails, which Corey demonstrates by putting on a purple Pikachu costume. There's no mistaking those ears and that tail, even if they are purple. What, am I supposed to think that Corey is dressed up as guano? Ultimately, though, the band picks up an episode-long superhero gimmick instead. So did Corey's Pikachu gimmick sell you on Garage Band? Let us know in the comments, and maybe we'll find 106 more facts about that show for you. The Powerpuff Girls, Super Zeros. In an unrelated coincidence, the Powerpuff Girls also has an episode called Super Zeros, in which they also try to be more conveniently gimmicky superhero characters, and which also contains a Pokemon reference. Small world, huh? All right, let me set the scene here. The Powerpuff Girls, believing that they need to become better heroes, emulate some of their favorite comic book stars, all of whom are also parodies of popular characters, by the way. This rebrand comes with a downside. They have to find new transportation methods. No more busting out the window in three streaks of light. This acceptably on-brand transportation is slower, so the girls take much longer to actually get to the crime scene than they usually do. As the mayor of Townsville eagerly awaits their arrival, he checks his watch, which has a Jigglypuff lookalike smack dab in the center of it. It's a cute nod to the Pokemon anime in an already parody-filled episode. Man, if I was back in the year 2000 and I didn't have my phone all the time, I would be all about getting that watch because that is adorable. The Cleveland Show ain't nothing but mutton bustin'. Just leave it to a Seth MacFarlane show to supply you with your daily dose of pop culture references. While we're shocked that Pokemon hasn't made more of an appearance on Family Guy, it does pop up in an unexpected way in Family Guy's spin-off, The Cleveland Show. In the episode Ain't Nothing But Mutton Bustin', Donna suggests that Cleveland spends more time with her son Rollo. So Cleveland and Rollo go to the county fair to do some father-son bonding. At the fair, there's a booth that is loaded with non-copyright infringing knockoffs of other characters. Among them are Bart, I mean, uh, Bort Simpson, Brian and Stewie from Family Guy, a weird off-brand blue Spider-Man, and Gengar. Yes, Generation 1's Big Bad Ghost Pokemon has been ripped off and hawked at the county fair. That same Gengar knockoff doll appears in the episode Murray Christmas. In that episode, Rollo smuggles his new Jewish friend home for the holidays, but has to hide him when his mom comes in. Murray blends in with a pile of dolls in Rollo's closet, and among them is the knockoff Gengar. Codename Kids Next Door, Operation Archive. The Pokemon themselves aren't the only ones who get to do some show hopping. Ash Ketchum, always off exploring new lands on his journey to become a Pokemon master, also apparently finds his way into other cartoons. In the Codename Kids Next Door episode, Operation Archive, a kid who looks suspiciously like Ash can be seen at the Kids Next Door moon base endorsing a plan to destroy the adult's coffee source. From the red and white cap to the blue vest to the green backpack, that loud getup can belong to no one 
else but Pallet Town's own Ash Ketchum. Hey, the kid had to be doing something before he took off on that decades-long Pokemon journey. And he's not the only monster training anime character that has had a cameo on Kids Next Door. Yugi Moto from Yu-Gi-Oh! appeared in Operation IT, so we know that those animators were keeping their eyes on all the early 2000s anime hits. Come to think of it, Ash is actually probably the best recruit the Kids Next Door could have. Hasn't he been 10 for like 20 years now? Now that is commitment to the cause. Osmosis Jones. For those of us who grew up playing the Pokemon games and watching the anime, the series really became a part of us. But for those living in the world of Osmosis Jones, Pikachu is literally a part of them. To give some quick background, Osmosis Jones was a hybrid live action animated adventure movie about a white blood cell named Ozzy and his cold pill companion Drix as they fight off a deadly virus inside the body of a zookeeper, Bill Murray. In the film's darkest moment, their case is forcibly closed, Ozzy is fired, and Drix is given a one-way ticket to, uh, number one. As Ozzy rushes to stop Drix from leaving, you can see one of the germs carrying a Pikachu. Even weirder, it's not a Pico Chump or a Pokemon, that's straight up a Pikachu. Some fans have taken this to be an allusion to the real-life human protein Pikachurin, which was named after the Pokemon thanks to its lightning-fast moves. However, that protein wasn't discovered and named until after Osmosis Jones came out. So, what do you think that Pikachu is doing inside this grown man's body? Cross-promotion by Warner Brothers? A bad Pika pun? Let us know in the comments. Mad. Cartoon Network's Mad TV series had all the parodic sensibilities of South Park or Robot Chicken, but with kids' shows as source material. The Pokemon Park segment, which hybridizes Pokemon and Jurassic Park, begins with a Pikachu tearing someone apart with his tiny little hands. Sounds more like Ling Ling to me, but with those characters, I guess we're just splitting hairs at this point. This segment features the cast of the anime as characters from the original Jurassic Park movie and takes place on an island inhabited by wild, vicious pocket monsters. And this is just one of Mad's numerous Pokemon-centric sketches. There's also Poke Monsters Inc., wherein Ash is unleashed upon the world of Monsters Inc. and proceeds to catch them all in a relentless kidnapping spree. And Mad also aired a Poke Harmony segment about a dating app for Pokemon. You know, for when mass breeding with a ditto at the daycare just loses its spark. These are just a handful of Mad's numerous references, but they do tell us one thing. All you gotta do is slap the poke prefix on any pop culture thing and you've got yourself a sketch. More miscellaneous knockoffs. We can't even count the number of shows that have riffed on Pokemon by introducing a trading card or a video game with a parody title. Plenty of shows do it and not all of them are worth a full entry on this list. In our last references video, we talked about Pikimon Get, the Pokemon Go spoof from The Simpsons, Dopey Man from Arthur, and who could forget Chin Pokemon from South Park. Those are only a few from the vast Pokédex of pastiche, but here's a few more for your decks. Gnome Cop from Jackie Chan Adventures, Hokemon from The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Tinymon from Johnny Test, Llama Balls from The Emperor's New School, and Ajimbo from Recess. Wild references are all around us! Pokemon is so big that there's no escaping it, even if you tried. So it's no surprise that countless cartoons across the globe allude to the popular franchise. From creators back in the day who saw their kids fall in love with Pikachu, to current showrunners who grew up training these lovable monsters on their Game Boy. Referencing Pokemon has become a part of everyday life. Hey, I'm Ash Ketch, I mean, I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator, and we're about to catch every Pokemon reference in cartoons that Pokemon fans should know. Here we go. <laughs> Arthur. Arthur loses his marbles. Back in the day when Pokemon was at its initial peak, so was the admired children's series Arthur. It was during this time that the Pokemon trading card craze was also a widespread phenomenon, to the point where schools were even banning them, even though they were essentially just hard paper with drawings of really cool looking monsters on them. Especially holographic Charizard, am I right? So in 2002, Arthur released the episode, Arthur Loses His Marbles. Immediately after Arthur introduces the episode, we see Muffy talk about the gift she received for her birthday. And the first gift she brags about? Her 54 new Dopeymon cards. And Binky is pretty impressed that she got a Stinkachu. Clearly, this is a nod to Pokemon and Pikachu, though it may not be the kindest considering the show's choice to rename them. It even seems that, like Pikachu, Stinkachu is the most popular Dopeymon in the Arthur universe, since Binky got so excited about it. And you know what? Pokemon fans were pumped about this parody as well. 
It was one of the first to spoof Pokemon and pave the way for many other, less stinky, references to come. So, how about us Poke fans group together to embrace this smelly Pikachu doppelganger just like we came together to adore Mimikyu? Steven Universe, Rose's Room. Throughout Steven Universe, there are tiny details that Pokemon fans catch on to, from bubble gems bearing a resemblance to Pokeballs, to Steven telling items, I choose you. And since Rose's Room purposely references several video games, such as Earthbound and Final Fantasy, of course they couldn't skip out on Pokemon. As Steven plays Golf Quest Mini, he meets a professor in the game, much like how you meet a professor when starting a Pokemon title. But can a professor just be a professor? Sure, but when that NPC says gonna sink them all, it becomes a bit more obvious where he was inspired from. Later on in the same episode, Steven goes to an illusionary town, which is glitching. In fact, the music that plays during this scene has been named Glitch City, which is a Pokemon reference in and of itself. For those who don't know, Glitch City is a term Pokemon gamers use to discuss maps with invalid title data, specifically in Generation 1 games. Clever. We love a smart reference. The Simpsons, postcards from the wedge. If you haven't caught on while binging reruns of The Simpsons, the famous cartoon family is definitely a fan of Pokemon in one way or another. Our proof? Homer has played Pokemon Go, Maggie has worn a Pikachu costume several times over, and Bart has had a nightmare featuring the electric mouse in Bart vs. Lisa vs. the Third Grade. But the most iconic reference to Pokemon in The Simpsons comes from the episode Postcards from the Wedge. In it, Bart procrastinates from doing his homework by watching Digibot, or as we know it, the Pokemon anime, as made obvious by Ash and, of course, Pikachu on screen. Bart then asks, How how did this show stay so fresh? The joke here is that Bart's comment is poking fun at both Pokemon and The Simpsons, since both series have been around for a long, long, long time. Yeah, I know. It's especially clear that the artists knew what they were talking about, since they drew Ash in his diamond and pearl outfit. It almost feels like they're saying that the anime feels so fresh because small things about the show, such as Ash's clothes, keep changing. Whereas in The Simpsons, nothing really changes. And that's not even the best part about this reference. The episode dropped the same day that Soul Silver and Heart Gold, the remakes of Silver and Gold, came out in the United States. Talk about good timing. The Amazing World of Gumball, The Uncle. We've already gone over how The Amazing World of Gumball is chock full of references in a few of our previous videos, so we'll make this one short. The Uncle is full of Nintendo illusions left and right, but there's one that just makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside. When Gumball gets off the bus to head back home, he's whistling a familiar tune. There's no mistaking to that melody, it's Kanto's Route 1. Why do we like this tiny little reference so much? Route 1 is the theme that plays when the player goes to Pallet Town, their hometown, which is extremely appropriate seeing as Gumball thought he was headed home. Aww. Teen Titans Go, Man Person. Okay, we know. How dare we put Teen Titans Go on this list? But we do have to admit, while the show is no original Teen Titans, it does have some pretty good references here and there. Such is the case in Man Person, where Beast Boy starts losing his body parts so that he can replace them with new robotic ones. Knowing this is not a good idea, Robin and Cyborg go on a mission to collect all of Beast Boy's appendages. After they collect the final piece, one of his eyes, Robin and Cyborg high-five. Surrounding their high-five are the words, caught em all, in a familiar blue and yellow font style. The official Pokemon font of the English logo is written in. Plus, a blue silhouetted Pikachu is the period on the exclamation mark, which is a nice touch. Not to mention that obviously, caught em all is a riff off of gotta catch em all, the king of all Pokemon mottos, except for Team Rocket's motto. Nothing beats that one. Also, Teen Titans Go? Pokemon Go? Coincidence? Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. Gravity Falls, Double Dipper. In our favorite mystery town, there's an average fan of Pokemon, Dipper. Well, sort of. Dipper's actually a fan of Monstermon, which is a parody of our beloved franchise, but we'll take it. While we don't get to see much of Monstermon, we do learn that Dipper considers himself to be a connoisseur of the series. So much so that it's a part of his written step plan to win over Wendy. On that list, step 19 says, display Monstermon knowledge, whereas number 20 states, do not display Monstermon knowledge. Looks like someone can't decide if knowing a lot about imaginary monsters is a good or a bad thing. Psst. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Ho oh, Dipper, you lovable nerd. Ben 10 Omniverse, Catfight. Fishing is a big part of Pokemon, right? And using your trusty old rod just wouldn't be the same without Magikarp. Well, for a very brief moment in Ben 10 Omniverse, we see the pathetic excuse for a Pokemon, which is a description by the Pokedex in Omega Ruby, not necessarily us. Max Tennyson and Sheriff Watson competitively fish at the docks and end up catching two familiar-looking sea creatures. 
Magikarp, and Gyarados. And while hooking in Gyarados is impressive, it's not like Sheriff Watson can partake in Magikarp jump with that catch, right? Gonna say that Grandpa Max is the real winner here. South Park, Chin Pokemon. Of course, South Park couldn't stay away from Pokemon. It's a huge cultural phenomena, and they love poking fun at those. So in season three, they went ahead and created a whole episode about their version of Pokemon, Chin Pokemon. By the way, Chin Poko actually means small penis in Japanese. Um. Yeah, anyway, the episode mainly deals with the issue and escalation of fads, since Chimp Pokemon becomes a huge craze with the third graders in town. Throughout the episode, there are allusions to Pokemon, from the monsters themselves looking a lot like mutated versions of Pikachu, Meowth, and others, to the Chimp Pokemon show starring alternate designs of Ash and James. Nearly every scene has something to do with parroting Pokemon. This episode of South Park also tackled the controversial Electric Soldier Porygon episode, which apparently sent several children to the hospital after they viewed the episode and suffered a seizure, by killing Kenny off with an epileptic seizure that happens while he's playing a Chin Pokemon game. But Chin Pokemon didn't end there. Apart from Chin Pokemon merchandise appearing in the background of several episodes, it made a comeback in both the Stick of Truth video game and in season 20's episode, The End of Serialization as We Know It. In this episode, Ike's internet history shows that he searched new Chin Pokemon Alolan region at 7.29 p.m. on Saturday, November 19th, 2016. Earlier that day, he also Googled Chin Pokemon Sun and Moon. You don't need me to tell you those searches are directly about the new Alola region in the Pokemon games. Sure, Ike may have added an extra O in his spelling, but it definitely looks like the fad in South Park didn't completely end. Even if it did have uh, ulterior motives in the original episode. Bonus, Rick and Morty game and promo. This doesn't exactly happen in the show, but Rick and Morty has nodded to Pokemon in a masterful way. First off, the mobile game Pocket Mortys is a direct parody of Pokemon. In it, you can catch different types of Mortys and make them battle. Not to mention that Morty has four different moves he can use, and the battle screens look uncannily like those in Pokemon games. But we're here to talk about cartoons, not games. So uh, check out the leaderboard for all of that. Wink, wink. The animated division of Rick and Morty went the extra mile. In a short, pixelated promo, scientists Rick and youngster Morty battle with their Mr. Meeseeks on what looks uncannily like a Pokemon stadium. Not to mention, scientist Rick, youngster Morty. Come on, that just screams Pokemon trainers. <clears throat> anyway, the Mr. Meeseeks duke it out epically, especially since a Mr. Meeseeks duty is to fully comply with a mission until it's completed. But what's really special about this short is that it's pixelated. Every single pixel had to be put in place to make each frame work, and it helped keep an authentic feel of the earlier Pokemon games, which were pixelized up to the fifth generation. The amount of time and dedication that it took to make this little homage didn't go unnoticed amongst Poke fans. Pokemon Generations gives us a look at some key moments from 20 years of Pokemon games fully animated. The series aims to explore these moments from the games more in depth, and while each episode itself is overtly a reference, we're going to dive deeper into some of the nitty gritty things you may have missed. Hi, I'm JD with Channel Frederator, and if you're like some of my friends, you might have stopped playing the games. And as we're 9 episodes into Pokemon Generations at the time of writing this, you are probably going to need some explaining to get you caught up. So grab your Pikachu themed notepad, cause we're here to explain, or Pokesplain, to help you get through the 9 game references in Pokemon Generations so far. Let's get started. <laughs> Number 9. Regional Reimaginings, Season 1, Episode 1, The Adventure. Pokemon Generation starts off with the most in-your-face reference to the video game series. In case you're unaware of the series' intentions, it begins with a one-minute intro that's sure to bring out all sorts of nostalgia. Right when the episode starts, we're greeted with the Game Freak logo, the Nidorino vs. Gengar battle, and even the Pokemon Start screen. Everything is exactly the way it used to be. And then the animation takes over the screen. We're treated to some of the most memorable locations across six generations of Pokemon games, including the Viridian Forest, Ecritique City, the Weather Institute, Snowpoint Temple, the Desert Ruin, and the Terminus Cave. Best of all, in the Terminus Cave, we see Zygarde in his complete form, which hadn't been seen in the games yet, until its recent debut in Pokemon Sun and Moon in November 2016, already one step ahead in its first episode. Number eight, Lance's Lake, season one, episode four, The Lake of Rage. Episode 4, The Lake of Rage, shows the other side of what happened when the player and Lance infiltrated the Team Rocket HQ in Mahogany Town. In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the player teams up with Lance, but the team up is less side by side battling, and more like split up and try to catch up when Lance runs ahead, leaving us to battle all the Team Rocket grunts. For those of you who don't remember, there are 10 Team Rocket grunts and scientists to battle. 
Thanks, Lance. However, in The Lake of Rage, there's more to the tale. As it turns out, the player, or Ethan, is just a distraction while Lance and Dragonite infiltrate the hideout. In the episode, Lance fights off five Team Rocket members in a horde battle, while in the games, multi-battles weren't even possible until Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. I know we're doing great things to help out Pokemon and everything, but after watching Lance's Dragonite absolutely wreck Team Rocket grunts in Pokemon Generations, I kind of feel like he didn't really need me there in Gold and Silver. I mean, the guy wipes out five Pokemon with one flamethrower. How much can a 10-year-old kid really help? Number 7. Kyogre's Climate Change Season 1, Episode 8, The Cavern Oh, who lives in a cavern on the seafloor? Primal Kyogre! Our next reference takes us to Episode 8, The Cavern, where we see Primal Kyogre awaken and proceed to whip up some seriously nasty storms. In Alpha Sapphire, after Archie awakens Primal Kyogre, all we really see is a dark sky and some raindrops. This is obviously due to some technical limitations of the 3DS, but it's not all that scary for a storm that allegedly threatens to destroy Hoenn. However, in the cavern, the animation helps highlight the actual danger and destruction that a massive whale-like physical manifestation of the ocean can cause. With devastating winds, waves, and water spouts, you actually get the feeling that Primal Kyogre is going to destroy the world. Remember when you were younger and wished Pokemon were real? Might want to take that wish back after watching this episode. Number 6. Pokey Plagiarism Season 1, Episode 7, The Vision This one doesn't require much analyzing. After battling their way through the Team Magma hideout in Omega Ruby, players are faced with confronting Courtney for the third time. She acts as Maxie's last line of defense, while he and the rest of Team Magma try to escape to the seafloor cavern. However, the battle with Courtney lasts long enough for Maxie to escape, much to the player's discontent. In the episode, right before her battle with Brendan, Magma admin Courtney pays homage to a specific character from the games, herself. Courtney delivers almost the exact same lines as her game counterpart, with only a few words being different. I mean, we know Generations is pulling from the Pokemon games as source material, but come on, Courtney, at least be a bit more pleasant. In Omega Ruby, the player talks to Courtney a handful of times, and I always got the vibe she was a bit weird, but after hearing Courtney talk, it's official. She is way creepier than I ever imagined. Uh, where's my old nightlight? Number 5. Tower Tales, Season 1, Episode 6, The Reawakening. You kids and your fancy animations. Back in my day, if we wanted a story of the burned tower, we had to mash our A button and read the tale. While walking 10 miles to the bus stop, uphill, both ways, in the snow. Okay, maybe not that last part. But the part about reading is true. The Reawakening takes what was previously a wall of text, the story of the burned tower, and turns it into a beautifully animated and fascinating tale that fills out the mythology of Johto. As the story goes, the brass tower in Ecritique City was struck by lightning, burned down, and three nameless Pokemon died in the flames. After their deaths, Ho-Oh flew down and resurrected the Pokemon, who are said to embody three powers, the lightning that struck the tower, the fire that burned it, and the rain that extinguished it. Reading the story is one thing, but seeing the amazing beast trio come to life through Ho-Oh's magic is nothing short of spectacular, and witnessing Ho-Oh's power makes catching the legendary bird that much more epic in the games. Number 4, Looky Looky Looker, Season 1, Episode 2, The Chase. The Chase tells us what happens the exact moment after the player beats Giovanni, and also introduces Looker to Kanto. Looker is an international police officer who travels the world in search of villainous Pokemon organizations. Since being introduced in Pokemon Platinum, Looker has been a mainstay to the Pokemon series ever since, so it's great to see him retroactively added to Kanto as the agent in charge of taking down Giovanni. We all know Giovanni is a bad dude, but to see a SWAT team equipped with Arcanines, Magnemites, and Machamps busting down the doors of the Viridian Gym is not only badass entertainment, but it proves that Giovanni was a high-profile target. Throughout the episode, we also find out that being the Viridian City gym leader was just a cover for Giovanni, which is partially why he flees after losing to two kids. As the episode ends, Giovanni walks off into the distance, and while Looker may not know where Giovanni ran off to, we do. In a special event in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, it's revealed that Giovanni has been hiding out at Tojo Falls, waiting to hear from Team Rocket. With Giovanni on the outs, this led to a vacancy at the Viridian City gym, which we all know after a couple years was filled by Blue. Number 3. Dear Old Dad Season 1, Episode 5, The Legacy We see Looker again in The Legacy, talking to our rival, Silver, about his father, Giovanni. This actually isn't the first time we've learned about Giovanni and Silver's rocky relationship. It was fully fleshed out in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, but only a select number of Poké fans knew the truth. When Heart Gold and Soul Silver came out, a special event called Celebi was released, and players lucky enough to get Celebi were treated to a remarkable secret. If players brought the Celebi to the Ilex Forest Shrine, they were transported back in time to view a scene of Giovanni and Silver arguing, just like in the Generations episode, which reveals that Giovanni is Silver's father. However, Silver only explicitly called Giovanni his father in the Japanese version of the game, and it was edited out of the American version for, I don't know, 
know, some reason, leaving thousands of players to internationally quarrel about the truth. But Generations has spoken, and now we know the truth worldwide. You know, I used to hate Silver when I was younger, but now I kind of feel for the kid in a weird, red-headed Luke Skywalker kind of way. It's not his fault he's got abandonment issues. Number 2. Blue's Blues Season 1, Episode 3, The Challenger Blue was the original rival, and The Challenger actually takes some time out to develop Blue as a character. Of course, Blue is just as arrogant as we imagined, but the episode also clarifies that life hasn't always been easy for the grandson of Professor Oak. When Pokemon Red and Blue came out, we only had Gary Oak as the definitive version of Blue, and Gary was a bit of a jerk. But in Generations, we discover more about our pointy-haired rival. In the episode, when Agatha compares Blue to his grandpa, Blue immediately snaps at her and calls his grandpa an old man, showing everyone that Blue and his gramps don't exactly get along. It makes sense that Blue would hold some resentment towards Professor Oak, especially when you consider the fact that the guy can never remember his own grandson's name. Not to mention, it's lovely to see Blue battling it out with the Elite Four and rising to the position of champion, since the only version of Blue I ever saw was the one getting stomped out by my Charizard. I don't know about you, but after watching Blue gain the title of Kanto Champion, I'm about to go dig out my copy of Pokemon Red and reclaim my title. Number 1. Space Scoop Season 1, Episode 9, The Scoop Episode 9 is a love letter to the Delta episode, a special part of the Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire remakes that weren't a part of the original Ruby and Sapphire games. In the Delta episode, players travel into space riding on Rayquaza. Yeah, you heard that right, riding Rayquaza, to destroy a meteorite, which itself is incredibly awesome. When the meteorite shatters, a black triangle remains, starts moving around, and reveals itself to be Deoxys. And almost exactly the same moment occurs in glorious animated HD in Generations. The Generations episode fleshes out an awesome in-game moment even more, and we get to see Rayquaza and Deoxys fight, which is better than any pay-per-view boxing match I've ever seen. And add to that a little bit of government conspiracy in the Moss Deep Space Center, and Episode 9 has everything you could need, in just a 4 minute short. Of course, how can we not mention when Brandon or May catches Deoxys with, wait for it, an Ultra Ball. Just one Ultra Ball. No Master Ball needed. I mean, come on, was there any question that this was going to be the top moment? It's too awesome. Hey guys, my name is Casey and this is Cartoon Central on Channel Frederator, where we show you cartoons that we love. This week on Cartoon Central, we are looking at Pokemon. Our number three cartoon this week is called Poke Awesome, Another Pokemon Battle by Egoraptor. In this cartoon, there are two trainers who are having a Pokemon battle. So Pikachu and Venusaur are currently duking it out when some funny things happen. <laughs> oh, hey, Pikachu, I choose you, go! Pikachu! Pikachu uses Thunderbolt! One thing that I love about all the Pokemon parodies that I've watched is that no trainer has above average intelligence. All of them are dumb as sticks. And that is true of this cartoon as well. In this cartoon, the trainers don't remember their move sets. They like will do dumb things that will actively hurt their Pokemon, like unbeknownst to them because they're such idiots. So there's a very good chance that you've seen this cartoon because it has a ton of views, but I really didn't feel like I could talk about Pokemon parodies without talking about this cartoon. And if you haven't seen it, check it out here. Our number two cartoon this week is Pokemon or something. Yeah, that's what it's called. Pokemon or something by Screw It. One of the elements that I liked about the cartoon was it addressed some of my theoretical issues with Safari Zone, like how throwing rocks at a Pokemon was like helpful or good in catching a Pokemon. It just the idea of like your first interaction with this like Pokemon that you're supposed to bond with is like chucking rocks at it. Hey, you! Pikachu! <laughs> I don't want to ruin it for you, you should just watch it yourself. But I will say that one of my favorite parts of the video was Nurse Troy. If you would like to check out Screw It's other apathetically titled cartoons, click here. Our number one cartoon this week is called Pika Pew Poop Chew by Pendleton Ward, who created Adventure Time, and Natasha Allegri, who both works on Adventure Time and created Bee and Puppy Cat for Cartoon Hangover. So I thought this cartoon was very funny, but that might just be because I love fart jokes and this cartoon was like one long fart joke. But also I think a reason that I enjoyed it was because the cartoons that Pendleton Ward and Natasha Allegri create have this aesthetic that really appeals to me. Something about how adorable the art is and the flippant way that they say their lines, just the humor of that. I just love it. I think it's so funny. 
I think that even if Pokemon wasn't something you were interested in or Adventure Time wasn't something you were we were interested in, this cartoon would still appeal to you because there's elements of it that you're, you're gonna love. Like either you're gonna love the aesthetic or you're gonna love the content. The part that I laughed out loud was when Ash goes, that's what my dad taught me before he left my mom. Like in a super proud, no shame way. Loved it. Next up, a battle as old as time itself. Choose your fighter, Pokemon versus Digimon. Let's get messy. If you grew up in the 90s, then you probably knew about Pokemon and Digimon. And if you weren't a 90s kid, then you probably still know what they are, because they're just as popular now as they were back then. Know what else hasn't changed? The ongoing debate between Pokemon and Digimon fans about which is better. But look past the cute creatures and find their human partners, and you'll find a trove of new information for both series. Hi, I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and today we're giving a fair comparison between Pokemon and Digimon. Ready to learn? <laughs> Digital Origins Both franchises can trace their roots to Japan, but if you're a fan, then you already knew that. In Japan, neither Pokemon nor Digimon started out as an animated series, but in North America, the anime shows released as a precursor to the games. Production for Pokemon started way back in 1990, after its creator Satoshi Tajiri saw two Game Boys connected via link cable. But back then, it wasn't called Pokemon. It's hard to imagine it by any other name, but the franchise we all know and love was originally going to be called Capsule Monsters. Gameplay was slightly different too. Trainers used charisma and capsules to capture monsters, and the trainers themselves would participate in the battles. However, Satoshi Tajiri had trouble copywriting the name Capsule Monsters, so he changed the name to Kapuban, and then eventually settled on Pocket Monsters and Pokemon. Six years and one nearly bankrupt studio later, in 1996, Pocket Monsters Green and Pocket Monsters Red were released for the Game Boy in Japan. Fast forward two more years, and slightly revamped versions of the games, titled Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue, were released in the US, and I think you know how the rest of the story goes. In much of the same way, Digimon also had digital origins, but rather than games, it was based on digital pet toys known as Digital Monsters. Released in 1997, one year after the first Pokemon games debuted, Digital Monsters, nicknamed Digimon, were extremely popular. They resembled other popular digital pet toys at the time, such as Tamagotchi, where you needed to clean, play with, and feed your virtual pet. Ever wonder why Digimon was so similar to Tamagotchi? Fun fact, that's because they were created by the same person. Yes, Tamagotchi's creator Akimaita helped Japanese toy company Bandai develop a so-called boy version of Tamagotchi after sales indicated that more females were playing the latter. This is ironic because Tamagotchi was originally intended to be a gender-neutral toy. Digital Monsters was so popular that at least five different versions of the toy were released, including anniversary releases and upgrades. Each virtual pet could be nurtured until they evolved into their final form. Some could even fight other Digimon. Aw, all grown up. TV Origins In the 90s, just releasing a game wasn't enough. For all intents and purposes, this was a pre-internet era, and if you wanted to sell games, you had to do much more than make games. To help reach a broader audience and potentially drive game sales, games were often also adapted into anime series, which is why you had the joy of watching both Pokemon and Digimon on Saturday mornings, along with all those other great franchise anime, Yu-Gi-Oh, Beyblade, etc. The Pokemon anime is loosely based on the plot of the games. It adapted many of the key moments from the games and incorporated them into an an original storyline, but also took some creative liberties. In doing so, it kept the anime a bit more fresh. You weren't just watching the same exact events play out, but rather you got to see the events from a slightly different standpoint. The anime also allowed Pokemon to flesh out some of the characters from within the games, like Brock and Misty, who were previously nothing more than just the Pewter City and Cerulean City gym leaders. And thank Arceus they did, because I don't want to live in a world without Brock's drying pans. Okay, I know you guys are going to get up on my pronunciation of Arceus, but there are so many different ones, so shh. Anyway, what about Digimon? Since Digimon began as a digital pet toy, there were no storylines or characters for the anime series to reference, except for some of the Digimon from the virtual pet toy. For example, the first digital monster toys introduced Patamon, Greymon, and Gabumon, all Digimon that appeared in Digimon Adventure. The Digivice designs from the series were loosely based on what the toys looked like, except for some like the 1999 Digivice toy, which took the Digivice design straight from the TV series. This enabled each Digimon series to be unique and introduce similar concepts, but entirely different characters characters. Think of it as multiple universes. The exception of this are the sequels, and those were very few. Take Digimon Tri for instance. It directly followed the first two seasons of Digimon, Digimon Adventure and Digimon Adventure 2. With a change in art and a more mature tone, Digimon Tri was met with generally positive to mixed reactions. Some fans appreciated the more adult aspect of the show, as many viewers had grown up with the first two Digimon seasons. Others weren't fond of the different art style and some of the characters' reactions to being involved with the digital world again. Monster Variation While both franchises 
races revolved around battling mons, the monsters themselves couldn't be more different. Pokemon come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. While a good chunk seem to be animal-based, there are also plenty of Pokemon that are plant-based, inanimate objects, or even humanoid. They're friends of humans. Some are even capable of speaking the human language. Pokemon are so common in the world that they've effectively replaced real animals. While earlier editions of the anime make mention of real-world animals, they generally aren't seen in the show nowadays. The Pokedex often uses real-world animals to categorize Pokemon, for example, Rockruff as the puppy Pokemon, but animals haven't been seen in the Pokemon games. Since they're physical creatures, Pokemon are capable of dying, as was shown through Lavender Town's Pokemon Tower. If you're not familiar with it, the Pokemon Tower was a resting place for Pokemon that passed away. Unlike Pokemon, Digimon are made up of data and thus have no real physical form. They also don't live amongst humans, originating instead from a digital world that is parallel to Earth. Because of this, when Digimon are deleted, they either regenerate into a Digi-Egg or become pieces of data that other Digimon can absorb. They don't truly die in the sense that Pokemon can. Digimon have also been shown to be very advanced, as they're able to build complex villages and societies. They can also speak the human language. Pokemon have also been shown to build societies, but they tend to be more primitive than those that Digimon create, at least so far. Evolution. Ah yes, evolution. It's been and still is a cause for big debate between Pokemon and Digimon fans due to the similarities in the concept of evolution itself. However, there are some key differences that set them apart. For the first 13 years of Pokemon, evolutions were permanent and were triggered by special circumstances, leveling up, trading, or elemental stones. As the series aged, evolution methods have become even more complex. Some require Pokemon to know a specific move, while others are gender specific. And in the case of one Pokemon, evolution requires holding your 3DS upside down while the Pokemon leveled up. Most Pokemon have two to three different evolutions. Digimon, on the other hand, generally do not have permanent evolutions. Because they themselves and their evolutions are made up of data, any evolution that Digimon go through eventually comes undone, kind of like using Control z That's why evolved Digimon often revert back to their original form when they're injured, hungry, or weak. When Digimon evolve, they can have more than three evolutions. Some can even have six evolution levels. Phew. That's a lot to keep track of. Potentially borrowing a note from Digimon, in 2014's release of Pokemon X and Pokemon Y, Pokemon no longer were tied to a permanent evolution. Once per battle, certain Pokemon can mega evolve, and at the end of the battle, they would revert to their original form. Fan reception. A common point of comparison for Pokemon and Digimon has been fan reception. Yes, both series are popular, but generally for different reasons. For a while, the Pokemon anime was geared more towards children, and thus the audience skewed younger. Fans of Pokemon typically enjoyed the games more than they did the animated series. While the games were played by players of all ages, most older fans stayed away from the anime. With the release of the Pokemon XY series, many older fans found themselves tuning back into the series as the show had a much more mature feel to it. With better character development, fantastic looking battles, seriously, if you haven't seen any from this run of the show, go check them out. And Ash's closest shot at winning a Pokemon League, he finished second, the best he's ever finished. The anime finally started to regain the attention of some older fans. Digimon was the opposite. The Digital Monsters virtual pet toys were popular, but when it really came down to the franchise as a whole, what fans really enjoyed were the first three seasons of the Digimon animated series. And for good reason. They covered darker themes than Pokemon did, especially the third Digimon season, Digimon Tamers. It's also worth mentioning that these two anime are on two very different levels as far as total amount of content is concerned. The Digimon anime ran for more than five seasons with over 200 episodes, while Pokemon had over 900 episodes and still running across 20 seasons. There's definitely more Pokemon to be analyzed here. Themes and Tone Pokemon and Digimon both had similar themes, but different ways of portraying them. Pokemon is undeniably more upbeat and lighthearted, with more comedic moments and strong emphasis on friendship and love. The friendship aspect is shown through interactions between the characters as well as their relationships with their Pokemon. For instance, when bonds between Pokemon and their trainers become stronger, then they as a team become more powerful in battles. A great example would be any battle that Ash fights in with Pikachu. Whenever Pikachu looks like he'll be defeated, his love for Ash and the boys' support help the Pokemon get back on on his feet and reign victorious. The themes of friendship extend through Ash's journey to find new Pokemon and also through his new friendships with the characters from the different regions. In each series of the Pokemon anime, Ash travels to a new land in search of Pokemon. He almost always starts out fresh with no Pokemon, Pikachu being the exception, and gains some Pokemon through friendship. Along the way on his journey, he almost always befriends a gym leader and the female version of the game's playable character. Digimon had a similar concept in terms of having friendship and teamwork play a key role in strength. 
The stronger a Digimon and its partner's bonds were, the stronger they became in battle. Strong bonds also led to Digimon being able to evolve more quickly than if they didn't have a human partner. They could also stay in an evolved form a little longer. But apart from friendship and teamwork, Digimon also handled other themes, and they were comparatively darker and heavier than the ones in Pokemon. Digimon really focused on individual strength, and the human characters had complicated life situations that they needed to overcome in order to grow. One example of this is Matt and TK's family situation from Digimon Adventure. Although their siblings related by blood, Matt and TK have different surnames because their parents are divorced. They become separated for a long time, and the prolonged separation creates tension between them when they finally reunite. But as they overcome obstacles together, the two grow closer as brothers. In addition to themes of family, the Digimon franchise as a whole also tackled topics such as bravery, death, and love, as well as issues such as bullying, isolation, and insecurities. This is notable in the Digimon series, Digimon Frontier, because all of the main characters have hardships that they must conquer in order to successfully spirit evolve into powerful Digimon. But if we had to name the darkest Digimon season, it would have to go to Digimon Tamers. Why you ask? First of all, the head writer was Chiaki J. Konaka, known for his work on the anime Serial Experiments Lane. If you're not really familiar with that anime series, well, here's the gist. It tells the story of a young girl who forms a connection to a virtual reality network. It handled themes such as identity and the nature of reality. The series had an overall very dark and philosophical tone, and this transferred over to Digimon Tamers. Its tone and story definitely took inspiration from Serial Experiments Lane, as well as some aspects of Neon Genesis Evangelion. These include the more sci-fi aspect of how the digital world and human world are connected, introducing the idea of human Digimon fusion, as well as the very realistic events in the story and how the characters react to them. The story surrounding Jerry Kato is one example of this. Her mother passed away and she has trouble accepting her stepmother. She also falls into depression after her Digimon partner dies and presumably attempts suicide at one point. The humans and their Digimon partners are also forced apart, potentially never seeing one another again. Digimon Tamers was overall a very dark and gloomy series. Such heavy themes weren't really addressed in Pokemon, at least not to the extent that Digimon had. If anything, Pokemon taught you not to steal. I'm watching you, Team Rocket. Now, it's very important that we keep our mind open for this next little bit. See, there are plenty of Pokemon theories that we've posited over the years, and I'd like to see where they all go. You may agree with some and disagree with others the same way that you'd pick your favorite mons for your team, while leaving others in the box. It's a wild world of possibilities out there, and everyone has their own preferences. However, if you have a very strong opinion, please go voice it down in the comments. All right, time for some theories. So I don't know about you guys, but one of the highlights of my childhood was Pokemon. I played all the games and I collected all the cards. But one thing I really remember was the anime. A lighthearted show with a positive message about capturing wild animals and then forcing them to fight each other. Now to help me better understand this conspiracy better, I asked my good friend and fellow cartoon conspiracy expert, John, to help me out. What's up everybody? I am John. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. Emily, thank you so much for letting me take the reins with explaining this theory. What if the protagonist of the show, Ash Ketchum, was actually in a coma the entire time? After the first episode, the tone of the Pokemon series changes. This happens after Ash is in a biking accident and struck by Pikachu's lightning. Now the reasoning behind this being believed is because after this traumatic incident in Ash's life, he is rushed to the hospital where he is treated with heavy medications including sedatives and painkillers. And it's these heavy medications that cause Ash to fall into a coma. Supposedly, Ash's coma is the reason why his journeys after the first episode are able to cover such vast distances with really no difficulty at all, Team Rocket becomes less menacing, and his physical appearance never really changes throughout the entire series. The coma is also the reason why throughout the rest of the series, Ash never uses a bike again, and why every town he visits has the same nurse, Nurse Joy, and same police officer, Officer Jenny. The events of the Pokemon series do sound like every 10 year old boy's dream. No school, no parents, getting to travel the world with your pets and your much older and much more attractive best friends. And despite not having a whole lot of training, you are somehow the best Pokemon trainer in the world. So could the events of the Pokemon series actually just be the comatose dreams of Ash Ketchum? No need to fear, Pokemon purists. This conspiracy runs into some flaws. First off, the alleged bike lightning accident happens in the very first episode. But 
Ash doesn't meet Team Rocket until the second episode. So it wouldn't make much sense for them to become less menacing if Ash had never met them in the first place. Also, Ash does use a bike again. In another episode of season one, Ash shows no fear of bikes and actually wanted one, but couldn't afford it. And fun fact, the reason it seems like it's the same nurse Joy in every town is actually because they're all related and Joy is their family name. And there are also several Officer Jennies in the Pokemon world. So while for the most part, the Pokemon anime doesn't make much sense and its consistency is pretty questionable, there's enough evidence here to prove this conspiracy flawed. Actually, I would consider this more of an interpretation of the show as opposed to an actual conspiracy. Calling this a fan interpretation really hits the nail right on the head. One of the key elements to a good conspiracy theory is that it can change the entire tone of the show and, as a result, change the viewing experience for the audience. Ultimately, Ash being in a coma really doesn't change the tone of the series that much and honestly, it can be forgotten after the first couple of episodes. In the end, whether it's all a dream or not, the show ends up being virtually the same and gives the audience the same impression that it intends to. And if we've learned anything from these cartoon conspiracies, it's that some people just enjoy ruining other people's childhoods. So while the anime may have have some consistency problems, the arguments given for the Ash and Akoma conspiracy just don't add up. So on the plausibility meter, I give the Pokemon conspiracy one and a half Togepi's out of five. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Pokemon franchise. A lot of new exciting games and shows are upon us. Even bringing back the original red, blue, and yellow versions to the Nintendo 3DS are bringing the newer fans with us oldies. The Pokemon anime series is also showing new trailers for the upcoming season, Pokemon Sun and Moon. Trust me, after seeing the new art style, I am not as excited as I thought I would be. Ash Ketchum is still the main protagonist after all these years. There are 20 seasons and 19 movies following Ash on his journey to become a Pokemon master. I always thought that Ash was growing up alongside me as I was watching this series since the very first episode when it aired. But when I tuned into the black and white season, I found out that this wasn't true. The narrator notified the audience that Ash was still 10 years old. But I don't get it. If he's been traveling around the world, meeting new people, collecting new Pokemon, seeing new horizons, how has he not aged? Is there a mysterious power that is keeping Ash Ketchum 10 years old after 20 years of Pokemon? There are a few theories that fans have come up with to explain Ash's aging process. Or lack of aging, I guess. The first one is that Ash is in a coma. When Ash is biking Pikachu in the very first episode of the series, he is hit by a thunder attack which puts him into a coma. But I don't really want to go into this theory because Emily debunked it in a previous episode of Cartoon Conspiracy. So if you want, you can go watch that video now or later. Another theory also comes from the first episode. After Ash saves Pikachu, they both look up and they see an unknown Pokemon flying across the sky into a rainbow. We now know from the second generation of Pokemon that this bird is actually the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh. Ho-Oh is a very mysterious Pokemon. According to one of its Pokemon entries, for those who come upon it, they are granted eternal happiness. Eternal happiness is a moment that makes you feel new and fresh. So since Ash saw Ho-Oh, it is speculated that Ash's eternal happiness is to never grow old. He is first starting out his dream of becoming a Pokemon master and probably wants it to last forever. What better way to wish for this than to always stay young? There's also a theory that comes from Pokemon the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. To stop Mew and Mewtwo from nearly destroying each other, Ash runs out into the middle of the fight and he's hit by their powerful psychic attacks. This turns into stone. When I first saw this moment, I was in shock. And then when Pikachu started bawling, I started bawling. It was very emotional for me. <laughs> All of the Pokemon in the stadium started to cry over Ash's sacrifice. Their tears then magically bring Ash back to life. The theory is that because Ash was turned to stone and then brought back to life, maybe he is stuck in this 10 year old body or he could just be aging very slowly. The final theory comes from the time-traveling Pokemon, Celebi. In Pokemon Forever, Celebi is dying and Ash takes it and places it into the Lake of Life to help its body heal. But the water has no effect. As everyone begins to give up hope, the voice of the forest brings Celebi from the past and the future to help out their fallen Pokemon. Fans speculate that because Ash was holding Celebi as he started to glow in the water, some of that life energy may have attached to him. This would cause him to gain the life power and to stay young. Overall, we can see that all these theories center around mystical, mysterious powers. Did any of them cause Ash to stay 10 years old?
Most of these theories don't have a lot of evidence to support them. For Ho-Oh granting eternal happiness, that wasn't added to its Pokedex entry until Generation 4, so we can't really go off of that. Speculating that Ash holding Celebi in the Lake of Life made him young is a bit of a stretch. Celebi was brought back to life after raising from Ash's arms. The power of the voice of the forest or the water from the Lake of Life don't say anything about affecting someone's age. But I think the stone theory from the first movie is pretty plausible. Mew and Mewtwo are still very mysterious Pokemon. I mean, scientists have been looking at them for years. There's still no explained reason as to why Ash was petrified when he got hit by the attacks. Petrified? That word rings a bell. You're probably thinking of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets with the Baskalis petrifying people. But this word also relates to fossilization. Fossils are prehistoric organisms that have been preserved in sediment for a very long time. Basically, rock forms around bones. Science. <laughs> when dinosaurs died, their bodies started a method of fossilization called petrification. This is when tissues in the body start to fade to preserve the bones. Seeing that Ash was petrified at an immensely fast rate, his body could have started to fossilize in this way. His tissues begun to preserve his body. Since he was brought back to life by the Pokemon's tears, this caused his tissues to be stuck in this fossilized state, causing him to be preserved in the casing he had before he turned to stone, thus causing him to stay 10 years old for a long time. But this is a theory, so there is no confirmed truth as to why Ash is still the same age. It could be because the Pokemon Company wants him to be fresh for a new wave of younger viewers to watch the show. So for the theory of why Ash will never grow up, I'm going to give this three official Pokemon League hats out of five. If you've watched Pokemon, you know about Ash and his trusty electric mouse, Pikachu. If you haven't watched Pokemon, chances are you still know about Ash and Pikachu. The Pokemon anime is now 20 years old and we've seen Ash travel across the land, searching far and wide, but there's still one mystery we still don't understand. What is the real reason Ash got Pikachu? Well, according to the first ever episode of the show, I Choose You, Ash got a Pikachu because he accidentally overslept and Professor Oak didn't have any more starter Pokemon left. That's it, wrap it up. I give this cartoon conspiracy 0 out of 8 gym badges, don't pass Victory Road, don't even bother challenging the Elite Four. Just kidding, only if it was that easy. In order to figure out this conspiracy, we have to break it down into two parts. How did Oak get the Pikachu, and why did Ash get the Pikachu from Oak, even though the three Pokemon advertised were already claimed? The rules of the Pokemon world are fairly simple. When a trainer turns 10, they are officially old enough to obtain their first Pokemon and begin their Pokemon journey. Side note, for the sake of clarity, when we talk about the starter Pokemon here, we are going to exclude Pokemon Yellow. It's the only Pokemon game where Pikachu is a starter Pokemon, and that's because the game is based on Ash's journey. Starter Pokemon are rare Pokemon who are easy to train and cannot be found in the wild. Wild Pokemon are wild and thus harder to train. Starters come in three different varieties, grass, fire, and water, and each region has their own starter Pokemon. Every year, the professors of the region get one of each starter Pokemon, and then three lucky up-and-coming trainers get to choose which one they want to begin their journey with. Or you get a jerk like Gary who comes in and bases his Pokemon choice on the opposite of whatever you choose for the exclusive sake of making your life a living nightmare. So why does Professor Oak even have a Pikachu in the first place? In order to figure that out, first let's examine the Pokeball that Pikachu comes in. Pikachu's Pokeball has a lightning bolt seal on it, which it doesn't seem that abnormal, right? Of course, an electric Pokemon would have a lightning bolt on the capsule. That's just good organization. However, no other Pokemon in the Kanto region has a seal on it. So right off the bat, we know Ash's Pikachu probably isn't from Kanto. In fact, there's only one region in the Poke universe that has Pokeball seals and that's the Sinnoh region. In Sinnoh, trainers can purchase seals to attach to Pokeballs. They are mostly used for Pokemon beauty contests because the Pokeball seals emit a special effect when a Pokemon comes out of the capsule instead of the standard white flash. The lightning bolt seal on Pikachu's ball is called an Ella seal and leads us to believe that Oak got Pikachu from the Sinnoh region. We're not entirely sure why Professor Oak would travel all the way to the Sinnoh region to obtain a Pikachu when he lives a couple miles away from the Viridian Forest, a natural habitat for Pikachu but well, that's relevant to the point we're trying to make right now. It's possible that Pikachu is a retired beauty contest Pokemon, which would explain his diva attitude in the first episode and his affinity for dressing up across all of the seasons. According to Pokedex data, many Pikachu can output the same power as an electrical power plant, so O could potentially be using Pikachu as a power source. Running a lab certainly requires a ton of power, so it's not too far-fetched, pun intended, to think Oak would use a little Pika power. Further proving this idea is the fact that Professor Oak also has a wind turbine, so we know he believes in alternative energy sources. 
Good on you, Professor Oak, for doing your part in keeping the Pokey Planet healthy. Okay, so we have a pretty good grasp on how Oak got Pikachu, but now the real reason you're here. Why did Ash get him? This one's a doozy, kids, and is going to require a lot of focus, so hopefully you're ready. There's only one logical explanation why a Pokemon professor would put their entire career on the line and recklessly give a non-starter Pokemon to a new trainer, a time travel paradox. In the fourth Pokemon movie, Pokemon Forever, Celebi, voice of the forest, a young man from the past named Sam is transported 40 years into the future by the Pokemon Celebi. A whole bunch of plot mumbo jumbo goes down and eventually Ash and company help Sam rescue Selby. They send Sam and Selby back in time and everything is all hunky-dory, except it isn't. We soon find out after he is transported back to the past that Sam's full name is Samuel Oak. Yes, the same name as the professor who gives Ash his Pikachu because they are the same guy and now the Pokemon timeline is royally mucked up. Have none of these people watched The Flash, Back to the Future, Rick and Morty, or anything else about time traveling? Rule number one about time traveling, you don't time travel, period. <laughs> Still with us? Hopefully, yeah, because uh, this is where things seem to get really complicated. It's time for a lesson in time travel paradoxes. Oh boy, who, who doesn't love a good, a good lesson? The bootstrap paradox is a paradox of time travel that occurs when an object or piece of information sent back in time becomes trapped within an infinite cause-effect loop in which the item no longer has a discernible point Point of origin and thus is self-created. It is also known as the ontological paradox in reference to ontology, a branch of metaphysics dealing with the study of being and existence. Yeah, Pokemon and metaphysics, we've reached peak conspiracy here. In this case, the piece of information is that in the future, Ash Ketchum has a Pikachu. So if Professor Oak gave Ash a Pikachu only because a younger version of himself saw a future version of Ash with a Pikachu, and Ash only has a Pikachu in the present day because Professor Oak gave Ash a Pikachu, who really gave Ash the Pikachu? We're gonna slow it down and we're gonna pause for a moment while you try to figure it out. It's a classic chicken or egg problem and at this point, I don't even think there's a correct answer. If Sam Oak never travels to the future, Ash very likely would have never gotten Pikachu. Professor Oak would have said something to Ash along the lines of, tough luck kid, better luck next year, I don't have any Pokemon for you. But because Celebi transported young Sam Oak into the present day and at the end of the day, Ash has a Pikachu. Don't overthink it, that's all that matters. This all sounds great, but how does this theory hold up? In the breakdown. My head hurts, my head hurts. Well, normally we could dismiss this due to the fact that this is a paradox and a paradox is something that doesn't make sense because of a logical or physical impossibility. That being said, we're also talking about a universe where Pokemon have a body temperature almost twice as hot as the sun, so you need to suspend some disbelief right off the bat. The biggest hole in this theory is the fact that Sam also sees Ash use a bay leaf. In case your Poke memory is a little rusty or you're still foggy with all that time travel talk, because I know I I am, Bayleaf comes from Chikorita, an actual starter Pokemon. Granted, Chikorita is from the Johto region, but Johto is seriously close to Kanto geographically, and if Professor Oak was willing to travel all the way to Sinnoh to get a Pikachu, there's no real reason why he wouldn't have gone to Chikorita in Johto. I mean, Celebi likely brings him back to a forest in Johto, so he could have just gotten one right then and there. If I had to guess, the real reason Ash gets a Pikachu is probably thanks to none other than good old fashioned marketing. When the games first launched, there was no official mascot for the franchise. Pikachu became the face of Pokemon when the anime started production because the studio wanted a specific Pokemon to focus on. Originally, it was going to be Clefairy. Weird, right? Imagine that. Imagine a giant Clefairy balloon during the Thanksgiving Day Parade. It almost happened. As scary as it may be, that was almost a reality. In the Pocket Monsters manga, Red's first Pokemon is actually a Clefairy, who also happens to be a cousin of Red's Pikachu. The manga was, it was really weird. Since Ash is based off of Red, it would have made sense for the anime to follow suit and make Clefairy the first Pokemon Ash got as well. So what happened? Out of all the 151 available, why Pikachu? There are a couple reasons. The first and foremost being that in game, Pikachu is a pretty big hit among boys and girls in Japan due to the character's overall cuteness. He could only be found in the Viridian Forest, and even then, he only had a 5% chance to appear, so it's completely possible that some players could have played the game without ever encountering a Pikachu in the wild. And last, but most certainly not least, they wanted a yellow mascot. At the time, there weren't a lot of yellow characters for kids. Remember, this was pre-Minions and Spongebob, so really the only other yellow cartoon at the time was Winnie the Pooh or maybe even Tweety Bird. Or maybe the real reason is because time-traveling marketing employees came back to the past from an alternative future where Cliff 
Fairy was the franchise mascot and Pokemon was a failing franchise. So they traveled back in time to the 90s and told the Pokemon company to make Pikachu the mascot, thus saving the franchise and creating a new timeline, which is the one we all live in right now. I mean, I suppose it could be possible, but I do know one thing, all this time traveling stuff has seriously melted my brain. And that's coming from a person who absolutely loves Rick and Morty. Yeah. This theory has a surprising amount of evidence on both sides when it comes to determining how Ash Ketchum got Pikachu. In one column, while we've ripped apart the fabric of time and reality as we know it, there's still no way to confirm or deny whether or not the bootstrap paradox is real and how Professor Oak came to the decision to give Ash Pikachu. But when you look at the actual business of the Pokemon company, there's only really one conclusion you could draw. There is overwhelming evidence that says the real reason Ash got Pikachu was because he was the best Pokemon for the job at the time. Whether whether it was for mass appeal or recognizability is up for debate, but at this point, it doesn't matter either way. The theory is creative and well researched, but unfortunately just doesn't hold up when faced with real world facts. With that in mind, I'm going to give this conspiracy three time traveling Celebi out of five. It's pretty much fully debunked, but honestly, I put in so much work explaining the paradox and time traveling stuff that I couldn't give this theory anything lower than a two. But what do you think? Do you think Ash and Pikachu is the result of a temporal paradox? Is Pikachu a paradoxical? On? Or do you think that Ash has a Pikachu because Clefairy simply couldn't make the cut? Also, who is your all-time favorite starter Pokemon besides Charmander? We, we know, everyone loves Charmander. Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and if you have any theories that you want us to cover here on Channel Frederator, let us know in the comment section and we'll be sure to check them out. Ah, Pokemon, the show about a young boy named Ash Ketchum who's on a seemingly never-ending mission or journey to be the best that there ever was. The best what, you might ask? Well, the best Pokemon trainer this side of Viridian City and Pewter City and Vermilion City. But on the road to becoming a Pokemon master, you're bound to run across adversaries who want nothing more than to see you fail. Such is the case with Team Rocket, the terrible trio that's been stalking Ash, his friends, and his pocket monsters since season one of the original series. Now they've come extremely close to getting rid of Ash, capturing Pikachu numerous times, but for some odd reason, things tend to always end with them blasting off again. Wait a minute. Team Rocket blasting off. I literally just got that. It's a rocket reference. Now there's been a theory circulating on the internet that makes some fairly strong claims that Team Rocket just might be aware of their ultimate purpose as antagonists in the Pokeverse. And as such, the last thing they'd want to do is see their cash cow or milk tank come to an end. Look, tanks of Pokemon, guys. Hey everyone, I'm Akeem with Channel Frederator, and on today's hit Monchantastic, psychotically side ducking episode of Cartoon Conspiracy, we're exploring the possibility of Team Rocket being self aware of the fact that they just might be on a television show. They are on a television show, like we know that, but do they as well? That's what we're here to explore, so let's get started because. What you're about to hear is totally unexpected. Unexpected? Unexpected. Seriously, who wrote this? It was me. Okay, I'll, I'll just shut my meowth. Did I write that too? Oh God. Now, Team Rocket can definitely be classified in the least intimidating and most clumsy villain category, along with the likes of Bebop and Rocksteady from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, Bebop and Rocksteady are clearly just inept and not the sharpest tools in the shed. But though you might be able to place Team Rocket in the same category as those two dundering dunderheads, one thing's visibly clear. Team Rocket seemed to actually, on occasion, care about our main protagonist, Ash. Our very own Alyssa did a video a while back exploring the possibility of Team Rocket potentially being good guys. Consider this video a companion piece to that one, or more so of an explanation as to why you might be able to consider Team Rocket good guys. Also, Alyssa never rated her theory, so I'm gonna give it five digits out of five. And this video is the reason why. So I really hope you're watching, Alyssa. Cade, can you make sure she watches this? 
uh, uh, notify her. Now, I personally wouldn't describe Team Rocket as covert good guys or paint them as being extremely horrible at their jobs. Now, what you can refer to Team Rocket as is anti-heroes. An anti-hero is a character in a story who lacks conventional heroic attributes. Basically, a person who falls right in between good and evil, neither bad or nefarious enough to be truly considered a villain, nor good enough to be considered a hero. A person we all might be familiar with who falls right into this particular category is Deadpool. Sure, he may have some attributes reminiscent of a hero, but he's all about chaos. Meaning, if he has to kill an innocent person, to get the job done, well, hey, so be it. We'll cap ya. He's the epitome of an anti-hero. I mean, he once killed the entire Marvel Universe once, for crying out loud. You think Stan Lee was happy about that? This anti-heroism is an attribute that both Deadpool and Team Rocket share, as we've seen Team Rocket save Ash's life throughout the movies. And much like Deadpool, they tend to perform these acts for their own selfish reasons. In Pokemon 3 the movie, Entei the Spell of the Unknown, Team Rocket save Ash from falling to his death, and when asked why, they respond by saying, If anything ever happened to you, we'd be out of show business. Now, not simply out of business, but show business. The last time I checked, Team Rocket was a crime organization, not an off-Broadway musical in New York. So when they say that, what exactly does that mean? Well, again, much like the example of Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool, Team Rocket have been known to break the fourth wall. Deadpool is very much self-aware and knows he's a character in a comic book. Based on the affirmation comment, Team Rocket must be aware of their existence as antagonists on a television series. I mean, why else would they mention being in show business? I mean, I'd have to admit, if SpongeBob SquarePants can become an off-Broadway musical, then I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, Pokemon can as well. Although it'd be kind of weird just hearing the Pokemon saying their names in song form. Although Jigglypuff does that. Jigglypuff, Jigglypuff. Okay, I'm getting distracted here. Let me stop. In fact, in Pokemon the Movie 2000, during the Team Rocket motto, they proclaim that they're now on the big screen. <laughs> oh yeah. They've definitely reached peak Deadpoolian levels of self-awareness here. There's quite a few more examples to further the point here, but you know what? Let's just explore them all in the how does this hold up portion of the video. See? Uh, we're self-aware as well, but let's title card. The theory of Team Rocket being self-aware and knowing they are in fact part of a television show is pretty strong. In fact, I'd call it an ironclad theory. Let's take a look at Pokemon 3 the movie. In the scene where Team Rocket are somehow able to swim and talk underwater, let's just call it cartoon logic, Meowth poses the question to Jesse, uh, do you think we'll get a bigger role in the next movie? Pretty much outright saying, yes, I'm aware that this is a movie we're in and we're characters in it. There's quite a few more instances to list off similar to that one. In the Mewtwo Returns special, Mewtwo talks to his clones about the events of the first movie, to which James states that the situation feels like a sequel to a movie I missed, referring to the fact that Mewtwo wiped everyone's memories at the end of the first Pokemon film. During the XY series, James laid things out quite perfectly to Ash. In the episode entitled Kalos, where dreams and adventures begin, Ash tells Team Rocket that he and Pikachu will always stand up to them. To which Jesse tells Ash that if they were to succeed in capturing Pikachu, all they'd end up with are reruns, implying that the show will end, inevitably end, due to them succeeding in capturing Pikachu. And honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I would want to watch reruns of XY. Honestly, why XY would anyone want to? Yeah. Now, there are numerous more examples, but I think we've proven for certain that Team Rocket are in fact aware of the fact that they are in a television series. But it doesn't necessarily stop with just Team Rocket. There has in fact been numerous occasions of other characters breaking the fourth wall and being self-aware. Ash's former companion in the XY days, Serena, did it in the Awakening the Sleeping Giant episode. The Poke Flute has been returned to its rightful owners, and the bond between Snorlax and the townspeople is even stronger thanks to our heroes Ash, Pikachu, Serena, and Bonnie. Um, aren't we forgetting something? Huh? <gasps> Clement! 
<laughs> Hell, even Ash has done it himself. I remember that one time during the end of The Power of the One movie where Slow King told Team Rocket exactly that thousands of people were watching them risk their lives? <laughs> I mean, uh, they, uh, and they all literally turned towards the camera and s s stared at it. Uh, now, unless you're vlogging, you shouldn't be staring at the camera, guys. Yeah. So it's fair to say that yes, Team Rocket is in fact self-aware, but to a smaller degree, so are all the other main characters on the show. I mean, dating back to the first series, there are so many case points to choose from to prove this to be true. So for Team Rocket being self-aware of their existence in a television series, I'm giving this theory five magic carps out of five. Though the show has its serious moments, it is indeed a lighthearted anime that doesn't mind poking fun of itself. I'd argue the overall Pokemon franchise is that way. I mean, come on, there's a Magikarp video game and an upcoming Detective Pikachu movie in the works starring Ryan Reynolds, who also portrays Deadpool in the Deadpool film franchise. <laughs> Whoa, this whole thing just came full circle, didn't it? Like seriously, I'm gonna break the fourth wall here at Channel Frederator because I literally just looked up who was starring in the Detective Pikachu movie and it said Ryan Reynolds. Totally didn't plan those Deadpool references with this being the end result. I, I just drop my phone. So what do you guys think? It's honestly kind of hard to argue the contrary on this particular point, but please share with us your thoughts on Team Rocket being self-aware of their existence and presence on a television show. Also, I'm really curious to know what are some of your favorite Pokemon? Mine will always and forever be Hitmonchan. Not because he's a badass and has a mean ass left hook, but because he reminds me of what Baby Groot would look like if you dolled him up in a nice pink dress and gave him boxing gloves. So adorable. When it comes to Pokemon conspiracies here at Frederator, we've just gotta catch them all. In the original Pokemon animated series, Ash Ketchum and Pikachu are the best of friends. But is it possible that Ash's Pikachu isn't his original Pikachu? In the very first episode of the Pokemon show, Ash Ketchum is given his very first Pokemon, a very reluctant and stubborn Pikachu. This Pikachu actually rejects Ash completely. He doesn't listen to him, he's aggressive, and actually tries to electrocute Ash every time he tries to control him. In the show, this typically means that the Pokemon's level is above the trainer's badges. This is actually made canon in the show when Charizard reaches a higher level and begins to disobey Ash. So so why was Pikachu disobeying Ash at the beginning? It could be that that Pikachu was already at a higher level. And this actually starts to make sense if you look at the Spearow fight in the first episode. Pikachu uses a powerful electric attack that wipes out an entire flock of Spearow in one move. This move implies that Pikachu already knows how to use Thunderbolt or Thunder, which are higher level moves. So where did this adorable Pikachu that we all know as Ash's best friend come from? if he's a total dick in the first episode. In the second episode of the show, Pokemon Emergency, Pikachu is brought to the Viridian City Pokemon Center to be healed. Team Rocket crashes through the roof of the Pokemon Center, as they usually do, and attempts to wreak havoc. To fend them off, Ash's sick Pikachu jumps in some sort of doggy pile of other Pikachus in an attempt to charge up together and defeat Team Rocket. Pikachu returns from the group, perfectly healed and ready to fight with Ash. The only indication it's the same Pikachu is the contraption on its head and the willingness to cooperate with Ash. After the Pokemon Center battle, Pikachu has a completely different personality. He's friendly, eager to battle, and totally loves Ash. Basically how any Pokemon should act when raised by a trainer. Also, in the first episode of the show, the Pokedex said that wild Pokemon are jealous of trained Pokemon owned by a trainer. So maybe it's possible that one of the Pikachus from the center that was only used as a power source, had the motivation to switch places with Ash's original, unmotivated Pikachu, who is really just more interested in being left alone. In the rest of the show, Pikachu notably rejects going into his own Pokeball, ever, even when he's at the point of near death. It could be stubbornness, but it could also be because that is the original Pikachu's Pokeball. Every Pokeball is coded to a specific Pokemon. So maybe it's 
that Pikachu isn't just rejecting its Pokeball. It's actually just incapable of entering that Pokeball because it belongs to a different Pikachu, Ash's original Pikachu. So what if Pikachu didn't just have a complete 180 personality change? And he's actually just a regular Pokemon who took the opportunity to journey alongside a trainer as it's always dreamed. I am far from being a Pokemon expert, but I think this theory brings up some really interesting points. In the first episode, Professor Oak warns Ash that this Pikachu has some problems, like a personality defect. But of course, Ash doesn't listen and takes him anyway. So what about Pikachu's total personality switch? Could it be that it's an entirely new Pikachu? Or is it just that Pikachu OG was so moved by Ash trying to save him that he decided to change his ways? Is it possible that in all the confusion, with a multitude of seemingly identical Pikachus getting mixed together in a skirmish, that Ash unknowingly took the wrong Pikachu when he left? When you take his new Pokemon's attitude adjustment into consideration, he probably chalked it up as good karma for saving the day and kind of just went with it. All the while, his jerkwad starter might still be toiling away in a hospital, generating energy in a very cruel twist of fate. Serves him right if he didn't want to be in Ash's squad. Honestly guys, this theory could go either way. It's up to you guys as Pokemon fans to choose what you believe. But as for me, I'm giving this theory three and a half Pokeballs out of five. Although this video may not last forever, Pokemon just might. It's the biggest franchise out there and seems to keep growing without limits. With that in mind, will Pokemon continue forever? Here's our take on this from Pokemon's 20th anniversary. Welcome to Notification Squad, the show that takes people behind Channel Frederator, puts them in front of the camera to read your comments. My name is Kate. I'm Alyssa, and today we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the Pokemon anime. Gotta catch them all, Pokemon. Pokemon. So Alyssa, mm -hmm. Pokemon has been a cartoon, an anime, call it what you will, but it's been around for 20 years. I know. How old do you feel? I feel very old. Me too. So old. Uh, it's so crazy that it's been going on for over 20 years now. I, I love it so much. I know, but it's also changed a lot. I know. And that's kind of one thing we're going to be talking about yes. today. But yes. one thing that hasn't changed is Ash's age, which is obviously something yes. we're going to be talking about as yes. well. And of course, the hundreds, literally hundreds of new Pokemon we've oh, seen yeah. over the course of 20 years. Yes. Another thing that's definitely changed quite a bit is Ash's traveling partners. I mean, oh, it yeah. kind of reminds you of Doctor Who in a sense. <laughs> where it's like every season. It is, because he doesn't age. It's, ex exactly, it's the same thing. He's not aging. He has new traveling partners every season. Is Ash a Time Lord? <laughs> Cartoon conspiracy. Who, who's your favorite traveling partner? Iris was my favorite because she was always calling Ash a kid. And that's exactly what it is. He he's is a, a kid. kid. He's and an eternal he'll, kid. He'll be forever a child. <laughs> forever a child, and not forever alone, because he cannot stand to be a Pokemon master by himself. Which, by the way, he's a pretty bad Pokemon <laughs> trainer. He literally just gets the the starter Pokemon from the region, and then like two others, and he evolves them, and then loses. Yes. Like that's the yes. arc Ash, of every. Ash season. has never won an actual Pokemon League, no. except like if you count like Orange Islands. But uh, so that hasn't changed as well. Yes. The animation style has changed. Oh though. yes. When I first saw the announcement for the. New Sun and, Moon, Sun and Moon, yeah. And they completely changed the style. I was like, why? It's we were doing pretty drastic, so well. Yeah. I know they changed the style a bit when it reached black and white. Black and white, yeah. They, yeah. they made him taller, I think, and yeah. his eyes were different. Yeah. And everyone's like, is Ash older now? I was like, no. But when I saw the Sun and Moon, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like this. But I've watched a few episodes. I think the environment and the style of this new Pokemon series matches the animation style, so it yeah. kind of works with me. I mean, I don't hate it. It's just very different. I'm just like, oh, it's like kind of breaks up the consistency. But again, the show's been going for 20 years. They can do whatever they want. Another thing that hasn't changed is Team Rocket. Oh, yeah. Seriously, guys, come on. There's so many other okay. Pikachu out there. There are so <laughs> many other Pokemon that you've met. Their whole reason why they wanted Pikachu is because in like the second episode, of the series, they saw the potential of how powerful Pikachu was. They're mm -hmm. like, this Pikachu is different. And I'm like, you have a talking me out. <laughs> I know. But yeah, there's lots of great stuff in Pokemon. Yeah. Uh, another running thing that just like was consistently good about the show was the theme songs. Oh, yes. From every season. Yeah. Also, the movies have songs too, like. Yeah. I feel yeah, like. Yeah, I it. had the Pokemon 2000 soundtrack. Of course you did. Other things that came from the anime, specifically that were in the video game world, Pokemon Yellow. Oh yeah. 
Pokemon Yellow yeah. would not exist if it wasn't for the cartoon. Yeah, think. like you get a Pikachu as your yes. starter, and yep. I know that Misty and Brock are designed to look like Misty and Brock. Yeah, from like the, the actual like sprites. And yeah. I think Team Rocket's in it. Yes, they I are. I didn't really play Pokemon Yellow. What? I played it's po so good. I Pokemon Blue. Oh, yellow's great because like Pikachu is like very mad at you in the beginning. Yes. Like you have to like turn around and like yeah. see how happy he is. I did play a like hacked like fan version of the game called oh Pokemon Gray, which Alyssa. was pretty much like Ash's journey through the first season. You can go to jail. No, Pokemon Yellow was great, and the video game series hasn't really done anything like that since, actually. Yeah, they like have incorporated Ash into it. Mm -hmm. Like you can get Ash's Greninja, and it's called Ash's Greninja, mm. and it looks like Ash because in the X and Y series. Ash like kind of like fuses with Greninja. It's very weird. What? Not like not like Dragon Ball Z Steven Universe fusion, but like um, there's like a point where instead of like a mega evolution, it's kind of like Ash's Greninja takes on Ash's personality, and when they battle, like Ash gets affected by it too. That's very strange. One of the things that we have to talk about before we go into how the 20th anniversary is being celebrated is what our favorite episodes and memorable moments were. Right. So, so I don't have a favorite episode okay. because there's just too many. But there's a lot. <laughs> I do have a most memorable episode from when I was a kid. I remember this even today, okay. being at my grandma's house watching this episode and seeing Mystery at the Lighthouse oh. and the giant Dragonite. Oh my god. And like we didn't know it was a Dragonite. And I was like, that is so cool. That <laughs> yes. Pokemon is gigantic. That was great. That's a yeah. good episode. It is a good episode. Um, we had a bunch of comments, and a lot yes. of people were just saying, Bye Bye Butterfree, and I'm like, Why did no. you pick that one? It's like the saddest one. I know, right? It's the saddest one. Well, that reminds me of another comment from mm -hmm. Snakes and Dragons on Twitter. Sammy says, The episode when Ash saves Charmander from dying after his evil trainer leaves him in the rain. I totally remember that episode. So I guess another example of Ash just being a good guy. Instead of, you know, taking care of his own Pokemon, he's taking care of other people's. Uh, what's your most memorable episode? The one that I remember, I remember a lot of the first season, like a couple ones in my head are like the Maiden of the Mist, which is when there's like a ghost and it's actually ghastly, but it like hypnotizes Brock and James to fall in love with it. I don't know why I remember that one. Um, the one where Ash gets a haunter and defeats Sabrina in the gym. That one I do remember. But he doesn't actually beat her, he just makes her laugh and then she of gives course. over. <laughs> so stupid. Um, but I think my most memorable one, like you, like mm -hmm. the first time I've ever was exposed to the Pokemon cartoon was at like a friend's house in like preschool. And preschool? it was just Yeah, and it was just Jeez. on TV. And it was probably like when I was four years old. And it was I the was one where Ash now. goes to like a school. And it basically talks about the Pokemon game in the show. Oh, really? Like, there's a graphic of everything showing like how to battle on a computer simulator, I and don't it looks exactly this. like the video game. I don't remember that at all, but yeah. that's amazing that you remember that. Yes. So, Pokemon usually does really, really big things for their anniversary. Mm -hmm. Last year was the 20th anniversary for the games, yes. and they did Pokemon Generations, which was oh, like yeah. a short animated series on YouTube, which is really, really cool. You guys should check it out. Don't expect a lot of battles. Oh, yeah. But the animation is really, really nice. It's basically just showing different cutscenes and characters that were in the games, but mm -hmm. animated. They also added more Pokemon from Generation 1 into Sun and Moon. Oh, yeah, yeah, because right. they changed them all to like Alolan forms. They did Alolan forms. I think forms. that was just like a shout out. So for the 20th anniversary of the show, yeah, what are they doing? They're doing some crazy stuff. So they're, they're actually remaking the first episode, yeah. Pokemon I Choose You, into a movie. When they first announced it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be so awesome. Yes. Like, HD, yes. like so cool. Animation looks great. Yeah, like I was super excited. Excited, but then I learned that it's really not a remake of the first episode. Right. First of all, Misty isn't in it. Right, no she's, Misty. She's technically in the first episode because mm -hmm. that's where they meet each other. Yep. They're introducing the new like legendary. Mm -hmm. which, Mar Shadow. Yeah, which I mean it makes sense because in most Pokemon movies that's when Ash does meet whatever the most recent legendary is. Mm -hmm. But like if you're remaking the first episode, why are you throwing in a Pokemon that's not supposed to be there? Like Very strange. And yeah. also if it's a new Pokemon, does that mean it's like a Kanto Pokemon they didn't find before? Like they seem to be hyping up Ho-Oh and the Feather. Oh yeah. You know? Which I'm also kind of mad about because there's a Pokemon theory and we covered it on the channel. Actually, I think I, I covered it on the mm -hmm. channel is why Ash is 10 years mm -hmm. old is because he saw Ho-Oh in the first episode right. and Ho's Pokedex entry says like it will grant you eternal happiness if you like see it. Mm -hmm. Like his dream is to be a Pokemon master so he wishes to be 10 years old forever. And basically in the movie, Ho-Oh gives him a feather and is like, here, your wish is granted. You know, if it, I feel like if it was any other anime, he probably would have been just like, I wish to be the very best. Yes. You know, like, like no one, no one ever, ever was. was, right? Like the theme song says. <laughs> but he said, I just want to be 10 forever. Yeah. I don't know. So that's why I don't think it's like 
a full-on remake. I feel like it's just a praise to the 20th anniversary. Right. We got a comment on YouTube actually from Jay Wong. It said, my favorite episode is the very first episode. Surprise, surprise. I just thoroughly enjoyed that story of Ash and Pikachu becoming friends and learned throwing rocks as Spearows are never a good idea. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> well, so the question is, in this movie remake, is oh. Ash going to throw rocks at Spearows? Probably. I mean, that's what prompted Pikachu to love him. Oh, you throw rocks at birds. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, prom it prompted the events to the point. But that's what I don't get is like, if that happens, right. like, where does Misty come in? Like, because Ash has to take her bike. Right. So we don't know. We have mixed feelings. We're going to wait and see. It might be good. One thing we can say is the original voice of Ash, Veronica Taylor, is not returning yeah. for this movie. It's very sad. It's I'm kind really of strange. Kind yeah, of strange. a lot of people like me who are like big longtime fans and are still watching it today were kind of upset about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, lastly, we want to talk about Pokemon Sun and Moon really quickly because there's also some news there. Yeah. Misty and Brock are coming back. Yeah. That's crazy. I think this is the first time in like 12 years that the, the original trio is back together. Yes, back at it again. And it's because Ash is returning to Kanto. He's going to be seeing all of his older Pokemon yes. that are just been hanging out yeah. with uh, Professor Oak. Yeah, like his 30 Tauros that <laughs> the uh, English speaking generation does not know about because of that band episode. So Diego Perez, you commented on YouTube, the last Diamond and Pearl episode is your favorite. You cried when Brock's farewell happened. So good news, yes. Misty and Brock are coming back. Thank you so much for all of your comments. If you want to be a part of next week's discussion, leave a comment down in the pinned comment down below because we're talking all about the final season of Adventure Time. Up next is when we read your comments, comments. Now it's time for comments on Notification Squad. That's the name of the show. And how do you become part of the Notification Squad, Alyssa? Well, you go to our channel, you press subscribe if you haven't, and then you click that bell icon like that, except it doesn't make that noise. And then you get an email every time we upload a new video. Which is every day. Every day. So we got some comments. First one comes in from, hi, I am Electro. Hi. They say, I'm happy English is not my first language, so I don't know what barf is, so I don't know how gross it is to drink it. This was on our Loud House Dirty Jokes. Uh, <laughs> Jay Black comes in and says, barf is throw up. It's disgusting. <laughs> And then I am Electro says, and now I'm disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I just thought it was a funny exchange. Um, yes, it is gross, and that's why it made the list. I didn't know the word barf wasn't universal. We learned something new. Yeah, <laughs> gross. So from our Disney Dark Secrets Tangled video, we got Uncle Quacker, who I see comments a lot. He says, I really liked Tangled, probably more than Frozen. I feel like that's a hot take. A lot of people like Frozen. Yeah. I think I like Tangled more, though. I, I think... I, I, yeah, I, I like Tangled. <laughs> Sounds like you don't know which one you like more. Um, I like Frozen songs, mm. but I love Rapunzel and I, I see. love Flynn. Well, I, I think we should have that as a discussion at some point. Yes, because Tangled versus Frozen. Well, like all the Disney princesses, like the oh, new Disney princesses yes. now too. Yeah, and leave like, a like even if though technically you want to talk about that. Anna and Elsa are not Disney princesses. Yes, we can go into a whole discussion of how a Disney princess becomes a Disney princess. All right, next comment comes in from Blue Star. So how many people check their toes to try and see if they only have one joint in their pinky toe? I didn't, I swear. This is from our uh, My Hero Academia uh, theory. Yes, and come on, no. All right, this week's notification squad leader is Kimberly Thornton. Congratulations, you get a badge. She says, so happy Channel Frederator made this video. I love you guys. Infinity Train needs to be a series. Yes. Totally agree. I think that would be super awesome. And we really like highlighting not super well-known cartoons as mm -hmm. well as the more well-known yes. ones. Yes. You know? So, so congrats. Congrats. And thank you, Kimberly, for your support. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Notification Squad. Remember, if you want to be part of next week's discussion, which is the final season of Adventure Time, comment down in the pinned comment down below. And if you want your lovely voice heard during the end screen, you can call our voicemail at 917-408-FRED, reading our schedule in under 17 seconds, and also don't forget to leave your name. How do you know the schedule? Well, you go to our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr accounts because that's where the schedule will be. And remember, Frederator loves, loves you. you. And with that, we've got them all. And and by that, I mean all the Pokemon Frederator videos. It's been a wild ride indeed, from Kanto and Johto to Alola and Galar. Heck, there might have even been some Paldea in there for you. Hope you enjoyed. Which video stuck out the most to you? What's your favorite Pokemon? Make sure you let us know down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.